verse for opening a sutra. The unsurpassed, profound, and wonderful Dharma is difficult to encounter in hundreds of millions of errands. I now see and hear it, receive and uphold it, and I vow to fathom the Tathagata's true meaning. Sutra of the Past Vows of Earth Star Bodhisattva Preface 1 Sutra of the Past Vows of Earth Star Shiti Gapa Bodhisattva Translated into Chinese by Jibri Taka Master Sheikh Shananda of Udiyana in the Tang Dynasty CA AD 700 with commentary by Venerable Master Zhuanghua, translated from Chinese into English by Buddhist Text Translation Society. The arisal of conditions leading to the lecturing of the Sutra. At this point, to us, every place is a Bodhimanda. Every place is a place for Dharma assemblies. Any time and any place are suitable for lectures on the sutras and the drama. All times and all places are right for working on our cultivation and for applying our efforts. That is why when it comes to cultivation, location or distance makes no difference. Any place we travel to is just the same as the place we started from. Make no distinctions among places. We are all between the good and bad drama assemblies. We should be able to lecture on the sutras and the drama and study the Buddha drama wherever we happen to be. Only then will we be able to achieve wholeness and harmony in our skill. Make a habit of studying the Buddha drama anywhere we travel that is most important. What is the key to studying the Buddha drama? It is to refrain from false thinking. Gather in your body and mind, collect them together, and keep your thoughts from wandering off in all directions into the past, present, or future. Simply focus your mind totally on studying the Buddha drama. Do that and you will not have many afflictions or worries. Why do you have afflictions? It is just because you cannot see through and let go of things. You feel some matters are important and yet some other matters are all the more important. This feeling of importance leads to a kind of attachment. Once there is attachment, afflictions arise. Therefore, as a student, of, as students of the Buddha drama, we should be free of attachments, that is, any and all attachments. Today marks the first time the Earth Star Sutra is being lectured here. From now on, we'll try to fit in as many seats as possible, move the first row back a bit, and add another row for in the front. Stagger the seats from row to row so those in the front will not block the view of those in the back and everyone will have a clear line of sight. That will be the seating arrangement. As for the standing agreement, two people will stand in a row and leave enough room between the rows for bowing. Earlier, we were reciting the six syllables Great Bright Mantra. Earth Star Bodhisattva lies for pupils to recite this mantra. If you are able to recite it, he will grant your wishes to your heart's content. He will help you with whatever you wish for. Words come short when describing Earth Star Bodhisattva's many efficacious responses. They will be covered in the Sutra lectures later. We should recite the six syllables Great Right Mantra often. It is an excellent mantra and its functions are also quite inconceivable. There are some very important causes and conditions leading to the Earth Star Sutra lectures. I was renting this place for the summer and was planning to terminate the lease at the end of the summer vacation. In that case, quite a few people would have a tough time looking for a new rentals since they were hard to come by. 
So I took a big chance and renewed the lease on this place and invited these people to stay. I also invited Earth Star Bodhisattva to stay here with us. This way, every day we get to bow to the Bodhisattva to plant gurus and cultivate blessings. However, Americans are unfamiliar with Bodhisattvas. They were never introduced to one before, let alone having no to live with one right now. Some people are delighted, yet others are frightened by the human-like image of the Bodhisattva. Therefore, I will now introduce you to this Bodhisattva's life stories. When you wish to make a new friend, you first would probably want to know the kind of person uh, he or she is. So let us now get acquainted with the Earth Star Bodhisattva. Given these circumstances, I will lecture on the Earth Star Sutra for everybody. The Earth Star Sutra is a Buddhist scripture on filial piety. Earth Star Bodhisattva is a Bodhisattva one who practices filial conduct and is most filial to his parents. By giving my lectures on the Sutra, I hope to inspire everyone to follow Earth Star Bodhisattva's example on filial piety. Now, first, the reasons for the arising of the teaching refers to the circumstances that gave rise to this Sutra. Second, the divisions and vehicles in which it is contained. Divisions refers to the Tripitaka and vehicles refers to the great vehicle, the Mahayana, and the small vehicle, the Hinayana. Or in terms of the five vehicles, there are the vehicle of humans, the vehicle of gods, the vehicle of sound hearers, Shravakas, the vehicle of those enlightened to conditions, Pratyaka Buddhas, and the vehicle of Bodhisattvas. The divisions and vehicles in which it is contained therefore refers to the type of text in the Tripitaka and the vehicle among the five vehicles to which the Sutra belongs. Third, determining its aim and purport, we will explain its tenet. Fourth, an explanation of the title, the title of the Sutra will be explained. Fifth, its transmission and translators. The individuals responsible for its transmission and translation need to be identified. Sixth, discerning and explaining the meaning of the text. We will especially clarify the meanings in the Sutra text proper. First, what does the causes and conditions for the arising of the teaching mean? Teaching is the body of language used by the sages to transform living beings as in the Chinese phrase, the language that the sagely one administers to his charge, to his charges. Arising refers to the fact that what did not exist previously now exists, having arisen and come forth. Causes and other factors and conditions refers to the reasons. So what causes and conditions brought forth this teaching? After he had attained Buddhahood, Shakyamuni Buddha spoke the Dharma for 49 years in over 300 assemblies, yet all along, never once did he get a chance to take his mother across to the other shore of Nirvana. Shakyamuni Buddha was born from his mother's left ribcage, and his mother passed away after giving birth. When he became a Buddha, he learned that his mother, Lady Maya, had ascended to the heavens. After he had spoken the Dharma Flower Sutra and before starting the Nirvana Sutra, he thought of his mother and ascended to the palace of Chayashrimsha heaven. He stayed there for three months to expound the Dharma for his mother. And uh, what was that Dharma? It was the Earth Star Sutra, the Sutra on Filial Piety. For the sake of crossing over his dear mother, Shakyamuni Buddha spoke the Sutra of the past vows of Earth Star Bodhisattva in the palace of Jarjashrim Shaheven. Those are the causal conditions leading up to this Sutra. Shakyamuni Buddha speaking the Dharma for his mother. Do you agree that this is a very important Sutra? 
that sums up the causes and conditions for the arising of the teaching. Next, the divisions and vehicles in which it is contained. Contained refers to the categories in which it belongs, i.e. the divisions of the Tripitaka of Sutras, Vinaya and Shastras. Sutras fall within the study of Samadhi, Vinaya the study of precepts, and Shastras the study of wisdom. Sutras, Vinaya and Shastras are simply precepts, Samadhi and wisdom. This sutra is contained within the divisions of sutras and vinaya because they discuss the precepts as well. Vehicles refers to either the five vehicles or the three vehicles. The three vehicles are those of the Shravakas, the Pratika Buddhas, and the Bodhisattvas. Adding to these three, the vehicles of humans and gods completes the five vehicles. Just as one human being is unique and different from one another in millions of ways, so are the celestial beings, the, the Shravakas and Pratika Buddhas. Likewise, they are not just one but many Bodhisattvas. The Earth Star Sutra is contained within the vehicles of humans, celestial beings, and Bodhisattvas. This is the divisions and vehicles in which it is contained. The third is determining its aim and purport. So what does the sutra take as its aim and purport? It was filial piety, delivering beings to the shore of liberation, uprooting suffering and repaying kindness. What does it all come down to? It all comes down to being well versed in filial piety, the principle of being filial to one's parents. One who can be filial to one's parents is heaven and earth's light of glory. What gladdens heaven and earth is for pupils to be filial to their parents, hence the verse. Heaven and earth values filiality. Filiality comes first. Filiality is of utmost importance. One word, filiality, brings peace upon all in the home through the workings of filiality. Just this one word, the entire family may enjoy peace. Filiality beget, begets filial offspring. If you filial to your parents, your children will be filial to you and vice versa. Why be a person and what is the point in that? Do not just resign yourself to being born a person muddled and confused. That is not the way to go. Being a person, you have a moral obligation to be filial to your parents because they are the heaven and earth. They are your elders and teachers. They are simply the Buddhas. If it were not for your parents, you would not have this body of yours. Without this body of yours, you would have no way of becoming a Buddha. Therefore, if you wish to become a Buddha, First, you need to be filial. Likewise, from birth and death to nirvana, and also from afflictions to body. Here, faring beings means to take sentient beings across, to take across one across one sentient being, two sentient beings, or three or five does not qualify as taking sentient beings across. The term refers to resolving on teaching and transforming all the 12 categories of sentient beings, thus quickly leading them to Buddhahood that qualifies as taking being across. The third, uprooting suffering. This sutra aims at putting an end to being sufferings. The fourth, repaying kindness, is to reciprocate the kindness of one's parents. Filial piety, devouring beings, uprooting suffering, and repaying kindness, these eight words make up the aim and purpose of the Eighth Star Sutra. It would be too much for us to go into detail. I went over the important points so you would get the gist of it. At the mention of the practice of filial piety, the thought, I've got to get home to be filial to my parents, popped into some people's minds. Once they get home and see their parents, they may forget all about it. While here, they meant to be filial to their parents, but once back home, they forgot all about filiality. 
Why? It is because they did not truly understand the meaning of being filial to their parents. True filiality is in investigating the Buddha drama. You are being filial to your parents while investigating the Buddha drama here, not necessarily waiting to be filial after you get home, in which case you only forget all about filiality anyway. By investigating the Buddha drama here and becoming the best person in the world, you will benefit the world. Benefiting the world is being filial to your parents. Therefore, filiality can be classified into four types, lesser, greater, abiding, and recent. What is lesser filiality? It refers to filiality in one's family toward one's own parents. It falls short of extending the filiality for one's elders to others' elders, of achieving vast and great filiality. What is vast and great filiality? It is the greater filiality that attends to all under the sky, considering everyone's parents as one's own parents. That is extending filiality for one's elders to others' elders. Its scope is expansive and not narrow. Yet, this greater filiality falls short of being true filiality. What is true filiality? True filiality is when you become a Buddha. It is beyond the scope of the four types of filiality. It is genuine and true filiality. Take the example of Shakyamuni Buddha. Although his father forbade him from venturing forth into monastic life and locked him up in the palace, yet he stole away to cultivate the path as a monastic. After six years of hardship on Snow Mountain, he sat under the Bodhi tree and, upon seeing the shining bright stars in the night sky, became enlightened to the path and attained Buddhahood. That is true filiality. Thereafter, he became a Buddha. He later ascended to the celestial palace to instruct on the drama for his mother. Wouldn't you agree that that is true fidelity? What is recent fidelity? It is to pattern one's fidelity on later day role models. Abiding filiality, emulated for all time. Recent filiality, emulated in the present. Recent filiality is comparable to lesser filiality with some exceptions. Abiding filiality, for example, is found in China's 24 paragons of filiality. They are models for all times. The august virtue they exemplified and used to all ages. The story of Dong Yong, one of China's 24 paragons of fidelity was Dong Yong, also known as Dong An, a, a very fidelous person. One of his neighbors, Wang Qi, was the richest man, while he himself was the poorest. Dong An's mom, because of her son's filial devotion, was well-nourished and plump. Though advanced in years, she felt happy day and night. On the other hand, Wang Ji's mom was made of money and ate only the finest delicacies, poultry, seafood, assorted meats, but she was thin, was thin as a rail. She was unhappy and worried all the time. One day, when both sons were away, the skinny mom inquired of the plump mom, your family lives hand to mouth and can't put anything nice on the dinner table, yet you are all trappy and round. How is it that you get so plumpish in your old age? Dongan's mom said to the skinny mom, My son is very filial. He stays out of trouble, behaves himself, and works hard at his job. I've got absolutely no worries and I'm very happy. As the saying goes, when the heart is carefree, the body plumps out. I'm happy at heart, so I plump out. She went on to ask the skinny mom, You live the good life and there are plenty of nice things to eat in your house. Yet, why are you all skin and bones? Is there something wrong with you? The skinny mom replied, 
Sure, I've got money and eat well. He said, "My son is a roughneck. He gets a trouble. He gets in trouble in the law day in and day out. He's either wanted by the police for questioning, or there'd be some warrants to appear in court. I worry about him all the time. No matter how well I eat, I don't feel happy. I'm stressed out. I get skinnier by the day because there's no way I can put on weight." When I'm all worried, why the two moms, one skinny, one chubby, were chatting up a storm about their sons, one filial, one disobedient, obedient. The disobedient one returned and overheard their conversation. After the moms had said their goodbyes and went home, Wang Chi went to Dong Wan's house and rubbed up the chubby mom good. Your blabber mouth! Why did you feed my mom all that crap? He yelled. When Dongwan came home and saw his mom upset, he asked why. She told her son, "Wang Ji was here and beat me up. He accused me of speaking ill of him to his mom." Dongwan did not say anything to that, but simply comforted his mom. "Please don't be mad. That's just how he is. Don't mind him." However, after his mom got beat up and calmed down by that hooligan, she got sick and died. Upon his mom's death, his mom's death, the one blew his top. When my mom was alive, I shied away, I shied away from fights with you to keep her from worrying. Now you've done her in. So he picked up a knife and killed Wang Chi. The skinny mom had always worried that her son might get himself killed one day, and sure enough, he got killed. Afterwards, with Wang Chi's head in hand, Dong Wan went to his mom's grave and set the head on an altar table. He lit incense, bowed, and said, "Mom, please don't be mad any more. So he beat you up, right?" Now I have avenged you. I killed him to offer his head to you. When he finished with the rite of offerings, guess what happened next? He took the head with him and turned himself in, confessing, "My mom died after the beating, so I killed him and made offering of his head to my mom. Do what you will with me. I accept the court's verdict and won't dodge the law." The county. Prefect handed down a life sentence, and he was put in jail. It just so happened that the emperor then issued an imperial pardon, which exempted all criminals of their past crimes, and he was freed. After his release, he was later appointed to high offices in the government. That was the story of Dong Yang, a filial son. Though there are abiding filiality, recent filiality, greater filiality, and lesser filiality, true filiality is cultivating the path and accomplishing Buddhahood in the future. As right now, you are investigating the Buddha drama without having to return to your homes. That is true filiality. To truly be able to investigate the Buddha drama and to be able to practice and uphold the Buddha drama is to be truly filial to your parents. An explanation of the title, further an explanation of the title, xiao, as in to extinguish. What does the word xiao mean? It means to explain clearly the meaning of the text. Therefore, an explanation of the title of the sutra, sutra of the past vows of earth store, Shichigapa Bodhisattva. The sutra incorporates earth store Bodhisattva's name in its title, which refers to a person and past vows denotes drama. Therefore, in the seven categories of sutra titles, this sutra belongs to the category of titles consisting of person and drama. Drama is just a kind of karma. Past vows refers to his fundamental activity karma, deeds and karma created in his past lives. Why the name Earth Store? Earth nurtures the growth of all things, and store refers to treasure troves. All the treasure troves 
are in the ground. Straw can also mean to keep hidden, i.e. to keep from view. All the treasure troves are hidden from view underground. The earth can grow the Mara things. It can also keep the Mara things hidden, buried underground. Like the great earth, this Bodhisattva is able to make the Mara things grow. Like the great earth, he has endless, boundless treasure troves in the ground for people to uncover. Those who believe in this Bodhisattva are entitled to the treasures within. Anything you can think of can be found in these treasure troves, and there is something to suit everyone's fancy. All the precious diamonds, gold, silver, lapis lazuli, crystal, mother of pearl, to name a few. If, say, you come into possession of a big 300-pound diamond, that should make you the world's richest person. I made some people laugh when I said 300-pound. They thought that was way too big. In fact, that is still way too small, the smallest of all. Because the one that is way too big is practically too heavy for you to even pick up. This Bodhisattva is replete with all these gracious virtues, thus the name Earth Store. The word Bodhisattva in Sanskrit translated into Chinese means an enlightened sentient being. Sentient being, an enlightened one among sentient beings. It can also be translated to enlightened beings, leading others to enlightenment with the principles that oneself has become enlightened to. In other words, it is the enlightened one enlightening others. Oneself has become enlightened and wishes for all sentient beings to become enlightened. Put another way, it is the benefited one benefiting others. Oneself has attained to great wisdom and wishes for all sentient beings to attain to great wisdom. With great wisdom, there will be no more upside down thinking. Past vows refers not to vows made in the present, but the ones he had made since the origin. Since the origin, when was that? It was countless eons ago when he made those vows. The power of vows from life's past is called past vows. Similar to the events of the past lives, one of the twelve divisions of sutras, which are accounts of events in the life's past, here the past vows of earth star bodhisattva are the vows he made in his past lives, not at the present, because by now he has already fulfilled his vows. What were the vows he made? He vowed, until the hells are empty, I vow to forego Buddhahood. When all beings are saved, will I then certify to Bodhi? Hells refers to all the hells. Anytime the hells are not yet empty, he will hold off on becoming a Buddha. Only when the hells are completely empty, will he become a Buddha. Now think about that. How great is that vow power? Earth Bodhisattva says, I will be in the house to receive and guide all the hungry ghosts. For each day that they have not been led from suffering to bliss, for one more day I will hold off on Buddhahood. The hungry ghosts in the house must completely gain deliverance, leave suffering and attain bliss. And then I will become a Buddha. Let's think that over. The common sentient beings create is endless, so are their afflictions. Then how could the hells ever come to an end? Only when sentient beings' afflictions were ended and their karmic obstruction cleared, will would the hells then be empty? Yet, as we sentient beings' karmic obstruction cannot be eradicated or their afflictions ended, how will the hells ever be empty? From the standpoint of contemporary literary scientists and philosophers, wouldn't the vows which Earth Star Bodhisattva made, the power of his vows, be considered the silliest of conduct and notions? Why do I say the silliest of conduct and notions? He first had the notion which he put into action and which manifested in his conduct. However, isn't this kind of conduct and notions way too foolish? 
Why? The bottom line is it cannot be done. Since fundamentally the house can never be empty, does it follow that fundamentally Earth stop Bodhisattva stands no chance to ever become a Buddha? No. It is not the silliest kind of conduct and notions. It is the kindest, most compassionate type of conduct and notions, and also the most filial. Why do I say that? Earth stop Bodhisattva perceived in his contemplation that his mother had fallen into the house where she was undergoing great sufferings, and he asked the Buddha to help take his mother across. Who is Earth Star Bodhisattva really? He is the Venerable Mahamudgalayana, and he serves as a Bodhisattva in the house. Why would he want to do that? He felt the pain which his mother underwent in the house, and reflected on the issue of extending fidelity for one's elders to others' elders. If my mom went through such sufferings, others' moms. Could also be put through the same sufferings. He thought. Therefore, with a filiality that is equal, level, and indiscriminating, he sought to rescue all hell beings and guide them from suffering to bliss. That is what Earth Star Bodhisattvas vows are about. No amount of words can fully describe the extent of his vow power. Again, let us go over the word. Earth. There are ten meanings to the word, and though the ten still cannot cover all its functions, they give the general idea. First, vast and great. Do you see that the earth is vast and great? Some of you are saying, "Drama master, you must skip that one. We all knew it's vast and great. Why bother?" Just because everyone knew that, all the more I need to bring it up to your attention. Second, relied upon by sentient beings. All sentient beings rely on the earth to sustain life. Do you know of any sentient beings that do not do that? Surely none of them lives in empty space. Third, not given to likes and dislikes. The earth has no likes or dislikes. It does not pick and choose, dictating you stay here, that sentient being there. I don't want you. No way. Sentient beings, good, bad, wholesome, and evil, together with tigers, seal deer, monkeys, and everything else, all live and rely on the earth. All the more, it is not given to preferences, preferences, or biases. Some people might claim, "Oh, I know, the earth simply has no awareness. It's insensate. Do you know for sure that it has no awareness?" The Earth's awareness and perception is beyond the scope of our awareness and perception. The Earth has its awareness because it is also one of the sentient beings. Fourth, acceptance of great rains. It can withstand the most forbidding of downpours. Fifth, bringing forth vegetation. Sixth, a repository for seeds. All the seeds are buried underground. Seventh, the seventh is burying many treasures. There are lots of valuables in the ground. Eight, yielding various medicines. All medicines are produced from the earth. Ninth, unmoved by blowing winds. Not even the gustiest of winds, not even hurricanes, can move the earth. What about earthquakes? They are not caused by movement of winds. Tenth, unstirred at the land draws, when the lions draw, all creatures are scared, but the earth does not flinch. In light of these ten meanings, Earth Star Bodhisattva takes the earth to represent his name. This sutra basis is titled on a person and a drama, with Earth Star Bodhisattva being the person and his past vows, the drama. The Chinese word for past is "ben," as in foundation or origin. Both suggest the past and indicate that these were the vows Earth Star Bodhisattva made previously. 
Previously, countless eons ago, in life after life, he constantly made these vows to perfect his filiality, to serve his parents with filial devotion, and to save and take them across at the expense of his own life. Such was Earth's stability set as vow power. I have explained the term sutra on many previous occasions, but it helps to go over it in every sutra lecture. Some of you learned it from prior lectures, yet others have not been to one until now and are not clear about its principles. Sutras offer a path for cultivation which everyone may walk on. If you wish to become a Buddha, you must take this route. This is the way to Buddhahood. Therefore, sutra means path. It also has the meaning of the carpenter's chalk line, as in China, the carpenter's ink line. The carpenter snaps the line he pulls out of the ink pad to mark a straight black line. By the same token, sutras help us tell the proper from the deviant. Moreover, sutra has the meaning of garland, as sutras string together principles like flowers in a garland. There are four more meanings, threading, attracting, permanent, and law. Threading is to perform it into and thread together to the set of principles, so none will be left out or lost. Analogous to the magnetic pull on iron feelings, attracting is to attract and support those with the potentials for transformation. The drama the Buddha taught takes the cross and transforms living beings according to their potentials and affinities. The scriptures based on the Buddha's words, like magnets, draw those sentient beings who are due to be transformed. Similarly, you have come to my sutra lectures because this attracting power brought you here. Weaker power, like mine, draws fewer people. Stronger power, more people. This attracting power has drawn someone, Ron Epstein, all the way from Seattle here, like the magnetic pull on iron feelings. Before you know it, its invisible power has already drawn you in, thus attracting. In the Cantonese dialect, the word attracting is used to describe parents' loving care for their children. The term to attract and to accept refers to how the Buddha treats sentient beings with kindness and compassion, and in turn sentient beings regard the Buddhas with respect. That is how the Buddhas attract and accept all sentient beings. Another meaning for sutra is permanent, that which does not change. Not one word may be omitted and not one word added. That which may not be increased or reduced is called permanent, unchanged, and forever unchanged. So you want the sutras changed, you will end up in the house not due to some strong arm or too crazy, but because the principles in the sutras as it were are still like are still like and cannot be changed, thus permanent. The fourth meaning is law, which is adhered to, th uh, to throughout the three periods of time, those of the past, present, and future, while the third meaning, permanent, means being unchanged from days of old to today. In all three periods of time, this is the law to abide by, by in cultivation, an internal law, a permanent, not temporary, constitution. Sutra is a Sanskrit word. Its Chinese translation means scriptures that totally. In the olden days in China, transfers of real estate mm -hmm. titles did not have to be recorded at the county recorder's office. Instead, the contract would be written on a piece of paper which was then folded and cut zigzag with scissors into two halves for each of the parties to hold on to. So what proof would we have if, say, you offer to sell me your lot and I agree to, to buy your land? We would each produce our tolly and the zigzag should match to a T, as, uh, as in Chinese proverb, 
of looting to the practice of scrapping was or insignia on a bamboo segment later split into two toilets, the marching of which identified their bearers, their bearers as parties to the prior agreement. A much like the two toilets of a halved bamboo denoting an agreement that is called tolling to correspond to agree or much. What does scriptures that totally mean? Above, they totally with the principles of all Buddha. The principles of all Buddha suggest the minds of all Buddhas, i.e. upward, they match the Buddha's minds. Below, they totally with the potentials of sentient beings. Downward, they are in, they are in keeping with sentient beings' propensities. What are sentient beings' potentials and propensities? Sentient beings are like grass, trees, medicinal herbs, i.e. vegetation. All the plants being rooted in the earth are equivalent to the potentials. Also, the plants themselves may be likened to sentient beings. This analogy might help you understand better. Comparing plants to sentient beings, when it rains and as the rainwater falls to the earth, all the flowers, grass, shrubs and trees flourish in their own way. Big trees get more nourishment, small shrubs less nourishment, grass gets the nourishment befitting grass, flowers get the nourishment befitting flowers, equal and level and that is totally tolling with sentient beings potentials. Sutras are like the rain water falling on all the major things thus bellowing totally with sentient beings potentials. They told me in the sense that you will receive however much you are due for. For instance, as I am lecturing on the Sutra, those among you who are wise will add to their wisdom, and the dim ones will also add to their wisdom, but the wise ones will get to add a bit more. Each person will get each own, each, each own nourishment, own a share of benefit, while those lacking gurus reject the Dharma rain and get no benefit from it. Therefore, it was to each own benefit by tolling downward with sentient beings' potentials. Sutra has all those meanings plus many more if we were going to cover more of them. That was just an overview. In life after life, earth stopped Bodhisattva remained filial to his parents and therefore, Earth Star Sutra is a Buddhist scripture on filial piety. Filiality is the root and foundation of humanity. If one fails to be filial to one's parents, one is remiss in the responsibilities of being human. Why? Our parents gave birth to us and raised us. Now that we have grown up, if we neglect to repay their kindness, we have not lived up to our obligations as human beings. All through his life, Confucius advocated filial piety and as part of his legacy, classic of filial piety gives an account of a dialogue between Confucius and his disciple Teng Tzu, Teng Shen, on the subject of filiality. When Confucius was at his abode and his disciple Teng Tzu was in attendance on him, the master said, Shen, the ancient kings had an ultimate virtue and a crucial principle. By the practice of it, the people were brought to live in peace and harmony, and there was no ill will between superiors and inferiors. Do you know what it was? Teng Tzu rose from his seat and said, how would I, Shen, lacking intelligence, be able to know this? The Master said, Our bodies and hair and skin we received from our parents and must not presume to injure or wound them. This is the beginning of filiality. The Classics of Filiality, Chapter 1 The Scope and Meaning of the Cheaties. Of the Cheaties. Once on when Confucius was unoccupied, and his disciple and his disciple Teng Tzu were sitting by in attendance on him. 
the master said, Shun, the ancient kings had a perfect virtue and all embracing rule of conduct through which they were in accord with all under heaven. By the practice of it, the people were brought to live in peace and harmony, and there was no ill will between superiors and inferiors. Do you know what that, what it was? Tung rose from his mat and said, How should I, Shen, who am so devoid of intelligence, be able to know this? The master said, It was filial piety. Now filial piety is the root of all virtue and the stem out of which grows all moral teaching. Sit down again, and I will explain the subject to you. Our bodies, to every hair and bit of skin, are received by us from our parents, and we must not presume to endure, endure or wound them. This is the beginning of filial piety. When we have established our character by the practice of the filial course, so as to make our name famous in future ages, and thereby glorify our parents. This is the end of filial piety. It commences with the service of parents. It proceeds to the service of the ruler. It is completed by the establishment of character. When Confucius was at his abode in his dormitory at the school, his disciple Tung Tzu was in attendance on him. As a student of Confucius, Tung Tzu was obliged to serve his teacher. Confucius stressed filiality in that one should be filial to one's parents and likewise be respectful to one's teachers and elders. So, for instance, sometimes Confucius might like some tea and Tung Tzu would oblige with a cup of tea. He would take care of things that Confucius wanted done. Confucius said, The ancient kings, China's former sagely emperors of Yor, had an utmost virtue, the greatest and of the highest degree attainable, and a crucial principle which is most important, through which they were in accord with all under heaven. By the practice of it, the people were brought to live in peace and harmony. If the common people made use of this principle, they would trade, strive for peace. And there was no ill will between superiors and inferiors. Do you know what it was? Confucius asked. Tseng vacated his seat. He got up and said, How would I, Shen, being very dense and lacking intelligence, be able to know this? No, I do not know. The master said, Confucius went on to say that our bodies and hair and skin we received from our parents and must not presume to injure or wound them. Do not casually harm or damage them. This is the beginning of filial piety, the start of filiality. However, currently, there is a group of individuals in the United States who misunderstand filiality. What is that about? Raving Trinus Confucius says, Our bodies and hair and skin were received from our parents and must not presume to injure or wound them. This is the beginning of filiality. Filial piety, a bunch of hippies crop up who do not cut their hair or wash their faces that would amount to injuring the hair and on the skin, you see, that thinking is wide of the mark. To not presume to injure or wound them does not equate to not cutting one's hair or washing one's face. It is telling you not to bring damage to them. Haircuts are part of the terms. Since the going trends call for haircuts, then one should go with the trends. Today's hippies want to turn the times around. Brandishing Confucius says, yet at the same time, guess what? They smoke opium and marijuana and take LSD as if those do not injure or wound their bodies. Those things kill off who knows how many body cells ruin their health and practically run their bodies down. They chalk it up to feel litty and meanwhile their parents are the furthest thing from their minds, consigned to oblivion. 
ask them who their parents are, and they draw a blank. And they are supposedly observing Chinese filiality. That is a complete mix-up. This erroneous thinking needs to be completely corrected. From refusing to cut their hair to engage their bodies in shady dealings, even robberies and vices, where do you suppose they will end up? If one day they should get gunned down, that would truly be unfilial. Once they get into illegal dealings or robberies, they will either end up killing some policemen or getting killed by the police. Now, is that to not presume to injure? injure or wound them, the beginning of filial piety. What a mistake. Me being in this country, I wish for this country's citizens to follow rules and abide by the law, and therefore I hope to set this deleterious habit right. Do not give in to hatred or resentment. Adopt the nature of the sages and worthies. Be careful with your thoughts and actions. Wherever we are, we should be of benefit to the local people, to the country, and to the world. Do not be a menace to the world. That is my wish. If everyone behaves this way, rejecting work and refusing to be productive, this country will definitely go downhill. Therefore, as we are now learning the Buddha's teachings, we should all take up jobs, and by working at our jobs. Help the world and humankind by setting good examples ourselves. We influence society so that human minds, as a whole, will change for the better. That is the responsibilities of Buddhists. The United States has a great legal system and many fine institutions, especially the education system, which has made education widely available and better. It serves as an example for the world. Just one more thing to add to that: if everyone also learns to be filial to his or her parents, and as it is said, a superior person tends to the basis. For when the basis is established, the way comes forth. Filial piety and fraternal regard are they not the basis to being human? If they can further find that basis and source. Then, when everyone is filial to their parents, this country will definitely prosper. A superior person needs to fight the foundation and source, and once the foundation and source can stand firm, the way will come forth. What is the foundation? Filial piety towards parents, toward parents, and fraternal regard for siblings, i.e., courtesy toward one's siblings and peers. No fighting. Filial piety and fraternal regard are the foundation for everyone. People who are filial to their parents steer clear of the various illegal dealings and abide by the law, making them good citizens of the country. When all the people of the country have become good citizens, we can serve as good citizens of the entire world. They will lead humanity as a whole well on the right track. That is why the first order of business for everyone is to know to be filial to his or her parents. Otherwise, that is the point in parents having kids. After giving birth to them, the parents still have to raise them for the next eighteen years, and then the kids fly away from the nest, leaving their aging parents behind. Sure, the par the parents can move into retirement homes and will have the government as their support system, but there is no kindred affliction to speak of. They are left on their own, almost like they are all alone in the world and with no one to rely on. It would be best for children to show filial devotion and care for their own parents. Allowing them peace of mind in the waning years of their lives, or else once the kids grow up, they fly away just like birds, off to no one knows where. A plums and crows. A Chinese saying goes: A lamb kneels to nurse; the crow returns to feed its parents. When the young crow grows up, 
When a young crow grows up, it finds food for its parents and nourishes them until the, the old crows are strong enough to fly again. Only then will the young crow's duties come to an end. Therefore, to the Chinese people, the crow is the filial bird. When a suckling lamb takes milk from mum, it kneels down on its four legs. Humans who fail to be filial to their parents do not even measure up to lambs or crows. That is not intended as a put down, rather a principle that everyone should be aware of. It is especially efficacious if humans can be filial to their parents. How is it? How is that so? The story of Kuo Chu. There is the Kuo Chu burying his baby story in China that goes like this. Kuo Chu was a very poor man, the poorest of the poor. He had a wife and a baby son. He also had a very old mother. His mom had lost all her teeth and could not eat any solid food. So she would take the milk from her daughter-in-law, that is, up until the baby came along. Now with two mouths to feed, there was not enough milk to go around, and both grandma and the baby were left hungry. If the milk were to go to feed grandma, the baby would starve to death. If the milk were allotted to the baby, grandma would die. So it was up to Kuo Chu to come up with a solution. Kuo Chu talked it over with his wife and, being the most filial son, presented this rational. Since they both were still young, they could have many more children in their long married life ahead. But mom was very old and her days were numbered. So they should dispose the baby for now to focus on keeping mom alive. Tough as it was for his wife to get, give up the baby in order to fulfill their filial duties, she relented in the end. After reaching the decision in their family meeting and with the baby in tow, the couple headed out to the wilderness. What had been their pride and joy, they were now going to bury in the ground. No sooner had they begun digging than they hit the jackpot, a huge trove of gold and silver in goats, all with the wording, Heaven's gift to fellow son Kuo Chu, inscribed on them. The idea to bury the baby came about because they were poor. Now that they had struck it rich, they could afford to scrap that plan. This public record is well known to every Chinese person. Many Chinese willingly follow filiality, not out of greed for riches, but because they recognize the importance of filial piety. Is transmission and translators feeds the translators. According to some editions of the Sutra, the Earth Star Sutra was translated by a Chinese Chibitaka master, Dharma Master Fa Teng, Dharma Lamp, circa the late Chen Dynasty. Some other editions list the translator as follows. Translated by Chibitaka Master Shramana Shikshananda of Udiana during the Tang Dynasty. Udiana during the Tang Dynasty. During the Tang Dynasty, roughly bordering China's Yunnan province, there used to be a kingdom whose name Udiana, which had a mythical origin. Legends had it that at the time when the kingdom did have a name which was beyond recall. Its emperor who was a hillist prayed to the deity of a local temple for a son. However, this baby boy refused to drink milk, no human milk, no cow's milk for him. Later, an other-like structure appeared on the ground, and the baby boy would nurse on the milk produced from the earth. That was how the country got the name Udiana a Sanskrit term meaning earth milk. No ordinary cow's milk, mind you, but earth's milk, first the name earth milk kingdom, quite a legend. A Chibitaka Shramana hailed from earth milk kingdom. 
Speaking of the term shramana, since its Chinese transliteration is shaman, sando. Some Dharma masters poorly versed in the lecturing of sutras would explain it like this sand, river sand, sand door. A door made of river sand, and this monk goes in and out of that door, thus, shaman, sand door. That is wrong. Shramanara is sans a Sanskrit term translated into Chinese means diligently cultivated precepts, samadhi, and wisdom. Putting an end to greed, hatred, and ignorance, the phrase has the same meaning as shramana, diligently cultivating precepts, samadhi, and wisdom. Do not be lazy. Do not think getting more sleep does you good. It might feel natural for your physical body to sleep more, but it is unnatural for your Dharma body. So diligently cultivate precepts, samadhi and wisdom, and put an end to greed, hatred, and ignorance. Shikshananda, Shikshananda also Sanskrit, translated into Chinese, means study with delight. This shramana was never lazy and was most delighted in learning the Buddha drama, learning the Suragama mantra, the Great Compassion mantra, and all the areas of Buddhist studies. It gave him great joy, thus his name, Shikshananda. Translated, to translate is to render the Sanskrit texts into Chinese. It refers to an exchange, exchanging the identical texts in Sanskrit for Chinese. The Chinese word for to translate is Yi. During the Zhou dynasty in China, an office was created to oversee language, languages used in the four directions of the land. The official installed in the north was called Yi, and this word has since come to mean to translate. That was fifth is transmission and translators. Six discerning and explaining the meaning of the text. Six discerning and explaining the meanings of the text. To discern is to distinguish and to explain is to elucidate. Meanings of the text refers to meanings of the sutra text proper. Sutra of the Past Vows of Earth Star Bodhisattva Spiritual Penetrations in the Palace of the Jayashimsha Heaven Chapter 1 Commentary This is the start of the Sutra text Jayashimsha Heaven A Sanskrit for the Heaven of 33 this is not the 33rd layer of heaven from the bottom up. It is in the middle with eight heavens in the east, eight heavens in the west, eight heavens in the south, and eight heavens in the north. Four times it makes 32. 32 heavens surround the 33rd heaven in the center, making this heaven the heaven of 33. The Lord of the Heaven of 33 is Chakra. Chakra is a god which is a Dharma protector in Buddhist terms. The Lord Indra in the Amitabha Sutra, Amitabha Sutra is a Chakra the god. Namo Yintuo Laye in the Suragama Mantra also refers to Chakra the god. So the heavenly ruler he is merely a Dharma protector according to Buddhism. Not only does he not rule, but he does not even have a seat. He stands by the door. This heavenly ruler is the omnipotent God in most people's minds. Right, he is omnipotent. He can manage things in the heavens and in the human realm. However, he is not too different from human beings because he still wants sex, food, and sleep. His desires are lighter than humans though. Human beings are extremely hungry after going without food for a few days. 
uncomfortable and sleepless without sex for a few days and lethargic without sleep for a few days Lord Chakra however can fast for 100 days 200 days 300 days or even a year without problems he can also abstain for sleep or sex for a year without problems nevertheless he has got not let go of his desire beings in the Chayashim shall have lived for 1000 years of which one day is equivalent to 100 human years think about it how much longer is his 1000 years in human years the Chagrashim Shah heaven is 18,000 Jojanas in size its city walls are made of seven gems just the city mode itself is 60,000 Jojanas in size the city of the Chagrashim Shah God is called the city of fine views his palace is constructed with the most valuable gems this is why he refuses to leave after becoming reborn there as the heavenly lord all the buildings all around are constructed with gems no wonder his desire refuses to quit it's such a beautiful place with such beautiful palaces he is content just enjoying his heavenly blessings there and considers the place most delightful he even tells all beings to be reborn in his kingdom he welcomes anyone who would like to come to his world a joyous world he thinks he is being generous by welcoming people to come and stay he does not does not realize however that he cannot end his own birth and death because he is greedy for and attached to this kind of happiness having said all this how did he become a god did he get promoted from an earthly god to a heavenly god every household in cotton makes offerings to an earth lord did he get promoted from an earth lord to a heavenly lord or from an earth lord to a human lord then a heavenly lord no then how did he become a, the heavenly lord during the time of kasyapa buddha this heavenly lord was a woman do not think he is any big deal lord god was a woman before this woman set out to build a temple for kasyapa buddha the circumstances that led to this resolve were that she saw a dedicated temple with no roof or ceiling the buddha image in the temple was losing its gold guarding from the wind and rain that came through she was saddened by this and said gee the buddha image is dirty to begin with now it's wind blown and rained on how embarrassing she made it her goal to rebuild this temple since she did not have any money she asked her friends and relatives i want to rebuild a temple but i am penniless could you all help me get more of your relatives and friends together so we can do charity and repair this temple her friends and relatives agreed okay let us cooperate and build a temple 33 people were found she is the founder while there were 32 others mostly women too so unverifiable in history even if there were men there were very few men probably thought they were too great to build temples so they let the women do it in any case these 33 women finished rebuilding this temple plus a jeweled stupa at that each person donated a little money and all their effort in building this temple and stupa at the end of these 33 people's lives they were reborn in their heavens each person has one layer of heaven so there are 33 layers for 33 people at this heaven the center of these heavens is the Chayashim Shalot Chakra this is the origin of the Chayashim Sha heaven what does heaven mean? it does not mean anything if it did, it would not be called heaven why? 
heaven is spontaneous by definition the karma of this uh, these 33 individuals created these heavens without these 33 individuals there would not be the Chayashim Sha heaven that is why I say it does not mean anything the palaces here are the best and most beautiful models like uh, some of those Chinese imperial palaces but these heavenly palaces are even more beautiful and wonderful spiritual penetrations the spirit is also known as the heaven's mind. Penetrations is the type of wisdom. Penetrations are unhindered and spirits are beyond the magical and the mystical. There are six kinds of spiritual penetrations. Although these six are one and the same too. Furthermore, there could be nothing whatsoever because there was no spiritual penetration to begin with or there was always spiritual penetrations. How can we say there was no spiritual penetration and there always was spiritual penetration? This is quite a terrific explanation. Let us first explain the six spiritual penetrations individually. Originally, there was spiritual penetration and no spiritual penetration. Originally, there was one type of spiritual penetration and there was no spiritual penetration at all. The six spiritual penetrations are the penetration of the heavenly eye, the penetration of the heavenly ear, the penetration of knowing others' thoughts, the penetration of knowing past lives, the penetration of traveling freely, and the penetration of being free of our flows. The penetration of traveling freely is also called the penetration of spiritual states and the penetration of which is fulfilled. Speaking of the penetration of the heavenly eye, we are all people, but we are different. How are we different? Some people can observe the chuchi leucosum as if it were an apple in the palm of their hand. Venerable Aniruddha had the penetration of the heavenly eye. He was foremost in the heavenly eye, the penetration of the heavenly ear. Someone with this penetration can hear all the sounds throughout the human realm, the heavens and all of Trichiliocosm, the penetration of others' thoughts. Someone with this penetration knows what you are thinking before you articulate it. The penetration of knowing past lives. Someone with this penetration knows everything you did in your past lives, both good and bad. The penetration of spiritual states. The spiritual here is what you mentioned earlier, a kind of inconceivable state. The spiritual and the wanderers are somewhat similar. So sometimes we use them together as one phrase to mean that they are unfathomably spiritual and wondrous, an incredible state. Penetrations are, are unimpeded, blockages clear up. For instance, walls are struck, but puncture a hole in it, and it is penetrated. Our ignorance obstructs the light of our inherent nature. If you can use your wisdom sword to pierce through, that would be penetration. The penetration of no outflow. Why do we human beings not become Buddhas? It is because of our outflows. Why do we human beings not become Bodhisattvas? It is also because of these outflows. These outflows leak into the triple realm, the desire realm, the form realm, and the formless realm. Not only do outflows lead into the triple realm, but the nine realms too. What are the nine realms? The realms of the Bodhisattvas, sound hearers, those who enlighten to conditions, gods, humans, asuras, hell beings, hungry ghosts, and animals. The reason that the beings in these nine realms do not become Buddhas is because of their outflows. They would be Buddhas if they do not have any outflows. Where do these outflows come from? Ignorance. If you can shatter ignorance, then there would be no outflows. With ignorance not shattered, you will leak until 
you have nothing left. Very few people have the penetration of no outflows. Without outflows, you become liberated from the cycle of birth and death. The reason that you cannot become liberated from birth and death is because you have outflows. Having outflows is similar to a leaking bottle. Fill it with water and it leaks. Fill it with more water and it cannot preserve it. And outflows, and you would have the penetration of no outflow. Originally, we do not have any spiritual penetrations, means that we did not have any spiritual penetrations when we were ordinary people. At the level of the sages' fruition, we have always had spiritual penetrations. Ordinary people do not have spiritual penetrations, why sages do. Do sages get their spiritual penetrations from the outside? No, we have always had them. Did ordinary people lose their spiritual penetrations so that they do not have them now? No, they are in their inherent nature, but they did not notice them and discover them. They think they're not there and consider they were always without spiritual penetrations. It is not important whether we have spiritual penetrations. Do not think having spiritual penetrations is equivalent to enlightenment or a hardship. Far from it. Do not be so easily satisfied. Getting just a um, smith get and of gold and you think, oh, I struck it rich this time. Other people with millions and millions of ounces in the savings do not even think about it. It is as if it does not exist for these millionaires. So what is the big deal with your little with, with your one little ounce? Do not be content with little. One of the states of the two vehicles is that they stop in mid course, being content with very little. This is not a Mahayana Bodhisattva sensibility. If you think you are so great because of your spiritual penetrations, then you think too small. You are still attached and satisfied. A chapter is from a classification. Sutra. Thus I have heard, at one time, the Buddha was in the Chayashim Shah heaven speaking Dharma for his mother. Commentary. Thus I have heard, the Vata Sutra, the Earth Star Sutra, and the Dharma Flower Sutra are all starting to be lectured here. So, first I have heard is said three times. First is the term that the Dharma thus spoken is credible. The Dharma that is not thus is not credible. This Dharma here is the Dharma that is thus. Thus is also a term for a seal, a seal of approval. This is the version cannot be answered. Thus I have heard is one of the answers the Buddha gave to answer one of Ananda's four questions. Before Shakyamuni Buddha entered Nirvana, Ananda cried his heart out, forgetting everything. Venerable Aniruddha did not have the flesh eye, only the heavenly eye, but he was especially calm and calm. He told Ananda to ask, the Buddha four questions. 1. What words should be used in the beginning of each sutra after the sutras have been compiled to show that it is representative of the Buddhist canon? 2. When the Buddha was in the world, the, Buddha, the Buddha's disciples lived with him. After the Buddha enters Nirvana, with whom should we live? 3. When the Buddha was in the world, the Buddha was our teacher. After the Buddha enters Nirvana, which venerable one should be our teacher? 4. How should we treat evil-natured pictures? The Buddha responded at that time. 1. Use the four words thus I have heard before every sutra. 2. Abide in the four types of mindfulness. The four types of mindfulness are about the body, feelings, the mind, and the dharma. Contemplate the body as impure. Contemplate feelings as suffering. 
contemplate the mind as impermanent and contemplate the drama as without a self. These are the four types of mindfulness. Three, when the Buddha was in the world, the Buddha was our teacher. After the Buddha enters Nirvana, we take the Pratimoksa as our teacher. This is the master for all Bishus and Bishunis. Four, give evil nature to Bishus the silent treatment and ignore them. First, I have heard is to end the multitude of doubts. When the sutras were being compiled, everyone developed three questions immediately. These questions were raised when Ananda joined the sutra compilations, before which he certified to the fourth level of Ahatship. No one opened the door for him and he entered the sutra compilation, compilation place through the crack in the door. Although all the other participants who joined the compilation of the sutras had certified to Ahashi, their memory was worse than Ananda. Ananda was a provisional manifestation in that life. He was the attendant to all the Buddhas in the past. When Shakyamuni Buddha became as soon as Ananda stepped onto the Dharma seat, Everyone had three suspicions. One, the suspicion that Shakyamuni Buddha came to life again. Two, the suspicion that a Buddha from another direction came. Three, the suspicion that Ananda certified to the fruit of, a, of a Buddhahood. The Great Assembly developed these three suspicions until Ananda said the four words, Thus I have heard. Then these three doubts disappeared. The purpose of using thus I have heard for sutra compila compilations is one to eliminate everyone's skepticism, two to observe the Buddha's last words, three to end arguments. Since Ananda was quite young when the sutras were being compiled. Some of the senior elders, such as Elder Kasyapa, Anyata Kaundinya, Saputi, and others might say, What kind of experience and knowledge could a young person like yourself have to compile the sutras? How will you compile the sutras? If Ananda said he will write out the sutras, people would argue. What you say is completely wrong. The Buddha did not say this, but once Ananda said, First, I have heard no one thought. Why? Ananda heard this from the Buddha. Ananda did not make this up himself. This is to end arguments. For to differentiate from the non-Buddhists, the thinking in non-Buddhist texts at that time in India is as follows. All dhammas are not apart from existence and void. Either everything is existent or non-existent. Existence and non-existence embody all dhammas. The non-Buddhist texts begin with the two words A and Ga. A is non-existence and what Ga is existence. To differentiate from non-Buddhists, the Buddha instructed on using the four words Thus, I have heard at the beginning of the sutras, which means thus is the drama that I, Ananda, personally heard from the Buddha. Thus makes the condition of faith happen. I have heard makes the condition of hearing happen. Why not say one heard with the ears, but say I have heard? It is because I represents all six senses in the body. At one time, why is not a specific year, specific month, and specific day named? Why is the location where the Buddha spoke Dharma named? It is because different calendars are used around the world. January in some country is February in another country, or January in some country is March or April in another country. These days are uncertain, so the Buddhist sutras just say there was such a time. If there were a fixed time, 
Archaeologists might use a lot of brain juices to do research. The Buddha did not want to waste archaeologists' brain juices and effort, so the Buddhist sutras used at one time. This makes the condition of time happen. The Buddha makes the condition of the host happen. The Buddha enlightened himself, enlightens others, and perfected enlightening conduct. He is a conduct because he perfected the three style, three types of enlightenment, and is replete with the myriad virtues. This Buddha is uh, the teaching host of the Saha world. Shakyamuni Buddha. Actually, Shakyamuni Buddha became a Buddha million and millions, even infinite ends ago. However, he saw that the time has come for living beings in the Sa world of Southern Jambuvipa and came and manifested as a Buddhist, uh, as a Buddha, so that all beings will become Buddhas, escape the cycle of birth and death. Dramas spoken by the Buddha are unfailingly true. We must all accept these principles profoundly. If this was to go in one ear and out the other, nothing will be gained by it. We must practice truly and honestly. Reject even as much deceit as it has breath. Was in the Chajashimsha heaven, this makes the condition a place happen. Speaking drama for his mother, Shakyamuni Buddha went up into the Chajashimsha heaven to save his mother. Seven days after the Buddha was born, the Buddha's mother, Lady Maya, passed away and became reborn in the Chajashimsha heaven. Maya is Sanskrit, it means great magic or illusions. The Buddha's mother was the mother of a thousand Buddhas. She came to the, be very Buddha's mother. As strange as it sounds, this is what happened. She came to be the Buddha's mother and after the Buddha realizes Buddhahood, he speaks Dharma for her. This is similar to a Dharma. Actually, if you understand this world, everything would seem like a play. This is the truth in life. Once you understand one true principle, you will understand other true principles. Most people do not know how to really watch life's drama unfold. They only watch the content that includes sadness and joy, separation and union, joy and happiness, sadness and fear, love and hate and desire. People who see all this realize that life is but illusion and transformation. All conditioned dramas are but dreams, illusions, bubbles and shadows. They are like a dew drops and lightning. Contemplate them first. When the Buddha touched living beings, he was in the samadhi of playfulness. He did not thread this as a big deal. Unlike most of us who are attached to this and that, left and right, up and down, not everything is perfectly integrated and unobstructed. All states are but illusory and unreal. We are attached if this is not how we perceive states. The role of the Buddha's mother. Lady Maya is to be a thousand Buddha's mother. Uh, after every Buddha realizes Buddhahood, he will go to the Chayashimsha heaven to speak the Dharma for his mother. Every day, every Buddha is this way, but a will turning sage king or Shakra has to request the Dharma. Who requested that Shakyamuni Buddha go and speak the Dharma in the Chayashimsha heaven? His father, a will king. He told the Buddha, you should go to the Chayashimsha heaven to speak the Dharma for your mother, save her. The will king requested Dharma from Shakyamuni Buddha. Some sutras say Shakra did. Shakra is the lord of the Chayashimsha heaven, whose former incarnation was that poor woman who re uh, renovated a temple.
having renovated a temple to become a heavenly lord. Some sutra texts say Chakra knew that the Buddha's mother was in the heavens and requested the Buddha to speak the drama of the Chayashimsha heaven. Regardless of which person, the general idea is that someone has to request the Buddha to speak the drama. What Dhamma did Shakyamuni Buddha speak for his mother? Earth Stop Bodhisattva's Fundamental Vast Sutra. This is a drama on fidelity. Everyone should be valuable to their parents. Why? It is because our parents are our roots. Being filial to our, your parents, your doubts, your roots, you doubt your roots with fertilizer. If you are not filial to your parents, you will definitely have no future. Being filial to your parents means tending to your roots well and ensuring a bright future, as the saying goes. Stable roots lead to lush branches. Deep roots lead to luxuriant leaves. For his mother, Shakyamuni explained this type of drama which follows. Sutra, at that time, uncountably, many Buddhas and great Bodhisattvas, Mahasattvas from infinite worlds in the ten directions assembled. Com commentary, at that time, Uncountably, many Buddhas and great Bodhisattvas, Mahasattvas from infinite worlds in the ten directions assembled. Worlds throughout the ten directions are the dependent retribution, while all the ineffable, the ineffable Buddhas and great Bodhisattvas are retribution proper. People are retribution proper while worlds are dependent retribution. These are the two types of retributions. There are five ways to explain at that time. First, this refers to the times when the Dharma is about to be spoken, the time that the Dharma is being spoken, and the time when the Dharma has already been spoken. Here, it would be when the Buddha wanted to speak the Dharma. Then, when the Buddha was explaining his Dharma, this Dharma on fealty, and then when the Buddha finished explaining this Dharma on being fealty to one's parents, this is the first explanation. The second explanation for it refutes the non buddhist Non-Buddhists speak dramas that do not specify past, present, or future. They are vague. This explanation contradicts the Non-Buddhists by explaining the drama in the, of the past, present, and future. This is the second meaning of meaning to at that time. The third meaning for at that time is a time for planting. Once the seeds are planted, there will be a time for ripening and harvesting. What happens after ripening? There is a time for liberation, which also occurs at that time. For example, someone who was never planted good roots, such as the elder who wants to leave the home life. The great Arahats took a look at him through so and saw that he did not do any good deeds in the last 30,000 great ends. They refused to let him leave the home life. Do not consider having a home easy. It is all because of body planted in life's past. People who are monastic now got to be monastics. Now got to be monastics because they planted good rules, rules of goodness in the last 80,000 great ends. Do not think one can usually become a monk or a nun. Telling those who have never planted rules of godliness to plant some, those who have never recited the Buddha's name to recite, and those who have never recited mantras to recite it is about planting rules of goodness. Once the seeds are in the soil, 
they will grow and mature. It is like farming, for instance, where seeds are planted in the soil and harvested in the fall. If they ripen but are not harvested, it would not do any good. Liberation means when the seeds are collected. This also means telling those who have not completed good roots to do so, those who have already planted good roots to become monks. They are reap when they are monks. Monks must become Buddhas, which requires certifying to the fruit and becoming liberated. So listen to sutra lectures. It's not about listening to the sutra a um, couple of times and refusing to listen to anymore. The more you listen, the more you have this type of knowledge. If you do not listen, you will not increase your knowledge of Buddhist studies. The fourth is an explanation that there is a real teacher speaking the Dharma. Once a real teacher is in place, then the orthodox teaching is spoken. After that, there is proper learning. If you do not study proper, even proper teachings are not helpful to you. You may want to study properly and the orthodox teachings are there. But you do not have a teacher who truly understands, then you cannot learn. So the first explanation on uh, that term um, refers to the presence of a real teacher, the orthodox teachings and proper learning. The fifth explanation of at uh, that time is the time when the Buddha was willing to speak the drama and living beings were willing to listen to the drama. Listening to the drama and speaking the drama occur simultaneously. Neither one is higher or lower as long as the audience and the teachings click. Some beings come and listen to the sutra to the Buddha speak this drama. The above wanted to speak and living beings wanted to listen. They are equal. Above are five different explanations of at that time. For this sutra, the first is the fulfilled condition of faith. First, I have heard is the fulfilled condition of hearing. The at one time is the fulfilled condition of time. The Buddha is the fulfilled condition of the host the the chayashim shaheven is the fulfilled condition of a place and the speaking drama for his mother is the fulfilled condition of the assembly although the buddha was speaking the drama for his mother being is the being in, in the heavens and human beings also followed him among those who always accompanied the buddha there were already 1,250 disciples of the Buddha alone. The Lord of the Chayashim Shaheven Indra was the Dharma protector, the mill host, and the one who requested the Dharma. Although the Buddha was speaking Dharma for his mother, he was really speaking Dharma for the Great Assembly. Therefore, this line also fulfills fulfills the condition of the assembly, the above, and the six conditions. At that time, many, many Buddhas and all the great Bodhisattvas with lofty reserves throughout the ineffably ineffable worlds in space and the Dharma realm of the ten directions gathered. See, all the Buddhas and the great Bodhisattvas were gathered when the first door sutra was lectured, so people should gather too. All the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas throughout the ten directions also gathered as we now lecture on the Earth Star Sutra. Open your Buddha eyes and look. All the infinite and uncountable number of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, Mahasattvas throughout the ten directions now gather to support this Dharma assembly. 
Sutra to praise it how Shakyamuni Buddha is able to manifest powerful great wisdom and spiritual penetrations in the evil world of the five turbidities. Commentary All the Bodhisattvas Mahasattvas throughout the ten directions went to the Chayashim Sha Black 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 Palace to praise how Shakyamuni Buddha. Shakyamuni is Sanskrit. Shakya is a surname, while Muni is the first name. The name Shakyamuni is his individual name. Buddha is a name common to all Buddhas. Each Buddha has his unique name. In this case, Shakyamuni. Shakya means capable of being human. Why Moni means still and quiescent. What does it mean by capable of being human? It means that you can save all beings universally with humanness and virtue. She and still and quiet uh, quiescent means unmoving silent and sent free. Confucianism speaks of there is nothing more in quietude, no sounds, no orders. This is an indication of having reached the original substance. Still and unmoving is samadhi, why capable of being human is wisdom. How come the Buddha can rescue the being beings universally ill with humanness and kindness? It is because he has wisdom. Capable of being human is to accord with conditions still and present is unchanging. The Buddha never changes but always accords with conditions, accord with conditions but never changes. In this still and unmoving samadhi, the he immediately connects to responses. All beings with all their variety of thoughts, regardless of how many, the thoughts come one knows and sees them all. The Buddha sees them all because he is capable of being human. He knows them all because he is still and present. Do not think that no one knows what we do. The Buddha knows everything, so if we are but 10% sincere in our cultivation, we will receive a 10% response. If we are 100% sincere, you will receive a 100% response. If you are millions upon millions times sincere, then even though Shakyamuni Buddha is, re is there on that present and unmoving fundamental, fundamental Intel enlightenment. He will connect with you immediately, providing you with a helpful response so that he will be successful in your practice soon. That is what is meant what is mean by Shakyamuni Buddha. The Buddha enlightens himself enlightens others and has perfected conducts that enlighten. As it is said, one becomes a Buddha when he has perfected the three enlightenments, perfected three types of enlightenments, perfected are beginning enlightenment, fundamental enlightenment, and ultimate enlightenment. Buddha is half of the little uh, transliterated trans Sanskrit word Buddhaya. What kind of individual was the Buddha? The Buddha is a greatly enlightened one. If every one of us cultivate according to the Sh uh, Buddha Dharma, he, we will reach this kind of enlightenment, this kind of result. So Shakyamuni Buddha long ago said, all living beings can become, can become Buddhas. Why? It is because they all have the Buddha nature. So, as long as you are willing to work hard on your cultivation, you can become a Buddha. In the evil world of the five turbidities, the five turbidities are one, 
Compatibility. This is an impure term and age. Two, viewability. The views are impure. Three, afflictions to BDT. Impure because of people's affliction. Four, living beings to BDT. Living beings are impure. Five, life to BDT. Our lives are to be and impure. The compatibility means that we live in very filthy times. The Sura Gama Man Sutra says that dirt placed in a bowl of clear water loses its original function. What was the function of the dirt? It acts as a blockade. Dirt holds up people as they walk on it. Without dirt, we would fall into the sea. Since there is water under dirt, people hold the dirt because below water is the fire. Sometimes volcanoes erupt a transformative function. Will the fire not be squashed by water? No, there is so much fire that water cannot put it out. If you want to understand this kind of principle, you must study the Buddha Dharma store. The Suragama store says, Earth loses, loses its ability to block and water stops being clean. That is turbidity. How this evil world of five turbidities is like water and earth mixed together. It is unclean. How? The compatibility, for example, has no time or is no clear as to what time it is. Viewability, how can our views be differentiated clearly? They cannot. Can you divide up everyone's views, categorizing some as my views and some as your views? Where do you draw the boundary between your views and my views? There are no batteries or they are unclear, so things seem to blur together. This is a view stability. Affliction stability means everyone is afflicted. Your afflictions and my afflictions mix together and become unclear. Some say, I know these afflictions are mine and those afflictions are yours. If so, how come you can bring out my afflictions if those were mine? You should not be able to bring them thus to bring them out if your afflictions were yours. I should not be able to bring out your afflictions. Thus we can tell that afflictions have two battery to and are to be Living beings stability. Living beings are human beings in this lifetime but in become but may become dogs in the next life and cats in the life after that. Maybe even rest in the life after that. Then as insects that crawl all over the place. How can you draw such concrete distinctions? Living beings cooperate to start a large firm. Our distinctions are unclear. You are either selling others or being sold by others in this large firm. We are all related. Is this not still not turbid? This is living beings turbidity. The five turbidities are extremely complicated. But Shakyamuni Buddha is able to manifest a powerful great wisdom and spiritual penetrations in this area war in this evil world that is one of the worst worlds. He can manifest the inconceivably wondrous wisdom, the sub subtle wonderful and inconceivable power of wonderful great wisdom, wonderful spiritual powers. Inconceivable means that it is a sutra, the Lord is how he regulates and subdues the obstinate beings so that they can learn what causes suffering and what brings bliss. 
each one sent his attendants to pay their respects to the world honored one at that time the first come one smiled and emitted billions of great light clouds commentary they loaded how he regulates and subdues the obstinate beings what is subduing people and perhaps particularly the chinese enjoy delicious foods they season our plain vegetables with five different kinds of flavors sweet sour bitter spicy and salty so spicy and people who do not like spicy foods will not eat that dish at all too sour and those who do not like sour foods will not eat any of that dish too bitter and most people do not like it even when it is too sweet some people will not like it so the flavors must be balanced each seasoning is just right neither too much nor too little people enjoy foods that taste good the same applies to the buddha drama some prefer this practice others prefer another practice some prefer christianity while some prefer catholicism some prefer islam while some prefer taoism or confucianism confucianism taoism buddhism christianity and islam are five major world religions they are said to be five but they are actually one how are they one according to the buddha's dharma everything is the buddha dharma all religions and their practices are included here catholicism christianity islam taoism confucianism are all included in all dharmas none of them transcend all dharmas no religion will say it has no dharma or is beyond the dharma actually there is no dharma outside the dharma all dharmas are the buddha dharma all cannot be acquired no you have really come home if you say all dharmas are gone i would not try to come up with a way to deceive you telling you that you will get something good to eat no there is nothing to begin with there was nothing how do we know the great master sixth patriarch said the body was without a tree the mirror without a stand originally there was not a thing where does dust alight since there was nothing to begin with where will you find dust since there is nothing dust cannot dirty it all these dramas are the buddha drama people who understand know that all dramas are the buddha drama there are right dramas and wrong dramas ultimate dramas and non ultimate dramas good dramas and bad dramas cultivation requires practicing the ultimate dramas is like walking if you have an airplane you can definitely go from the americas to europe how long would you have to walk if you were to walk from the americans to europe besides walking on land you have to trek across the ocean too when you get to the ocean you have to take a boat which is slow and takes a long time it would be faster if you were to take a plane this is analogous to cultivating the non ultimate dharmas you must cultivate for a long time before you can reach your home buddhahood cultivate the ultimate dharmas and you will reach your home soon what are the non ultimate dharmas it is like all non buddhist dharmas that are somewhat helpful but slow ultimate dharmas are means of cultivation that accord with the buddha dharma speaking of disciplining obstinate beings shakyamuni buddha will not begin by criticizing anger to angry people he would say anger is not so bad afflictions are just a body can you do that is no problem that you are angry afflictions are just a body Birth and death are just nirvana, making feel as if 
it is not too it's not bad to have a temper although I have a huge temper body is not small so he tries and the more he tries the fewer afflictions he has and the weaker the body afflictions decrease by the day while body increases by the day it is body to reduce afflictions tell obstinate beings this kind of drama how does the buddha speak to weak and fearful living beings they will they have no will of their own always afraid they tremble from hearing a cousin meow, leaving their body from hearing a dog's bark. They are afraid of any movement, so the Buddha said, Do not be afraid. Study the Buddha Dharma and it will help and protect you. Speak credibly to fearful beings like you. Consequently, they will believe in the Buddha Dharma. After they study the Buddha drama, they will become more and more courageous day by day. For example, I had a disciple who took refuge with me in Hong Kong. Before he took refuge, he was afraid of ghosts and dark nights. He was so frightened that he did not dare to step out the door when the night fell. Even though there were other people in the house with him, he was still afraid. He felt as if he was surrounded by ghosts even though he does not see any. When he took refuge, I did not give him any mantra or drama. But after he took refuge, he was not afraid of being alone, not afraid of ghosts or the dark. He was not afraid to be home alone at night. He was not afraid to go outside. This is how you help fearful beings. Tell the being beings who like to cry to stop and be joyful instead. In short, living beings who are extreme we must reach the middle way. This is the principle behind regulating others. Regulating obstinate beings so that they can learn what causes suffering and what brings bliss. Obstinate beings do not care whether there is suffering or joy. What is suffering? What is joy? He does not care. Since he is obstinate, he is not afraid of suffering or happiness. Shakyamuni Buddha make obstinate beings know what is true suffering and what is true happiness. Exactly what is the true suffering? Falling into the lower realms is true suffering. For example, it is true suffering to fall into the realm of the house, hungry ghosts or animals. What is true happiness? Becoming enlightened, certifying to the fruition of Ahatshri and practicing the Bodhisattva path is true happiness. Actually, there are so many kinds of suffering and happiness, but it is fine just for us to have a general idea. Each one sent his attendant. All the great Bodhisattvas, Mahasattvas throughout the lands of the ten directions did not come alone. Each Bodhisattva brought many attendants, perhaps one, two, three, or four. Some preferred as many as several hundred, seven, several thousand, or several tens of thousands of attendants. Each person sent the attendants with him to pay their respects to the world honored one. They went up to the Buddha and greeted him. What are their greetings like? They say, is the world or not one healthy, at ease and happy? Are living beings easy to save? World or not one, are you free of any sickness? Are you free of any afflictions? Are you very happy? Are living beings easy? Are living beings easy to deliver to the shore of perfection? This is how they greet the world or not one. At that time, the first common Shakyamuni's mind a slight smile, not a boisterous laugh, and emitted billions of varieties of great, the largest light clouds and colorful clouds. Sutra, there was a light cloud of great fulfillment, the light cloud of great compassion, the light cloud of great wisdom, the light cloud of great prana, the light cloud of great samadhi, the light cloud 
of great auspiciousness, the light cloud of great blessings, the light cloud of great merit, the light cloud of great refuge, and the light cloud of great praise. After emitting in the sphere babbly, babbly, many light clouds. Commentary as said, there was the billions and billions of clouds of great light. Since billions and billions are numerous, they, he will only name ten. These ten represent the contemplation of the ten vehicles and the ten dramariums. As said, the light cloud of great fulfillment. Shakyamuni Buddha released lead clouds of great perfection, which are symbolic of how the realm of Buddhas pervades the, the entire Dharma realm. Perfection means that something is non-existent yet omnipresent, shining on all places without an exception of a dust mode. Aura of space, aura of space, and the Dharma realm are covered by these great clouds of light. This is the realm of Buddhas, which is perfect. The light cloud of great compassion, kindness can bestow happiness, while compassion can uproot suffering. This is the Bodhisattva path. Bodhisattvas conduct themselves to bring living beings every happiness and uproot living beings every suffering. Whatever living beings enjoy, give that to them. They like sweets, give them sweets. They like sour things, give them sour things. When Universal Worthy Bodhisattva was the temple's dining hall attendant, someone who stands by the table serving and refilling food for monastics, he had all the seasonings with him, one bottle after another. Do you enjoy something sweet? And he will add some sugar. You enjoy something sour, and he will add some vinegar. You enjoy something spicy, and he will give you some hot pepper. He had bottles all over his body. He carried all these seasonings with him because if someone wants something sour, he will pour something sour for him. But the person will complain, "Hey, I do not want that much." How come you gave me so much? Someone says he wants something spicy, but the bodhisattva is afraid of afraid to pour too much to the person will not want it. He pours very little, and the other person yells, "Hey, some more! So little!" The universal worthy bodhisattva has a hard time satisfying living beings. He gives a lot, and they complain that it is too much. He gives a little, and they complain that it is too little. See, it's not very easy to be a bodhisattva. Confucius of China had this to say: Only women and petty individuals are most difficult to live with. Women and petty individuals are difficult to handle. How come? Too close, and they condescend. Get too close to them, and they become unreasonable and. Do not observe the rules. Too far, and they resent. Stay a distance from them, and they resent you. They are difficult to interact with. Confucius probably suffered in this way. So, as an experienced expert, he is worth feed people's understanding. Bodhisattvas are this way too. Too good to people, and it does not accord with the middle way. Too mean to people, and that does not accord with the middle way either. So, universal worthy bodhisattva has a hard time satisfying living beings. The bodhisattva path is difficult to walk. I am so considerate of you, and you are so dissatisfied. This light cloud of compassion represents the bodhisattva path. The light cloud of great wisdom. This wisdom represents the realm of those who enlightened to conditions, those who cultivated the twelve causal wings and became enlightened. He needs great wisdom. What is great wisdom? He contemplates the twelve causal wings and knows that all things come into being and cease. 
Through this principle, he develops true wisdom from the Buddha nature. So the light cloud of great wisdom represents the realm of those who enlighten to conditions. The twelve causal links are ignorance, conditions, conditions, activity, activity, conditions, consciousness, consciousness, conditions, form, form, conditions, the six entrances, the six entrances, conditions, contact, contact, conditions, feelings, feelings, condition, love, love, conditions, craving, craving, conditions, existence, existence, conditions, birth, birth, conditions, old age, and death. This series involves birth migration. There is also a series that involves seizing. Ignorance ceases, then activity ceases. Activity ceases, then consciousness ceases. Consciousness ceases, then name and form cease. Name and form cease, then the six entrances cease. The six entrances cease, then contact ceases. Contact ceases, then feeling ceases. Feeling ceases, then love ceases. Love ceases, then craving ceases. Craving ceases, then existence ceases. Existence ceases, then birth ceases. Birth ceases, then old age and death cease. Shatter ignorance and everything disappears. So those who enlighten to conditions contemplate and shatter ignorance first. Everything comes from ignorance. He shatters ignorance, and real wisdom is born. The light cloud of great prana. Prana is wisdom, which includes literary prana, real mark prana, contemplative prana. Satyras develop contemplative prana from literary prana. They reach real mark prana. Through contemplative prana, since they reached the real mark prana, they certified to arhatship. These are the sound hearers behind you. The light cloud of great samadhi. Samadhi is Sanskrit that means concentration. Heavenly beings cultivate ten good deeds at the highest level and reach the four dhyanas and the eight samadhis through this power of concentration. The four dhyanas are the fourth dhyana heaven, third dhyana heaven, second dhyana heaven, and first dhyana heaven. The first dhyana is called the ground of living, the production of bliss. The second dhyana is called the ground of bliss from samadhi. The third dhyana is called the ground of living bliss. The fourth dhyana is called the ground of purity from letting go thoughts. There are also the four stations of emptiness, the boundless emptiness heaven, the boundless consciousness heaven, the heaven of no particular place, and the heaven of thought, no non-thought. Together, these are the four dhyanas and the eight samadhis. These types of individuals have samadhi and cultivate the highest among the ten goodnesses. Which include the superior grade, the average grade, and the below average grade. These people, the light cloud of great auspiciousness, auspiciousness represents the human realm. People want everything to be auspicious. In Chinese, this means luck, such as wishing each other great luck around Chinese New Year's in the hopes that good things happen. It also means auspiciousness, something lucky. Those who cultivate the average grade among the ten good deeds take the three refuges and receive the five precepts of will, become reborn in the human realm. The light clouds of great blessings, blessings and virtues represent the asuras. Asuras are in the heavens, the human realm, the animal realm, and the hungry ghost realm. In short, they also have great blessings and virtue. So this kind of clouds of light shine on the asuras. The light, the light cloud of great merit, represents the animal realm. The Buddha releases this kind of meritorious cloud of light. So that all the animals will eliminate their offenses, 
leave suffering and attain bliss in the future. The light cloud a great refuge. This represents the realm of hungry ghosts. The Buddha releases this kind of clouds of light so that all hungry ghosts will change from being evil to being good, reforming and renewing themselves. They will wish to take refuge with the Triple Jewel. Ghosts can take refuge with the Triple Jewel too. And the light cloud of great praise. This represents the realm of hell beings. The Buddha releases this kind of cloud of light out of praise. Beings in the hells who see these clouds of light will want to leave suffering and attain bliss, change for the better and set their ties on Buddha. These ten kinds of clouds of light represent the faculties of beings in the ten realms. Shakyamuni Buddha releases so many kinds of clouds of light so that living beings throughout the ten drama realms will become Buddhas soon. After emitting indescribably many light clouds that are wonderful beyond words than what? Sutra, he also uttered many wonderful subtle sounds. There was the sound of Dana Paramita, the sound of Srila Paramita, the sound of Shanti Paramita, the sound of Viriya Paramita, the sound of Dhyana Paramita, and the sound of Prana Paramita. There was the sound of compassion, the sound of joyous giving, the sound of liberation, the sound of no outflows. Commentary. He also uttered many wonderful subtle sounds. He let out various kinds, not just one, but many different kinds of subtle and wondrous voices. These voices are not too loud and harmonize with one another. Wondrous means that it is clear. The Buddha's voice is very clear, subtle and wonderful. The Buddha speaks the drama with one voice regardless of which type of living being hears the Buddha's voice in speaking the Dharma, he understands. Even people of different countries hear him and understand what he says. The Buddha speaks with one voice, but the Japanese will hear him speaking Japanese, the British will hear him speaking English, the French will hear him speaking French, the Spanish will hear, will hear him speaking Spanish. Although these languages are different, the Buddha can make them appear in his single voice. He does not need translations into many languages. The Buddha's state is inconceivable. That is why it is said that the Buddha explains the Dharma with a single voice and living beings understand it according to their kind. What are sounds? Sounds are dreams. Why? If you understand the sound, it is as if you drank it. Sounds are also hidden. Some are louder and some are quieter, half hidden and half appearing. The Buddha state is incredible. Living beings find his voice very different. You hear it as this kind of voice and he hears it as another kind of voice. Also, he utters one voice, but different beings will hear the voice differently. How far can the Buddha's voice reach? Mahamangalayana was foremost in spiritual penetrations. He had tried to use his spiritual powers to cross as many worlds as sands in the Ganges River toward the east by looking for the sound of the Buddha's voice. After traveling as many worlds as sands in the Ganges River, the Buddha's voice was still as loud as it was when he was in front of the Buddha, so the Buddha's voice is inconceivable. The Buddha now emits so many kinds of voices, not just one kind. How many kinds in total? There was the sound of Dana Paramita. Dana is a Sanskrit word that means giving. We have said this many times before. There is the giving of wealth, the giving of drama, and the giving of fearlessness. Also, everyone understands, we can explain the meaning of giving in more depth now. Giving without being attached to the outer size of giving is real giving. Giving while attached to the outer size of giving will result in becoming reborn in the heavens. 
giving without being attached to the outer size of giving will result in retribution that is free from our flow. Not being attached means not remembering it. For instance, I gave someone some money and I keep thinking, ah, I will reap some fun retribution from making this donation. In the end, there is either no reward or the mere reward of being reborn in the heavens, not the retribution free from our flaws. What does it mean by giving without being attached to outer marks? One must be empty in three aspects. There is no giver, nothing given, and no receiver. What is giving? What is being given? Recalling that there is a giver is a sign that there is a self. One cannot forget oneself. For example, I have donation to contribute to building a temple, to building a Buddha images, or to printing sutras. This is an attachment. What is attachment? I am a donor. I can give fifty thousand dollars. The gift. The fifty thousand dollars I donate, whether it is building a temple, building Buddha images, or printing sutras, I earned some merit from contributing this gift. I am the donor. I offer the gift. Now, along with the donor and the gift, there is a receiver. There is a subject and object to the uh, to the receiver. The subject of the receiver is someone who receives that donation of fifty thousand dollars. The object received is the gift the other party gave to me, making the other party the giver of the gift received. Without a giver and a gift, there would be no receiver and nothing received. These are the three aspects of emptiness in giving, which is about not being attached to the outer marks of giving. Paramita is a Sanskrit word, which means to the other shore or arriving at the other shore. What other shore is this? Arriving at the other shore means we have succeeded with what we want to do, fulfilling our wishes and reaching our goals. For instance, we want to become liberated from the cycle of birth and death. Now, birth and death is this shore, while nirvana is the other shore. From this shore of birth and death, cross the currents of afflictions, and reaching the other shore of nirvana, we arrive at the other shore, wanting to reach the Buddha's world of constant and still light. We start walking toward our destination. When we reach our destination, we have arrived at the other shore. From this shore of ordinary beings to the other shore of sages, certifying to the sage lay foot. Is also called reaching the other shore. We did not understand the Buddha Dharma before, but now we do. This is also called arrival at the other shore. But that other shore consists of an ultimate and a non-ultimate shore. What is the ultimate shore? What is the non-ultimate shore? Ordinary people who certify to the first level of ahasip reach the other shore of first level ahasip. But not the other shore of the second level ahasip. When we certify to the second level ahasip, we reach the other shore of second level ahasip. But not the other shore of the third level ahasip. When we certify to the third level ahasip, we reach the other shore of third level ahasip. But not the other shore of the fourth level ahasip. When we certify to the fourth level ahasip. We reach the other shore of fourth level ahasip, but not the other shore of the bodhisattvas. When we certify to the level of bodhisattvas, we reach the other shore of bodhisattvas, but not the other shore of the buddhas. When we certify to the level of buddhas, that is the ultimate other shore, the final other shore. So this. So the other shore can be explained at a very profound level and endlessly. I have only explained a few principles here. Once you understand the meaning of the other shore, expand and elaborate on it so that you reach the ultimate other shore. Also, I explain 
only a few principles for you. If you can expand and elaborate on this, such as getting insights on 10 or 100 principles from my explanation of one principle, then you are expanding and elaborating on the meaning. Another example is our sutra lecture. We begin now and when we finish two hours later, we reach the other shore, that is Paramita. Another example is we started with Thus I have heard, which is the shore by the time we reach the end. We reach the end about how everyone is happy and left in full faith. It means we have reached the other shore. In short, when we reach our goal, we arrive at the other shore. Once you understand this, uh, this other shore, you reach the other shore. Our biggest goal is to realize Buddhahood, attain Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, the unsurpassed equal level and right enlightenment. This is our other shore. The sound of Shila Paramita. Shila means clear and calm. It is clean and refreshing, which means the absence of heated afflictions. This is one interpretation. There is another interpretation for it, which means prevention. There is national defense with its preventative measures and equipped armies that will strike other countries that do not observe the laws and try to attack us. This is national defense. Families have their preventative measures and individuals have their preventative measures. This is personal defense. What are we preventing? We want to prevent all evil deeds, avoid any evil means doing no evil and doing all good. There was a great like man in the olden days who pleaded with his senior monk to give an explanation on the Buddha Dharma. This monk responded, do no evil and devote to all good, the layman said. Elder monk, I am requesting the Buddha Dharma from you. Even three years old, three year olds understand this, do no evil and devote to all good. How can you tell me this is Buddha Dharma? The old monk said. Three year olds may understand it, but 80 years old cannot do it. Three-year-olds may understand it, but 80-year-olds cannot do it. All evil means each and every possible kind of evil. To me, each is one, why everyone is many. Many are one, so why do you even do one evil deed? Do one and you will do a second evil deed. Do that second, second evil deed and you will do a third evil deed. So a third evil deed, you will do a fourth evil deed. Even millions and millions of evil deeds. All these are accumulated from one. A mountain, for instance, is huge and it came from one dust particle. Many dust particles gather together to create a mountain. So how many is many? There is no applicable number. Might as well explain it as one so that it is easier to understand. So, do not do even one evil deed. This is called doing no evil. Doing no evil means not doing many evil deeds. But this thing I am about to do is probably not included in all the evil deeds. I can do that. My explanation now prohibits the doing of even, even one evil deed, not to mention many, which is all the more prohibited. This is most critical, most wonderful. Do not do even one evil deed. Devote to all good. This means doing every single good deed, whether the deed is big or small, even if the deed is as minor as a piece of hair, as long as it is good, do it. If you do not do it, then you will miss that bit of the all good. All refers to the great function of the entire substance without any flaw of deficiency. I do not do only this kind of good deed, but not the other kind. No, I use all of me. Avoid 
every evil and devote to all good, goodness, whether numerous or few, major or minor, ought to be done. But do no evil. You are mixed up if you do evil deeds, regardless of how big or small they are. So this elder monk said, Also three year olds understand, eighty year old elders cannot do it. This is because you cannot perfect it. Shila also means precepts. When the Buddha entered Nirvana, Ananda asked the Buddha one of these questions, which is, when the Buddha was in the world, we had the Buddha as our teacher. After the Buddha enters Nirvana, who do we take to be our teacher? The Buddha answered Ananda's question, saying, Monastic disciples should take the precepts as their master. The precepts talk about avoiding all evil and doing every good, which is to stop evil and prevent wrongdoing. So Shakyamuni Buddha talked about the Shila Paramita. Precepts are most critical. Number one, earlier we said giving is the foremost important issue in cultivation. Now we say keeping the precepts is. This is also a most important topic in cultivation. Some people are wondering how come there are so many firsts, there are no seconds in the Buddha Dharma. All are number one. No matter which Dharma it is, it is the foremost. Someone once asked me out of the 84,000 practices of the Buddha Dharma, which is the number one, which is the most lofty, the most wonderful. Guess how I responded? I said, the Buddha Dharma contains 84,000 kinds of Dharmas, creating 84,000 number ones, none of which is number two. Why did I say this? The 84,000 practices are antidotes for curing living beings, 84,000 problems. Each being has his or her problem. The practice that cures his habit is number one. For example, all the medicines include some that cure headaches, headaches, some cure pain in the throat, some cure pain in the eyes, some cure pain in the ears, toothaches, pain of the nose and the rest of the body parts. Which medicine is number one? It would be wrong to say the medicine for curing a headache is number one and the medication for curing pain in the eyes is number two. Take medicine for curing a headache is if that is what you have. That medication is number one. You have problems with your eyes. Take medicine to cure the eye disease. Then that medication is number one. For example, we have greed, hatred and delusion. By understanding the Buddha Dharma and curing your greed, the Buddha Dharma which killed your greed is number one. By understanding the Buddha Dharma and curing your hatred, then that Buddha Dharma which killed your hatred is number one. By understanding the Buddha Dharma and curing your delusion, then that Buddha Dharma which killed your delusion is number one. Living beings have 84,000 habits, so the Buddha spoke 84,000 dramas to cure those 84,000 habits. Whatever can cure your illness is number one. Whichever ones fail are not number ones. So, there are 84,000 first places among the 84,000 dramas. The Vata Sutra says, the drama is equal and level without high or low, since there is neither high or low. I say the, the 84,000 dramas are all number one. Is that not the Buddha drama? I lecture the sutras differently than others. Other people lecture and will definitely explain the do no evil as not doing all or many evils. They will not explain it as one evil, but since I do not know numbers, there are too many to count. I don't know which is which. I figured since I can't catch up, I might as well turn around and head back, meet up from another direction. 
For example, this person is a fast runner, so I will turn whenever he turns. I can never catch up by chasing after him, but if I turn around and wait for him at the other end, I meet up with him. See, this is the way I lecture the sutras too, since there are so many numbers that I cannot figure out how many exactly. I will just talk about one. Not only do I understand this time, even children understand. This is how I lecture the dramas. The Shila Paramita. Shila means keeping the precepts. There are so many people who keep the precepts whom I can talk about, but I will talk about one. Who is he? Vinaya Master Tao Swan. Vinaya Master Tao Swan was foremost in keeping the precepts in China and had achieved the highest level of understanding in the Vinaya. Due to the way he upheld the precepts, he moved the heavenly beings to bring him food. He did not eat food in the human realm, but ate food in the heavens offered by the heavenly beings. Everyone knows that among the Chinese patriarchs, only Vinaya Master Tao Tzuan received offerings from heavenly beings. The Vinaya talks special, uh, specifically about the principles of the outer marks of the precepts, the precept Dharma and comportment, the 3,000 comportments and 80,000 fine conducts. Where did these 3,000 comportments come from? They came from the four great compartments of walking, standing, sitting, and lying down. Walk with dignified decorum. Sit with dignified decorum. Stand with dignified decorum. And recline with dignified decorum. Walk like a breeze. This breeze is not a typhoon or a gale. If you walk like you are running, then you have turned into a girl. If not a typhoon, do not do that. Walk like a light breeze that does not even stir, stir up waves in the water. The light breeze is slow and does not blow over water and create waves. Stand like a pine. Stand as straight as a pine tree. Don't shrug back your neck and look up. Lethargic or sleepy, stand with your chest out and back straight. Looking down at the ground when you walk is like looking at the house. Do not walk with your head too high up either. Let it be natural but straight. This is standing among the four great compartments. Also, don't look around when you walk, glancing front and back, looking left and right. The police will think this person must want to steal to crack someone's door open. They will pay attention to you, so don't glance about. Sit like a bell. Recline like a bow. Recline like a bow with the right hand palming your chin and the left on the side of your hip. This is an auspicious posture for reclining. Curl your legs slightly like a bow. There are 250 rules of compartment for each type of major compartments, walking, standing, sitting, and lying down. There are 250 for walking, 250 for sitting, 250 for lying down, and 250 for standing. These are very detailed, so there are as many as 250 for each type. C is not so easy at 250 for each type together makes a total of 1000. There are three sets of 1000. 1000 for the past, 1000 for the present, and 1000 for the future. These are the 3000 rules of compartments. Since Vinaya Master Tao Xuan kept the precepts strictly and I replete with the 3000 forms of compartment and a 80,000 minor conducts which so moved the heavenly beings that they brought him food. When he cultivated, he did not speak or laugh casually. 
You had to speak to him according to the rules of the Vinaya for him to respond. If you did not, he would not speak. He did not laugh easily, but he did not cry, get angry, or pout either. He was just natural all the time. He was not in any particular state of joy, anger, sadness, or happiness. What kind of person does not have any joy, anger, sadness, or happiness? A wooden person. A wooden sculpture has no joy, anger, sadness, or happiness. He was not happy or upset. He did not cry or delight. But before joy, anger, sadness, or happiness develops, that is just the middle way. People who keep the precepts keep to the middle way in every action and every move. Vinaya Master Tao Xuan kept to the middle way, so heavenly beings, including Lu Xuan Chang, were so moved that they bought, brought him offerings every day at noon. Despite such heavenly offerings, he maintained one meal a day. Vinaya Master Tao Xuan cultivated at Mount Chong Nan, a seemingly continuous mountain range linked to the Himalayas. I hear that Mount Shungnan in China has many seasoned cultivators who cultivated and became enlightened there. There are many wolves and tigers there too, but they do not obstruct monastic cultivators. In fact, they act as supporters of the drama. Vinaya Master Tao Xuan cultivated there, living in a straw hut hut while Heavenly beings presented him with offerings. At that time, Java Master Kui Chi had four stars. What was it? He said, I have tried all the most delicious food in the human realm, whether vegetarian or not. I have tried them all, but have, I have not tried food from the heavens. Vinaya Master Tao Xuan has heavenly beings bringing him offerings. Let me go there for lunch. For this reason, he went to Matru Nan to see Vinaya Master Tao Xuan. Dhamma Master Kui Chi was a national master too. He was a very intelligent disciple of Dhamma Master Xuan Chang of the Consciousness Only School. At that time, 800 or 900 monks translated to trust together. He was a key player. In any case, he went there early for lunch. Since Vinaya Master Tao Xuan only eats lunch, but he waited and waited lunch time, afternoon, evening, no one offered any food. Both Vinaya Master Tao Xuan and Dhamma Master Kui Chi did not have any food to eat. Dhamma Master Kui Chi loved to eat excellent food, so he could not tolerate going without food for a day. This was so no small distress. You say heavenly beings offer you food every day. How come there is nothing now that I am here? Did you brag? Did you lie? Vinaya Master Tao Xuan said, Say what you will. You may say I lie, but I know whether I lie or not. Dharma Master Kui Chi said he lied, but he did not argue back. Dharma Master Kui Chi waited until nightfall, so he spent the night at the straw hut because it got me too dark to walk. So there was a fat monk and a skinny monk. The fat monk was Dhamma Master Kui Chi and the skinny monk was Vinaya Master Tao Xuan. Although Vinaya Master Tao Xuan ate heavenly offerings daily, he was not fat. Although Dhamma Master Kui Chi did not eat heavenly offerings every day, he was very fat. He enjoyed eating so he was always telling the cook to think up some excellent dishes. Dharma Master Kui Chi did not meditate or investigate Diana, but fell on the bed and slept. As soon as he fell uh, asleep, he was snoring thunderously. Vinaya Master Tao Xuan meditated and did not snore. Dharma Master Kui Chi lied there and snored in his sleep. Vinaya Master Tao Xuan was so disturbed that he could not enter Samadhi, so he was picking lies off of his body. 
mud chong nan is very cold so cultivators have lice from not showering too often as the lice beat him he picked the lice off of him because he kept the precepts he did not dare to kill so he slowly placed the lice on the ground there was no light and nothing happening Dharma Master Kui Chu fell asleep too, so he did not know at all. Vinaya Master Tao Xuan continued to meditate. The next morning, Vinaya Master Tao Xuan told Dharma Master Kui Chu, Hey, how come you do not cultivate at all? You don't meditate, you don't do any practice, you lie down and sleep at night, snoring loudly and talking in your sleep. I could not meditate or enter Samadhi. Dharma Master Kui said, Ah, you say I have no cultivation, but I think you don't. You say heavenly beings bring you offerings, but since I have been here, I have not seen any heavenly being. Last night, instead of doing your practice, you were picking lies. You picked two lies. If you had pinched them dead, then never mind. But you placed them on the ground. One fell down and died, and the other broke two legs. The dead louse went to King Yama to seal you. King Yama was planning to send some ghosts over to capture you for questioning, but I spoke on your behalf. I told you that you are a cultivator and hope that King Yama will forgive you. I told those two lies to fight their next birth. This is how you were saved from your troubles, and you actually tell me that I disturbed you, preventing you from cultivating. I think you have no cultivation whatsoever. Vinaya Master Tao Xuan thought, how did he know about two lies being thrown on the ground? There were no lies on or anything. How did he know? He did not dare to argue because he keeps the precepts, so he did not speak to people casually. He simply remained patient with what other people say about him. He did not argue back or defend. Later, Dharma Master Kui Chi said, I'm leaving. You are just pretending to cultivate here. I'm not going to wait for lunch today. By noon, Heavenly Being Lu Xuan Chang brought offerings to Vinaya Master Tao Xuan. Vinaya Master Tao Xuan, somewhat unhappy, said, why did you not bring any food yesterday? Lu Xuan Chang immediately knelt down and said, Vinaya Master, it's not that I did not make offerings yesterday, but when I did, I could not enter your hut. More than a dozen miles radius around this hut shone with golden light that was so bright I could not open my eyes. I could not see the rose in front of me. I asked the local earth bodhisattva how come the golden light was so bright up ahead that I could not proceed. The local earth bodhisattva said, Someone in the hut is a bodhisattva in the flesh, a living bodhisattva. I circled around a few times yesterday but could not come in, so I could not bring you offerings. Please forgive me. Vinaya Master Tao Xuan thought, no wonder Dharma Master Kui Chi is a national master whom even the emperor believes in. He is a bodhisattva in the flesh. He did not dare to look down on Dharma Master Kui Chi anymore, so we cannot fathom the states of bodhisattvas. The Sauta of Shanti Paramita We have talked about two of the paramitas among the six paramitas in the Marat conducts in the Buddha Dharma. There are four more. The third is Shanti, which is Sanskrit for patience. There is patience with production, patience with Dharma, and patience with the non-production of Dharma. Something extremely wondrous and filled with joy. If you certify with the patience of non-production of Dharma, then you have really tasted the Dharma, really understood the wonder and the inconceivability of the Buddha Dharma. By being patient, you can reach Paramita. By being impatient, you can reach Paramita. The sound of Virya Paramita. Virya is also Sanskrit, which means vigor. 
Some people meet Smith understand Vigo as being diligent with non-Buddhist practices. Actually, those who really understand Vigo are diligent with the Buddha Dharma. Diligent with non-Buddhist practices is merely about cultivating useless ascetic practices. There were many heretics in India. One practice that sought to answer outside of themselves externalist practice was that they ate grass instead of rice, keeping the cow's precepts imitating cows. Another externalist practice was to imitate dogs and keep the precepts of dogs. These extern externalists will not do what dogs refuse to do. They will reject any food dogs reject. They only eat what dogs eat. These are the cows and dogs' precepts. There is another externalist practice of sleeping in a pile of ash. The human body is already unclean, but these externalists pile lots of dust on their bodies and cultivate in the dust. Another externalist practice is to sleep on a bed of nails to show that these externalists can tolerate pain and practice asceticism. These are examples of externalist useless ascetic practices. We think that they are very diligent, but it is actually a different form of knowledge and view. It is not proper knowledge and proper view. This kind of diligence is useless. Be vigorous in the area of good karma rather than evil dharma. Of good dharma rather than evil dharma. Being diligent with evil dharma is to go against the way. Diligent in doing good dharma, such as bowing to the Buddhas, reciting the, su the sutras, bowing in repentance, reciting the Buddha's name, are about being diligent with the body. Then there is being diligent with the mind. What does it mean by being diligent with the mind? Always cultivating thought after thought, never forgetting to cultivate the parameter of vigor, but always forget you, your fatigue. Cultivating the Buddha Dharma truly, that way you will not feel tired or hungry. You will not be bothered by anything that is not according with the Dharma. Why? You are diligent, so you do not have any of these negative feelings. If you were not diligent, then you will experience problems. You will feel tired and lethargic. You figure you might as well go to sleep. This is not Vigo. Vigo is primarily based on what you do, such as cultivating the path of goodness at all times and places. That would be the parameter of Vigo. Last summer, when I lectured on the Suragama Sutra, I explained a four line gather. Every monk or nun should remember this four line gather. When the Buddha was in the world, monastics recited this four line gather every day. They do not forget it at any time. I said this specifically during the summer break. I even think lay people should memorize it, not to mention how monastics should not forget it. This four line gather, gather is guard the mouth and gather in thoughts, make no bodily transgressions, never distress a sentient being, stay far removed from unuseful asceticism. Practitioners like these save the world. Guard the mouth and gather in thoughts, make no bodily transgressions. Do not speak casually or gossip, watch over the mouth to prevent it from talking about this being good and that being bad, this being delicious and that being bad tasting. Gather in thoughts means to pull in all those thoughts so they do not run left to right. Make no bodily transgressions means not violating any precepts with the body. Always remind oneself that one is a left home person. Do not violate the rules. Never distress a sentient being. Do not bother or disturb any sentient being. Sentient beings include not only humans, even animals. 
It is wrong to make any of them upset. Monastics should not be stressed by any sentient being. Stay far removed from unuseful asceticism. Stay far away from unbeneficial ascetic practices. But do the twelve do tanga practices. Avoid those unhelpful practices that do not accord with the Buddha Dharma. Do not study from heretics who dare say that they will become Buddhas in this lifetime. Cultivate according to the Buddha Dharma. Do not observe the precepts of cows and dogs. Why would people do that? Externalists do these bitter practices that are so difficult they open their heavenly eye. When they open up their heavenly eye, they see a dog dies, then enters the heavens. So they imitate dogs by keeping prohibitions that dogs do. Some other externalists see cows do that and imitate cows and keep the prohibitions that cows do. These externalists in India were short on wisdom. Although they cultivated various ascetic practices, none of these practices are helpful. Are helpful. So stay far removed from unuseful asceticism. Practitioners like this save the world. People who cultivate like this can save the world, teaching and transforming living beings. There is no such thing as being vigorous about vigor. Vigor is a drama explained to us ordinary people. In fact, the six parameters are all vigor and not vigor. Giving, keeping precepts, and being patient require physical vigor. Being in dhyana samadhi and developing prana require mental vigor. In a sense, there is no separate category for vigor. Vigor becomes a part of other parameters, such as parameter, uh, such as prana, etc. Giving more, you are vigorous with giving. Keeping to the precepts closely, you are vigorous with the precepts. Being patient more, you are vigorous in patience. Being ever even more vigorous, you are vigorous in vigor. Meditating non-stop, you are vigorous in dhyana samadhi. Cultivating prana, you are vigorous in wisdom. Studying the prana dramas, you are vigorous in prana. There is no vigor to vigor. It in and of itself does not do anything. Though so not being attached to being vigorous is having real vigor. Attached to how you are vigorous in this and that. Claiming that your vigor is without bounds, that your vigor applies to all six parameters, then you are not truly vigorous. Truly understand the Buddha drama, and there is essentially nothing. There is something when you do not understand. Once you understand, there is nothing. You say, "I do not have anything now. I am not diligent either. Not being diligent is also nothing." This is different from really understanding the Buddha drama, and there is not even real diligence. Why? It is because you are not attached. If you do not understand the Buddha drama and continue to be attached to your diligence, then there is no diligence. Since you really do not understand the Buddha drama, you basically do not know what is diligence. Not to mention being diligent. This is why you do not understand the Buddha drama. If you really do understand, you still have to let it go. You still do not understand the Buddha drama if you do not let it go. This makes people break all attachments to marks, thus being, thus becoming attached to nothing. Attached, you do not understand the Buddha drama. This is vigor. The sound of dhyana paramita. Dhyana is also Sanskrit, which stands for the cultivation of contemplation or quiet deliberation. Dhyana includes the four dhyanas, the eight samadhis, and the nine sequential samadhis. There are also secular dhyana, transcendental dhyana, and the most superior form of transcendental dhyana. 
Secular DNA are what we ordinary people cultivate. This includes the four valid qualities of the mind and the four formless samadhis. We do not need to describe these states in detail. Just work hard in your meditation and you will naturally understand this state. What is transcendental dhyana? Transcendental dhyana includes the four dhyanas and the eight samadhis, the eight superior ways and the eight liberations. You are confused by these terms. This is like reading a menu. Say uh, something may look good, but before you put it in your mouth, you will never know the taste of it. Now you know why there are different dhyanas, secular dhyana, transcendental dhyana, the most superior form of transcendental dhyana, first commons dhyana, patriarchs dhyana, and others. As long as you are willing to work on your cultivation, you will get a taste of its flavor in the future. And the sound of prana paramita, prana in Sanskrit for wisdom. Wisdom is also divided into secular wisdom and transcendental wisdom. Secular wisdom is worldly knowledge and intelligence. What are worldly knowledge and intelligence? For instance, advances in science, advances in philosophy, and all types of information are worldly knowledge. A debater who can explain principles where there are no principles has worldly wisdom. Transcendental wisdom is about pursuing the Buddhist path diligently, in thought after thought, studying the Buddha Dharma continuously. Real cultivation of transcendental wisdom means contemplating the Buddha Dharma while sleeping, dreaming, suffering from sickness and pain. So is secular wisdom and transcendental wisdom one thing or two? Originally, they are one, but it depends on how you use it. Applying to the secular and that is secular wisdom. Apply it to transcendental Buddha drama and that is transcendental wisdom. Wisdom is not divided into two. Originally, you were investigating the world's problems and you knew everything in the world is suffering, emptiness, impermanence and no self. Now let us use this kind of wisdom to investigate Transcendental studies, which is transcendental wisdom. Secular wisdom and transcendental wisdom are not two. Most people enjoy a secular form of wisdom, but not transcendental wisdom. Some people enjoy transcendental wisdom, but no secular wisdom. How come? Some people are very intelligent, but keep doing muddled things, things they should avoid. Whereas the important things, the question of birth and death is left untouched and uninvestigated. Some people investigate transcendental questions but do not understand secular dramas. We must enter the world yet transcend the world, transcend the world and enter the world, travel freely between the secular and the transcendental. If you understand that entering the world is transcending the world, if you do not understand transcend, uh, transcending the world is enter, entering the world. The ancients told us something very useful. Intelligence results from anonymous good deeds. Anonymous good deeds lead us onto the path of intelligence. Try and play smart without believing in anonymous good deed. The smart and ends up being misled by their smarts. Why are we intelligent as human beings? It is because in life's past, we did many virtuous deeds. What are anonymous good deeds? Anonymous For instance, someone died and had no coffin. So I bought one for him and buried him. This was a good deed, but I do not tell anyone about it. In general, one will help to do good deeds without letting other people know about it. Those who did a lot of anonymous good deeds are intelligent in this lifetime. Also, if in the past, in past lives you read Buddhist sutras frequently, such as reading the Vana 
Vara Paratna Paramita Sutra several tens of thousands of times, you will be intelligent in this lifetime. Having studied a lot in the past, you will be intelligent in this lifetime too. So, intelligence is the result of anonymous good deeds. Intelligence in this lifetime comes from cultivation and virtuous deeds in life's past. Anonymous good deeds lead us onto the path of intelligence. You are intelligent because of your virtuous conduct. Virtuous conduct led you on to the path of intelligence. Try and play smart without believing in anonymous good deed. Having forgotten in this lifetime, you do not travel the path of doing good deeds. You do not believe in doing anonymous anonymous good deeds or good deeds in general. You keep using your intelligence to commit crime. The smart ends up being misled by their smarts. Their intelligence ends up hurting themselves. Why? If you were dumb, you would not do anything bad. Since you are smart, you know what other people do not know. You hurt somebody and the victim does not even realize that you are a bad person. This is called the smart ends up being misled by their wits. For example, Carl Ko is someone most intelligent, more than even ghosts and spirits, but he did inappropriate things, so he did some good things too. He ended up being misled by his own intelligence. Of course, he did have his accomplishments. After hearing this verse, people who would like to be intelligent, to be intelligent should work hard at doing good deeds, contributing to humanity and avoiding harming others. Let me add another supplement on the parameter of keeping the precepts. When the Buddha was in the world, two bishops wanted to go and see Shakyamuni Buddha. After traveling a long ways without encountering any water, the two bishops were extremely thirsty, so thirsty they were at the brink of death. One bishop saw a human skull with some water and said, Since we are so thirsty right now, we can drink the water in this skull. The other bishop said, No, there are insects on the water, so we should not drink it. But look at how thirsty we are. Drink this water and we will not die of thirst and we will see Shakyamuni Buddha then. If we die of thirst, then it would be impossible to see the Buddha. I would rather die from keeping the precepts and miss seeing the Buddha. I will follow the Buddha's teachings even if I have to die for it. The first bishop drank the water in the little like a skull while the other did not drink the water and died of thirst indeed. The bishop who drank the water went on ahead to see the Buddha. When he got there, he asked the Buddha. There were two of us who were extremely thirsty about halfway along the journey. We saw a human skull with water and I drank the water so that I did not have to die so that I may come to visit the Buddha. My fellow cultivator was willing to die of thirst than drink any water because of the insects in the water. He would violate the precepts if he drank it. I drank the water and did not die. He did not drink the water and died of thirst. I get to see the Buddha. Shakyamuni Buddha said, You thought he died of thirst? Since that Vishu kept the precepts, I made it so that he got to see me first. He is already here, listening to my drama talks. Also, keeping the precepts is extremely difficult. I understand his sincerity. Also, you get to see me. You did not uphold the precepts, so you are not so sincere. He has already become enlightened and certified to the fruition, but you still have to cultivate over time. This tells us how we must be sincere in doing the six parameters of precepts, patience, giving, vigor, dhyana, samadhi, and wisdom, as well as the mind that conducts. In sincere, we are casual and will not accord with the Buddha drama. We must do what is true, 
So, guard the mouth and gather in thoughts, make no bodily transgressions, never distress a sentient being, stay far removed from unsuccessful asceticism, practitioners like this save the world. This for land gather is something that monks and nuns should always remember, act according to this gather. It is extremely important to keep the precepts, do not be casual about it. Be a little bit casual and you miss the target. So, cultivation requires sincerity and down to earth steps. Do not float along, float along. Do not do it honestly. There was a sound of compassion. Kindness can bestow joy, while compassion can uproot suffering. All beings hear this voice of Shakyamuni Buddha and leave suffering and attain bliss, liberated from birth and death. The sound of joyous giving, joyously give kindness and compassion, joy and giving are the four Bali's qualities of the mind. We must be delighted when we give, do not regret it after we give, for that would not be delight. Shakyamuni Buddhas uttered this sound of joyous giving so that all beings heard it and wished it to give happily. The sound of liberation. Liberation is a type of true freedom, unrestrained and unbounded. From what are we liberated? We are liberated from the suffering and afflictions of birth and death in the six paths of transmigration. Once upon a time, a monk requested a prominent Sangha member to speak the Dharma. He asked, Senior monk, how can we become liberated? This prominent monk said, Who tied you up? The listening monk became enlightened instantaneously. No one tied me up, I tied myself up. We are naturally liberated if we do not tie ourselves up. What does it mean by tying ourselves up? Here is where we should think things over. We are not at ease because there are things we do not see through and cannot let go. Are at ease, we are liberated. If we can see through everything and let them go, then we are truly free. That is being unrestrained and unbounded, unhindered and unimpeded liberation that leave mixed up dream, thinking far behind. Really, let go and attain liberation. Refuse to let go and there will be no liberation. Shakyamuni Buddha spoke with this sound of liberation. So we should liberate ourselves too. Do not tie ourselves up and lock ourselves in jail forever. How come we bind ourselves and lock ourselves up? If you were not in jail, you would be liberated. Since you are not liberated, it is as if you are in jail. You are not free to go east when you want to. You are not free to go west when you want to. You are not free to go south when you want to. You are not free to go north when you want to. Freedom does not come from this stinking skin back, but this inherent nature. An inherent nature that enjoys freedom may live if one wants, die if one wants to at any time. One may die disease free, but simply sits there and dies. This is true freedom. At that point, birth and death is not up to fate, but up to me. I may become born if I want to. I may die if I want to. I may live until I am 100, 1000, 10,000. I may not want to become born. Then I can always stay at our original home. When I want to live in this house, I live in this house. When I do not want to live in this house, I can move at any time. There are two explanations as to why you might want to live in this house. Your consciousness, which is yin, is free. It may travel to Europe, to New York, Australia, or anywhere. You would know everything about that location, but you cannot take anything with you. You cannot buy something in New York and bring it back to San Francisco with you. 
Why? Consciousness is in the yin realm. It can see New York but cannot do anything there. The other is that you, your inherent Buddha nature is free. The Buddha nature is young and has great uses using the entire substance. Even when you are in San Francisco, you may reach your hand out and get something from New York. Is that amazing? Is that spiritual powers? This is a state of liberation without restraint or constraint, not impeded or obstructed. One chichilio cosm, for instance, can be as close as if it were in the same room. You can accomplish anything you want in the world. This is the young Buddha nature. If you are liberated and free, then you will experience this kind of state. People will, with such states do not easily reveal themselves. Do not try to make me buy some German product for you because I can do it with my spiritual powers. This is forbidden. When the Buddha was in the world, he told all of his disciples to, not to use their spiritual powers. You have to leave this world if you use your spiritual powers. Since most people do not have spiritual powers, they will be shocked by your spiritual powers. In short, when you can do things as you wish, that is in the yang realm. When there are things you cannot do, that is in the yin realm and a function of the consciousness. Every one of us must be clear about this. The sound of no our flows. What are no our flows? It is no ignorance. Without ignorance, there is no our flow. With even just a bit of ignorance, you cannot be free of our flow. Ignorance is the root of afflictions. Ignorance leads to numerous afflictions. The absence of ignorance spells zero afflictions. How come you are greedy? It is because of your ignorance. How come you are hateful? It is because of your ignorance. How come you are deluded? It is because of your ignorance. Ignorance is the root of afflictions. How come you have desire, lust? It is also because of your ignorance. Since you are unclear at the start, you create all kinds of karma. Were you to have the sound of no outflows, you will be free from ignorance. Therefore, Shakyamuni Buddha emitted all kinds of sounds to make all beings become enlightened through sound. The substance of true teachings here comes from purification through hearing sound, the fundamental substance of Buddhism in the Saha world is in sound. We do the Buddha's work with sounds, hence there are all kinds of sounds on proclaiming, praising and explaining. Sutra, the sound of wisdom, the sound of great wisdom, the sound of the lion's roar, the sound of great lion's roar the sound of thunder clouds and the sound of great thunder clouds. After he had uttered indescribably many sounds. Commentary, the sound of wisdom. What is wisdom? Wisdom changes delusion. There is no delusion with the presence of wisdom. There is no wisdom with the presence of delusion. These two do not exist simultaneously. If me, let me tell you something else that is easier to understand. Wisdom is delusion. Delusion is wisdom. Some say, I must wise because I am deluded now. Let me use this delusion to be as deluded as I possibly can. If you can be, uh, be as deluded as possible, you have real wisdom. Some say, Drama Master, I do not believe this idea of yours, wisdom is delusion, delusion is wisdom. What I see is that deluded individuals always do muddle things, while wise people do things with a clear understanding. Not bad. What you say is very much correct and what I say is very much incorrect. Why? It is because delusion can turn into wisdom, so I say delusion is wisdom. Since wisdom can also turn into delusion, I say wisdom is also delusion. A few days ago when I talked about intelligence results from anonymous good deeds, 
I made this principle very clear already but I am bringing it out again how come you would not be deluded if you were wise it is because the wise people have real wisdom and have reached the real liberation how is that wise, uh, wise individuals do not do muddled things if you are deluded you always do muddled things and avoid intelligent things deluded individuals are not free and uh, are pervasive wise individuals are not passive they have real will and wisdom regardless of what comes they recognize the situation and proceed if it is a good thing to do and do not proceed if it is not a good thing to do they have true judgment and true ability to select the right dramas deluded individuals do not they will do them even so they know something is clear wrong is clearly wrong for instance we know that gambling is something bad but they think that they may have a chance to in a million at winning and getting rich this one thought of ignorance and greed led them to wish for Christ for, for riches they end up losing all their assets they still do not wake up after they lose all that. They think I'm just one step away from winning and getting rich. For example, a dollar something buys you eight numbers on a lotto ticket. If you select the matching set, you will win millions. But you lost by one number, so you buy again. Thinking will win for sure. Is that delusion? If gamblers, if gamblers can all win, then casinos will not make any profit. Some people smoke opium. Some people say opium is a drug that is harmful, but deluded individuals will try it. They try it once and they do not feel that they got anything out of it. So they try it once more, twice more, three times, four times, again and again. Once they experiment with it, they become addicts. They cannot do without it by then. Is that delusion? Someone perfectly sound is dictated by opium to drip snot and tears. One is comfortable all over, so one has to get more money to buy this stuff to support oneself. Delusion made not made you not free. How come you are not free? Opium smokers believe smoking opium is a form of freedom and enjoy it. But is it freedom when you are not smoke, uh, smoking it and crave it? Everything else is the same. Doing something that you should not do is delusion and not wisdom. You will not be messed up if you are wise. You ought not do what you should not do. The sound of great wisdom, extremely wise individuals see straight to the bottom of things and do not discover problems only when things go wrong. They can forecast whether they can do something or not. Perhaps the result will be unfavorable if they act with great knowledge and great wisdom. They are thought doing muddled things. What is great knowledge and great wisdom? Investigating. The Buddha drama is great knowledge and great wisdom. Only people who investigate the Buddha drama can be truly free, which is great wisdom. The sound of the lion's roar. Lions are the king of the jungle. His roar frightens all the animals so that they cannot stand straight and are not prepared to run. Even ferocious wild beasts such as tigers and wolves are at a loss due to fear. All the best hear his roars and their heads split open. They are frightened dumb. The sound of the great lion's roar. An average lion's roar is severe enough. Now imagine how the sound of the great lion's roar may be heard far and wide. The sound of thunder clouds sounds like thunderbolts in the clouds. 
and the sounds of great thunder clouds. This sound of thunder is even greater than the average sound, meaning that the Buddha Dharma is like a great cloud in the sky that universally shines upon the great earth, providing shade everywhere. When thunder burns, it is heard everywhere around the world, symbolizing how the Buddha Dharma reaches the all beings pervasively. Beings pervasively. Rain will pour with clouds and thunder. Rain symbolizes the Buddha Dharma universally nourishing all beings' faculties so that everyone is nurtured by the rain of Dharma. The Dharma rain falls and bigger trees will receive more Dharma rain, while smaller trees will receive less Dharma rain. Flowers and grass will also receive the amount of rain they need. The Buddha Dharma is the same way. Living beings receive according to their needs. Every kind of Buddha Dharma makes every type of being nourished so that they extend their wisdom life in the Dharma body and uncover great wisdom. After he, Shakyamuni Buddha, has uttered indescribably many, a number so large that cannot be said, sounds such as those, sounds such as those described Sutra carries millions of gods, dragons, ghosts, and spirits from the Saha world and other worlds also gathered in the palace of the Chayashimsha heaven. They came from the heaven of the four kings, the Chayashimsha heaven, the Suyama heaven, the Tushita heaven, the blissful transformations heaven, and the heaven of comfort gained through others' transformations. They came from the heaven of the Mantitus of Brahma, the heaven of the ministers of Brahma, the heaven of the great Brahma Lord, the heaven of blessed light, the heaven of limitless light, the heaven of light sound, the heaven of blessed purity, the heaven of limitless purity, and the heaven of universal purity. Commentary. Earlier, the Buddha emitted limitless clouds of great light and proclaimed various kinds of dharma sound so that living beings will turn away from confusion and return to enlightenment, forsake deviance and return to the proper. Now there is the Saha world. Saha is a Sanskrit word for bearing patience or extreme suffering, which is in contrast to the western land of ultimate bliss. The world in the west is extremely blissful, while the sad world of ours is extremely painful. This is also called bearing patience, because living beings can bear to be patient with this kind of pain. Countless millions of gods, dragons, ghosts, and spirits from the Saha world and lands in other worlds, as opposed to the Saha world, also gathered in the palace of the Chayashimsha heaven, the palace of the heaven of 33. They came from the heaven of the four kings. The four kings are also called the four kings who protect the world. The heaven of the four kings is situated in the center of Mount Sumeru. The Chajashrimsha heaven is at the top of Mount Sumeru. Each of the four directions of this heaven has a heavenly king. The heavenly king in the east is the heavenly king who upholds nations. The heavenly king in the south is the heavenly king of growth. The heavenly king in the west is the heavenly king huge eyes, while the heavenly king in the north is the heavenly king of erudition. Beings in the heavens where the four great heavenly kings reside enjoy a 500-year life, of which one day and one night is equivalent to 50 years on earth. The heaven of the four kings is closest to us. They watch over to see who are doing good or evil in the human realm. This is the heaven of the four kings. The Chajashrimsha heaven, we have already explained earlier that the Sanskrit word 
Chayashim Shah means the heaven of the 33. The Lord of the heaven of the 33 is also called capable of being God. The Suryama heaven is a place where neither sunlight or moonlight reaches. So, is it dark place? No, all the beings in the Suryama heaven radiate a light from their bodies, so they do not need sunlight or moonlight. How can this heaven is called the Suryama heaven? Suryama is again a Sanskrit word that means fine divisions of time. Because this heaven is so high that neither sunlight nor moonlight can reach it. So they tell time by the blooming and closing the lotuses. It is day when the lotuses bloom and night when the lotuses shut. The length of life in the Tushita heaven is 1000 years, of which one day and night is equivalent to 100 years on earth. The length of life in the Suryama heaven is 1500 years, and the height, the height of beings there is one and a half miles. Heavenly beings in the Chayashimsha heaven are one mile in height, and beings in the heaven of the four kings a half a mile in height. The length of life increases by 500 years and the height of beings increases by half a mile for every layer of heaven. The higher the heaven, the longer the life of beings is there. The Tushita heaven. This is also Sanskrit and means contentment. This is the heaven of contentment. There are inner and outer courts in the Tushita heaven. The inner court is where my Chaya Bodhisattva now lives. The outer court is where most heavenly beings dwell. The three forms of disasters cannot reach the inner court of the Tushita heaven, but the outer court of the Tushita heaven will be destroyed by the three forms of disasters. The blissful transformations heaven enjoys a happiness that comes for the transformationally and the heaven of comfort gained through others transformations joy in this heaven comes forth transformationally from other heavenly beings they transfer the joys of other heavens to this heaven with their spiritual powers heavenly demons not real spirits or gods live in the heaven of comfort gained through others transformations they are both for other six desire heavens, the heaven of the four kings, the Trajashimsha heaven, the Suryama heaven, the Tushita heaven, the blissful transformations heaven, the heaven of comfort gained through others transformations. Why are these heavens the six heavens of desire? Heavenly beings still have lust and impure thoughts. When I was lecturing on the Suragama Sutra during the summer, I talked about these six desire heavens already. I believe none of you enjoyed it, so I, you returned it to me, so I am giving it to you again now. The beings of the six desire heavens have lost beings in the heaven of four kings and Chajashimsha heaven engage in lust similar to human beings. How come? They all have a physical form. The beings in the heaven of four kings and the Chajashimsha heaven also marry. They are couples and father and son relationships. What size is a newborn in a heaven of four kings? The same size as a five-year-old in the human realm. And in the Chajashimsha heaven, the same size as a seven-year-old in the human realm. A newborn in the Suryama heaven is the same size as a 10 year old in the human realm. Newborns in this size come out and sit on the knees of heavenly beings. Once they are born, they wait to eat a kind of natural celestial dew that forms spontaneously. After they are done, they become the size of heavenly beings, which is a half a mile in height and 500 years in the length of life. This is the heaven of four kings. 
as it is said, the heaven of four kings and the charge of shrimp shall have an engaged in desire through embrace. Sexual activity in the heaven of the four kings and the charge of shrimp shall heaven is the same as the human realm. Suryama through hand holding and Tushita through smiling. Sexual activity between men and women in the Suryama heaven occurs simply by holding hands. The same way Westerners greet each other by shaking hands, for example. This gesture is enough to count as sexual activity between couples in the heavens. This is the Suryama heaven. And the Tushita heaven, men and women engage in sexual activity just by smiling at each other. Heavenly beings of that place do not smile usually. Why? Their emotional desire is very light, nearly none. In the six desire heavens, the higher the heaven, the lighter the desire. How come we people have to eliminate desire and cut off love as we cultivate? Why do we want to be free of thoughts of desire? It is because the more thoughts of desire we have, the more delusions we have. The fewer thoughts of desire, the more wisdom we develop. Thoughts of desire belong to the evil world of five turbidities. What are turbidities? Thoughts of desire are most turbid and unclean. Desire in the heaven of the four kings is the same as emotions and desires in the human realm. Compare the Chajachimsha heaven to the heaven of the four kings. It is still lighter and lost only requires shaking hands. Suryama so through hand holding and Tushita through smiling. I have already talked about this during the summer. Let me explain it again. If I do not, you all forget. The heaven of four kings and the Chajachimsha heaven engage in desire through embrace. Suryama so through hand holding and Tushita through smiling bliss from transformations through long stares and bliss from others through glances these are the joys of desire in the six heavens they just smile at each other in the two streets of heaven we people think smiling is a good thing smiling is not good there is desire in smiles when you get to the heaven of suyama people wish to cultivate and work hard very few people shake hands Shaking hands is equivalent to sexual activity between couples. In the Tushita heaven, this consists of smiling at each other. In the heaven of bliss from transformations, this consists of long stares between men and women. Long, maybe one minute or five minutes, to just look at each other for as long as one or two minutes. In the bliss of other transformations, a quick glance will do it. No need to look long. This is the way sexual behavior between men and women work in the six desire heavens. The higher the heaven, the lighter the desire is. If your desires were heavy, you would not become born in the heavens either. When you are in those heavens, you do not have much desire. This is the joy from desire in the six desire heavens. There are three heavens in the first dhyana, three heavens in the second dhyana, the three heavens in the third dhyana, the three heavens of the first dhyana are the heaven of the Brahma Mantitus, the heaven of the ministers of Brahma, and the great Brahma heaven. They came from the heaven of the Mantitus of Brahma. What is Brahma? Brahma means purity. Thoughts of design in the first dhyana heaven are even lighter, so it is said to be Brahma. The Brahma Mantitus heaven refers to how all the heavenly beings living there are all pure. These are the heavenly citizens of the Brahma heaven. The heaven of the ministers of Brahma. These are ministers in the heavens who came to their positions because of purity. They assist the great Brahma Lord. The heaven of the great Brahma Lord is where the great Brahma Lord lives. He is someone who works very hard at his cultivation, but he only knows to cultivate heavenly blessings and has not become enlightened or certified to the fruition. After cultivating to a point, he became born in the heavens and became a great Brahma Lord. 
the great Brahma Lord has the multitudes of Brahmas and the Brahma ministers supporting him. These are the three heavens of the first dhyana. The three heavens of the first dhyana called the ground of bliss of the bliss from living production. Leaving the cycle of birth and death behind, it is quite a delightful place. When we work enough to reach the state of the first dhyana, we can see the great Brahma Lord, the ministers and pupils of the great Brahma heaven. When you reach the first dhyana heavens, your palm stops as you meditate. For most of us, we are dead if our palms quit. You are in this state where your pulse and blood flow stop because your inherent nature has reached the first dhyana heavens. This is not because you are dead, but because you entered the first dhyana samadhi. This may occur for an hour, two hours, three hours, five hours, or a day, two days, three days, five days, ten days, twenty days. Although your pulse does not move, the body does not deteriorate. For most of us average people after death, our cause begin to stink after seven days. If you can work hard so that you reach this state, then your body will not deteriorate no matter how long you are in Samadhi. This is about the three heavens of the first dhyana. The three heavens of the second dhyana are the heaven of lesser light, the heaven of limitless light, the heaven of light sound, how can we become reborn in the heavens? Eliminate desire and end love. So there is no lust. With lust, we cannot become reborn in the heavens. Each heaven is one level higher than the one below. One heaven is higher than another is because it has less desire. The heavens of the second dhyana include the heaven of lesser light. Heavenly beings here have asuras that are brighter than the lights in the Suyama heaven. At the same time, among the three heavens of the second dhyana, the lights of the heaven of lesser light is comparatively weaker than the other two heavens. How come there is a light? It is because they kept the precepts purely or focused on keeping the precepts in particular when they were pupil. Those in the heaven of the multitudes of Brahma and the heaven of the ministers of Brahma also observe the precepts but not so well. They are pure but they do not emit light. Those in the heaven of lesser light not only keep the precepts well but emit a light. This is why they became born in this kind of heaven. The heaven of limitless light. The one earlier was lesser light. This light is limitless and boundless. Above the heaven of limitless light is the heaven of light sound. How do heavenly beings in the heaven of light sound speak? They speak with light. This is the science of optics that is found even in televisions. In that lines communicate. Heavenly beings in the heaven of light sound do not speak. It is not that they do not communicate. They do so with words. Some drama masters criticize that the heavenly beings in the heaven of light sound do not speak because they have no language or words. That is why they use light to represent language or words. No, if they do not know how to speak, would they not be mute? How is that better than those who speak? Since those in the heaven of light sound speak using light, it is not useful to be mute there. I say they have language, but they do not need language with words. They use light the way we use optics to write. Something along the lines of optics, it must be that it is not that they just speak with light and there is no language. No, to explain the Buddha Dharma, compare the Buddha Dharma with the secular Dharma so that it is clear. Some other Dharma masters say that there is no language or words in that heaven. Calling heavenly beings in the heavenly light sound muse really shows how these Dharma masters do not understand. This is the second dhyana heavens. People who meditate and reach the samadhi of the second dhyana heaven, the ground of joy from samadhi, experience a state. What is that? Their breaths stop. 
This is the state of the second Jnana heaven. Having reached the state of the second Jnana heaven does not mean your skills are most terrific. People who work hard ask yourselves now, have you reached this level? Did your plan stop? Did your breathing quit during meditation? No. If not, then work hard. If you do not, then you cannot become liberated from birth and death. There is no more birth and death at the first Jnana heaven or the second Jnana heaven. Hard work does not mean experiencing some minor states such as a vision of Dharma protecting Bodhisattvas or some others. Even if we see light during meditation, the state is still insignificant. Do not be attached. Perhaps during meditation, you begin to swing back and forth without wishing to. You do not want to move, but you do. When you do move, you cannot make it stop even if you want to. These are the six forms of earthquake at work, signs of the six senses. This is not real skill, so keep moving ahead and strive hard. Until you reach the stage of the first dhyana and the second dhyana, you cannot be lazy. Lazy and you cannot end birth and death, which makes your future quite dangerous. It is not easy to become a monk. Lazy for one day, you dig into their house. If you do not want to go to their house, then work a bit harder. You say, I feel uncomfortable as soon as I start to apply myself. It is really uncomfortable. The houses are even more uncomfortable. If you want comfort now, you will be uncomfortable in the future. If you do some hard work now, you will be comfortable in the future. Count this up and who knows how long you will be in the house. There is no leaving the unintermittent house where you suffer there all day. Why does someone end up suffering there? It is because one was very lazy as a novice. One did not work hard and did not study the Buddha drama, so he suffers. One can hardly be at ease in the house. The heaven of lesser purity the heaven of limitless purity and the heaven of universal purity. These are the heavens of the third dhyana. The first dhyana is called the ground of bliss from living production. The second dhyana is called the ground of bliss from samadhi. And the third dhyana is called the ground of wonderful bliss from living joy. In the first dhyana, the pulse stops. In the second dhyana, the breath stops and in the third dhyana, thus stop. Although the heaven of the Mantitos of Brahma, the heaven of the ministers of Brahma and the great Brahma heaven of the first dhyana heavens are, actually, are already pure, but there is no light yet, not only no light, but the lights are very dim. Of the second dhyana heavens, there, are, there is light that is more pure than pure. There is another crude analogy that compares this to the floor, the heaven of the Mantitos of Brahma, the heaven of the ministers of Brahma, and the great Brahma heaven are like the floor that has swept, has been swept once, but not yet waxed. Without wax, there is no shine. We are talking in worldly terms about how there is no wax or shade or shine when you wash the floor then it will shine this is the heaven of blessed light the heaven of limitless light and the heaven of light south these are the second dhyana heavens the third dhyana heavens heavens of blessed light is like western floor but it needs to be wiped to really shine there may be some dirt or broom hair that has not been cleaned up and picked up so there is light but it is not clean yet the third dhyana heavens are clean they are the heaven of lesser purity the heaven of limitless purity and the heaven of universal purity the floor is waxed and wiped until it shines with a bright sheen and there is no dust at all if you do not understand the states in the heavens then you will if you think about this metaphor of a flaw,
pus moves blood, then our pus stops. That is purity. If breath stops, then there is light. On the third dia na heavens, thoughts stop completely. Also, the pus stops at the first dia na heavens, but there is still this thought. At the second dia na heavens, this thought did not end either. At the third dia na heavens, this thought stopped. He will not let one. There are ninety births and deaths in one shana for one individual. In each birth and death, there are nine hundred thoughts. We have so many thoughts in such a short time. At the third dia na, thoughts stop. There is no first thought or a later thought. Here, thoughts stop. This is a third dia na state. Not only does pain stop, we breathe stop. Even thoughts stop. Sit for a month, and you do not know whether it has been a month. Sit for a year, and you do not know that it has been a year. There is no sense of time or space. Sit and enter samadhi here does not mean death. You can come back if you want to. Your thought stops, but as you start thinking, how come I am here meditating? This thought is born, so you come back. The state of the third dia na has no thought at all, which is purity. Thoughts are like dust, leaving you impure. Why you are still breathing? There is no light to speak of. Breath stops and your light manifests. You will feel pure and there is light when your pain stops. There is real purity to speak of when thoughts stop. These are the heaven of less purity, the heaven of limitless purity, and the heaven of universal purity. These are the third dhyana heavens. The third dhyana is called the ground of wonderful bliss from living joy. Leave joy behind. We think it is good to be joyous, but this should be left behind so that we are not even attached to joy. This is the wonderful function from the ground, a wonderful bliss from living joy. Sutra. They came from the birth of blessings heaven, the love of blessings heaven, the abundant fruit heaven, the no thought heaven, the no affliction heaven, the no heat heaven, the good views heaven, the good manifestation heaven, the ultimate form heaven, the. Maheshvara heaven, and so forth, up to the heaven of the station of neither thought nor non-thought. All those groups of gods, dragons, ghosts, and spirits came and gathered together. Commentary: They came from the birth of blessings heaven. What is the birth of blessings heaven? Beings in this layer of heaven have entered the case, the causes that led to suffering and abide in extreme bliss. He does not experience any suffering, and is not attached to bliss. What does it mean by he does not experience any suffering, and is not attached to bliss? Also, Pan stops in the first dia na heavens. He still experiences suffering and afflictions. At the second and third dia na heavens, suffering and afflictions have not yet ended. At the fourth dia na heavens. The birth of blessings heaven. He does not experience any suffering. The seeds for suffering are no more. Although suffering disappears, is he happy? He is not attached to happiness, so he is not attached to bliss. He has left behind the suffering and afflictions of the first dhyana and the sadness of the second dhyana heavens. The beings in the second dhyana heavens have not yet ended their sadness. When they reach the fourth dhyana, the sadness of the second dhyana is gone. What are the causes of the suffering? They are desire. Desire is the cause of suffering. What are desires? Desires are the causes of suffering. Without desire, there is no suffering. Without lust, there would be no cause of for suffering. Beings in the fourth dhyana heavens do not have lust. All the desires have disappeared. They vanish. The gross marks all disappear. There is a kind of pure blessings. 
God's blessings and virtue. This is a quality of the birth of heaven's being, the first of the fourth Diana heavens. Most people only know about the heavens, but how many? In the Buddhist sutras, they are all of the six desire heavens, the three heavens of the first Diana, the three heavens of the second Diana, and the three heavens of the third Diana. And in the fourth Diana, there are nine heavens. The birth of blessings heaven is the first layer of the fourth Diana heavens because its pure blessings manifested. The love of blessings heaven. The blessings of this heaven are lovely. In this heaven, renunciation is perfected to a point that it is interpenetrating and unhindered. They can renounce what they could not renounce before, and they renounce what they can renounce, of course. They let go of what they could not let go before, and let go of what they could already let go all the more. This is the perfection of renunciation, pure in victorious understandings. He enjoys a blessing that cannot be obscured. It supersets the bounds of heaven and earth. He gets his wishes to come true, and he can do as he pleases. At this time, both suffering and blessing are left behind. There is no suffering or bliss. Although suffering and bliss have left, they do not obstruct the existence of the form realm. They may enjoy the realm of existence, but they accumulate merit and uh, merit for another pursuit to another goal. What is that? He hopes for the states enjoyed in two in the two heavens above of the love. Above the love of blessings heaven, the abundant fruit heaven, and the no thought heaven. However, the abundant fruit heaven is one of the four Diana heavens, while the no thought heaven is where he takes leave. Before reaching the abundant fruit heaven, one may go to the abundant fruit heaven or the no thought heaven. No thought heaven is a state of heretics, so it is easy to become diverted down the wrong path here. One can become born in the heavens and walk into the heretics heaven still. What is the abundant fruit heaven? The abundant fruit heaven is the fruition for ordinary beings. All the six desire heavens are fruitions that ordinary people reach. The finest state that ordinary people can reach is the abundant fruit heaven. The abundant fruit heaven leaves the defilement of the heavens below. They enjoy boundless and limitless joy in the, the abundant fruit heaven. Their spiritual powers also have endless fruitions. So it is not easy to become reborn in the abundant fruit heaven. The wonderful accord is the vast amount of wonderful accord more than that of the love of blessings heaven. They can cultivate to reach this fruit as they so wish. This is, this is the abundant fruit heaven. The no thought heaven. At the no thought heaven, their thoughts cease but not forever, just 500 ends. His life is 500 ends, so he goes through life without develop one thought. But in 500 ends, he develops one thought. During those 500 ends, for 499 ends, he has no thought. But there is one end where his thoughts is during the first half. But his thoughts occur in the last half of this end. This is no thought where every time in his entire life is spent thinking. This heaven is totally occupied by heretics. Heretics reach this layer of heaven and think this is the ultimate heaven. He thinks that he will reach Nirvana here. He stays here to cultivate, but he will still fall. This is a place where heretics abide. The No Affliction Heaven Heavenly beings have no afflictions from views or thoughts. What are afflictions from views and thoughts? Views come from greed. Thoughts are discriminating opinions due to ideas not understood or not clear about. 
without the delusions of view and, and delusions of thought, they do not have that type of heated afflictions. There is no suffering or bliss in a state where both suffering and bliss have ended. They have no wish to fight, so their afflictions disappear. Calm and refreshed is the no efficient heaven. The no heat heaven, heat refers to heated afflictions. That heaven is very calm, devoid of heated afflictions. The good views heaven, what does this mean? Those in this heaven enjoy views that are vast and far. They can see a long ways away. The good manifestation heaven, this is a very subtle and wonderful transformation that manifests all the joyful states. The ultimate form heaven, the heavens described above, are all heavens of the form realm. This is the ultimate form heaven. The Maheshvara heaven, Maheshvara is Sanskrit that means great is. The Maheshvara god has eight arms, three heads and rides on the great white orbs. He thinks he is very much at ease. The Maheshvara heaven is also called the great heaven of ease. Among these ten heavens described above, no thought heaven is where he takes and heavenly demons live, whereas the other nine heavens are all fourth dhyana heavens. The fourth dhyana is also called the ground of purity from renouncing thoughts. Earlier we said that pound stops in the first dhyana, breath stops in the second dhyana, thought stop in the third dhyana. And the fourth dhyana, thoughts are renounced. The ground of purity from renouncing thoughts abandons thoughts. And so forth, observe the heaven of the station of neither thought nor non thought. The heaven of the station of neither thought nor non thought includes the heaven of the state of Bali's emptiness, the heaven of station of Bali's consciousness, the heaven of the station of nothing whatsoever and the heaven of the station of neither thought nor non-thought. Since even consciousness is gone, it is called no non-thought. No thought is not nothing. There is still some thought, not necessarily no thought whatsoever. This is the heaven of the station of neither thought nor non-thought. All those groups of many gods, many dragons, many ghosts and spirits came and gathered together in the palace of the Chigashimsha heaven. Sutra. Moreover, sea spirits, river spirits, stream spirits, tree spirits, mountain spirits, earth spirits, brook and marsh spirits, sprout and seedling spirits, day, night and space spirits, heaven spirits, food and drink spirits, grass and wood spirits, and other such spirits from the Saha and other ones came and gathered together. Commentary We talked about all those many heavens, ghosts and spirits, gods and dragons and others, but we are still not done. Moreover, sea spirits, river spirits, stream spirits, these are all the places with water. In the Buddha's longer Agama Sutra, it talks about where oceans, rivers, and lakes come from. The sun releases heat. As heat boils, there is a perspiration forming streams, rivers, lakes, and oceans. Not only do people sweat, but earth sweats, trees sweat, and all beings sweat. Under the blaze of the sun, things get hot, then perspire. No matter where the sun shines, it releases heat that is a blaze. Too much perspiration in the world creates lots of water that turn into streams and rivers. Water pervades all places throughout space and the dormarium. There is water everywhere. For example, the Sura Gama Sutra describes how dew water comes to a crystal platter held toward the sky on the full moon night. This proves that water exists everywhere. Although it is everywhere, we do not see it sometimes because there is the inherent nature of water, but no water in physical form. For instance, one quality of water is wetness, and most places are extremely wet, which proves that water exists everywhere. 
Fire also exists everywhere. The nature of fire and water work together rather than in conflict. How come there is no tangible water everywhere? The universe and water are connected, but the four heavenly kings have a pearl for avoiding water. Without this pearl, water would drown out from this world. Which is why water is not everywhere. This idea is very wonderful when explained. What are oceans? Oceans are dark because look like submerged in the ocean and you cannot see anything. You cannot see anything in the huge ocean. You do not know how deep, how wide or how large it is. This is the ocean that means big obscure. There are many spirits in the ocean, one of whom is the Dragon King. Among the other sea spirits, there is also one called Hai Ru and one called Yang He. Hai Ru, the sea spirit, is a type of beast and not a type of insect. It has 18 tails, it legs, it has and has a human face. This is the highest ranking spirit in the sea. There are many other spirits. If you see any of these while meditating, do not be afraid. Sea spirits came to make offerings to you. Do not be frightened by its grotesque appearance. How do you explain river? What is the difference between river and ocean? Rivers are larger than streams, oceans are bigger than rivers. Rivers are extremely wide but not very deep. Streams are not as wide as rivers. Oceans are the largest, being the lot of the myriad waterways. All the rivers, streams and lakes funnel into the ocean. It can accept all the waterways, no matter how many streams are different. They have to expand to other areas. Oceans do not flow toward other areas. The Chinese character for streams means impartiality or imperial tribute. All the goods produced along the Yangtze River, the Huai He River, the Yellow River, and the Han Shui River are sent in as tributes to the emperor. There is another interpretation for the Chinese character river too, which is little known. It means the palms of the hand. When the river is calm and has no waves, it is like the palm of a hand even like a mirror. The water spirits, stream spirits, and ocean spirits are all spirits in the water. There are also tree spirits and mountain spirits. The Chinese character trees may be explained as production of birth because things grow in the mountains. It can be the word in vain in that it shoots the seeds of the Maria things without hitting the target. Earth spirits. Earth is explained as the bottom because it can grow all things and carry all things, so it is at the very bottom. Brook and marsh spirits. The Chinese character for brooks also means penetrate in that brooks go through soil to other places originally without water. Marshes are also places with water. Sprout and seedling spirits. What are sprouts? Vegetation that grows to a certain height is called sprouts. Seedlings are seeds where when they being planted into the ground as a part of the harvest. They are pits. Day spirit, a spirit in charge of the day. Night spirit, a spirit in charge of the night. The divide between day and night is midnight. After midnight, it is day. After noon, night begins. On the race, not officially the sun at midnight, young energy has developed already. People usually experience lust from 3 a.m. to 5 a.m. because the young energy emerges. Without lust, there is wisdom. Go down one direction, it turns into wisdom. Go down another direction, it turns into lust. This is similar to the fog of the road, so the abundant fruit heaven and the no thought heaven. Maintain proper thoughts, then 
you go down the direction that is your wisdom. Go down the other direction and your desire is helped. Afternoon is when yin begins. Lust de devel develops at night too. Instead of moving down the path of lust, you will be moving down the path of wisdom. There is also a fog in the road leading either to yin or yang. It is up to you on how you will travel. And space spirit. Who are space spirits? Space spirits refer to Shunyata in Ananda's verse before the Suragama Mantra. Even could the nature of Shunyata melt away, my vara like supreme resolve would still remain unmoved. Do not just let what you hear go by thinking you are not greedy because you are not even greedy for the drama. Not being greedy for the Buddha drama, you better not greedy for worldly drama either. If you are not greedy for the Buddha drama but are greedy for worldly drama and sit around counting your money all day, then it is a problem too. Heaven spirits, food and drink spirits, their spirits to food too. Spirits supervise people's food intakes, even if it is just one mouthful of water, one fruit or one food item for the day if you believe it it exists if you do not believe it it still exists but you just don't know about it it is a stupid idea to say that it does not exist unless i believe it whether you believe there is such a spirit it exists there there was a duan chong yuan in Beijing. most people called him master duan he met someone who was in charge of the amount of food, water, alcohol, sugar everyone takes in a day. It is fixed. How did he supervise all this? He slept every day. His father was a commander or some type of officer of that sort with 400 or 500 people under him. This son was 20 or 30 years old but did not work and slept all day. The father was very upset thinking I am 50 or 60 and I have to work to take care of you you are 20 or 30 but you don't do not bother to do any work at all what else are you to the world he could not help but scold his son his son said you are an officer in the human realm but I am an officer in the the underworld what kind of an officer are you in the underworld I allot the amount of food and drinks each person takes every day. His father said, What nonsense are you saying? People's food intake has to be allotted. That does not make sense. Tell me what I am going to eat tomorrow. Assign something to me. Please wait. Let me tell you after I sleep a while. I do not know right now. His father was so angry. How ridiculous. You assign my food. When his son woke up, his son told him, You will not have any rice to eat tomorrow. The father howled with laughter. The high-ranking officer like me has no food to eat. Then what will I eat? His son said, Tomorrow you will only get to eat one rotten egg and half a bowl of spoiled congee. That is your food for tomorrow. As rich and powerful as I am, how can I end up eating only rotten and spoiled foods? Early the next morning, he immediately began butchering chickens and ducks, preparing fish and meat, making a bunch of excellent dishes. When he was about to eat, his superior sent an order, wanting him somewhere immediately to suppress some bandits. He could not delay for one second leaving all the cooked food, not having touched any of it at all. He rushed off to beat the bandits. This battle was a total blow and chaos. He was attacking the bandits and the bandits was attacking him too. It was very lively. After all that trouble, they traced the bandits away. They do not have food yet, so when they finally found a family, it must be it must have been one of the poorest because they said they had nothing to eat. They searched 
for a long while, there was no rice, no noodles, no vegetables. They only had a rotten egg and half a bowl of spoiled country prepared for their pregnant woman of the house. They were willing to give up the food for the commander who wanted to eat now. The commander was so hungry and ate what he got immediately. Since his subordinates did not want any fine foods, they got to eat before the battle, so the commander was the only one who did not eat. After he ate that rotten egg and half a bowl of congee, he remembered what his son told him yesterday. It was true that these were the exact things that he ate today. From then on, he knew that his son was an officer in the underworld. So the father let his son be. This is about a food spirit, grass, and wood spirits. There are spirits to grass, spirits to woods, and spirits to trees. Trees stand erect. The largest tree in southern Jambu Vipa is its tree king. When trees are big, they become villages for ghosts and spirits. Ghosts and spirits depend on these trees because they either suffer without these trees as dwellings or enjoy themselves living in these trees. Last trees are called villages for ghosts and spirits. During the time of Kalko, the three kingdoms, everyone referred to a large tree as a tree spirit. Kalko did not believe the pupil and ordered the tree chopped down. Thereafter, he experienced headaches all the time. Later, they requested Kwa Tua to treat him and the diagnosis was that he offended a tree spirit. For divisions, Vinaya proscribes bishops from chopping down any large tree because there are ghosts and spirits living in them. For example, there was a comfort tree at Nan Kwa Monastery that requested to receive the precepts from Elder Master Su Yun. Elder Chin Shan of Nan Yu also had a tree that bore white fruits requested precepts from him. There are many incredible examples of tree spirits requesting to receive the precepts. I told you earlier that whether you believe in the spirits or not, they exist. It does not mean the spirits do not exist because you do not believe they exist. Most people will say what exists for them is what they believe and what they do not believe does not exist for them. With these things though, they exist whether you believe it or not. For instance, there are gold mines in the ground whether you know it or not, believe it or not. You believe that they are spirits because you know where there's they you do not believe there are these spirits because you do not know it is not because these spirits do not exist but that you essentially do not have the knowledge and wisdom to know we do not simply follow everyone else's mistaken understandings and other such spirits many others in addition so the ones mentioned here from the Saha and other ones came and gathered together at the Jiyashim Shah heaven to listen to the Buddha speak the Dharma. There are many natural and man-made disasters occurring in San Francisco now. Most recently, a typhoon killed more than 90 people in the disaster area. This kind of disaster occurs because living beings evil karma repent. Someone said around May of last year that seismologists predicted earthquakes, but I wrote a guarantee that as long as I am in San Francisco, there will be no earthquakes, but I will not bother if I am somewhere else outside of San Francisco. I do not like earthquakes. I do not want people around me to fall over into the ocean. Why? I do not want to see the Dragon King. I do not want to befriend the sea spirit with the eight heads, eight legs, and eighteen tails. Out of the eight heads, four are of male features and four are of female features. One body with eight heads of four couples is very strange. 
It does things strangely too. It is very special. I don't want to interact with it or let people who stay with me see it. I am not being selfish, but because nothing good will be accomplished by visiting it. Someone told me again this year that there will be earthquakes in March or April. Will I be another insurance com company that offers guarantees this year? It is the same. In short, do not forget what I said last year. As long as I am in San Francisco that day, I guarantee there will be no major earthquakes, though not minor problems, during this age where drama is on the decline. There are many natural and mental disasters, so I hope everyone will recite Quan Xin Bodhisattva's name more, recite Earth Stalking Bodhisattva's name more. This way, San Francisco Sutra. In addition, all the great gods, kings from the Saha and other worlds came and gathered together. They were the ghost king Evil Eyes, the ghost king Blood Drinker, the ghost king Essence and Energy Eater, the ghost king Fetus and Egg Eater, the ghost king Spreader of Sickness, the ghost king Collector of Poisons, the ghost king Kite-Hearted, the ghost king Blessings and Benefits, the ghost king Great Regard and Respect, and others. Commentary in addition. Why in addition? It is because not only have so many bodhisattvas and dragons and spirits of the Eightfold Division come to the Chiyashim Shri Heaven, but there are also those from other lands. All the great ghost kings from the Saha and other worlds came and gathered together. Saha is Sanskrit for bearing with patience, meaning that living beings have to bear this kind of pain. That is why this is called the Saha world. Other worlds refer to the lands of other Buddhas. We are not limiting ourselves to the Saha world. All the great ghost kings, most people explain all as many. I am different from other people. How? I explain it not as many but as few. In fact, one. Some say my explanation is wrong because this means many, not few or one. I would like to treat it as one. Why? It is because I am really foolish. I cannot remember when there are so many numbers. One is easy to remember, but two requires some thinking. How many is all? Uh, or if I treat it as many, it is innumerable, which is problematic. So I explain it as one. All is one and one is all. Many is one and one is many. This is how I am different in explaining the sutras. All the great ghost kings in my explanation are one ghost king. Which one? The ghost king that I am talking about now. There is the hateful eyes ghost king, the ghost king collector of poisons, the ghost king cut-hearted, and one after another. I do not mix them up. In Chinese, this all can also be an auxiliary. Larry word to mean all those all, all of one. This is my unreasonable explanation of the Chinese word true as one. I am explaining this to you because if I do not, you disagree and think I lectured the sutras wrong. So now I explained it to you. Where did this many come from? Look for its source. The many came from one or even none. Since many came from one, you might count from one. Remember one, you will know about two and three. Did you so long this fashion? You end with one is infinity and infinity is just one. One disperses into infinity. Infinity returns to one. We must return to one as we cultivate. What are we cultivating? We are cultivating this mind. What should we do with the mind? The mind must concentrate. As it is said, reach a singleness of focus and everything is achieved. Reach that single one and there will be no problems. 
Cultivation is about cultivating this one, cultivating to focus your thoughts. Once your thoughts focus, you can uncover wisdom. If your thoughts are not focused, then you are tracing for answers outside. If you can avoid letting a thought occur, that is even more wonderful. Not one thought occurs and the entire substance manifests. The six senses move suddenly and they are covered by clouds. Although the Sutra text describes so many ghosts, if you do not even let one thought occur, there is not one ghost, not only one ghost, but not even one spirit, one Buddha or one Bodhisattva. There is nothing and yet that is when everything manifests. At this time, the Buddhas come, the Bodhisattvas come, South Huras, those who enlighten to conditions, Pratika Buddhas and all show up. Why? Because you are gone. If you were present, they would not come. This is where it is so wonderful and truly inconceivable. It is also a plus to true. At the same time, do not mistake true as merely one. Not even one came, all these great ghost kings, but they are all gone. This world vanishes and this world vanishes. What do you have to worry about? No sadness or and worries, no obstructions and impediments. By then, the nature ends, the hearing is quiet and one is the universe. The human nature, self-nature and material nature end. By this time, you are heaven and earth, heaven and earth are you. You are all Buddhas, all Buddhas are you. So, you are not two and no different. Where is the you, I or he? How could there be so many marks of the self, marks of people, marks of living beings and marks of lifespan? Since everything is gone, what do you have to worry about? All the distresses are cleaned up. By that time, it is purity without remainder. Not one thought occurs and the entire substance manifests. Substance manifests. The six senses move suddenly and they are covered by clouds. See, such states are really wonderful beyond words. Wonderful beyond words, so never mind the words. Let's not talk about it. No, I like to talk, so I will keep talking. Unspeakable, unspeakable. Who knows what is unspeakable? Speak on what? Speak about all the great ghost kings. All these great ghost kings are really mean. Ghosts are all mean. The ghost I am talking about here has very long legs. How long? I don't know how long. There must be several yards. In general, even some professors in China do not recognize ghosts because their legs are so long that most people do not see where they actually are. This word ghost in Chinese is a homonym for return. The Chinese has a saying about how dying is like coming home, returning to a place of offenses. Ghosts return to their house, their home. Why do they believe their house are their home? It is because they are lost. Let me try an English homonym for ghosts. Go. They go to their house. Why? Because they think that place is fun, is the best. They run to the mountain of knives, trees, of swords, works of oil. They go and go. Go into the house, to the house, to the room of hungry ghosts, to the room of animals. So an explanation according to Chinese is returning, while an explanation according to English is going. This is a simple explanation of mine. Now, where did this big ghost go? It did not go anywhere. It is in the house. They were the ghost king evil eyes. This ghost has real long legs and mean-looking eyes. Evil eyes means when you see how ferocious his eyes are, you tremble. The ghost king blood drinker, he focuses on drinking living beings' blood. He goes to drink beyond anywhere it is found. 
the gods to King Essence, an energy eater, is Isaka in Sanskrit. The light being Sashra is the Suragama Mantra is in the Suragama Mantra is this ghost king essence essence an energy eater. He enjoys eating people's energy and the essence of the five grains. For instance, why do our essence and energy dissipate? It is because this type of ghost sucks your essence and energy away. The gods king fetus and egg eater. Its undeveloped fetuses. This type of ghost is placentas that fall off of newborns born earlier than expected. He also is ghost. How come he became this type of ghost? It is because in past lives he used to like to kill. He will not even share the meat and blood he prepared with his wife, not to mention other people. He eats and drinks his own budget game, unwilling to share with others. He is a sign of stinginess, that is why he died, and became a ghost king fetus and egg eater who is such nasty things. The ghost king spreader of sickness goes around spreading epidemics, contagious diseases. Diseases occur because some ghost king spreader of sickness is distributing them. The ghost king collector of poisons is a good ghost and not a bad ghost. He will suck away any venom you contract it and cure you. This type of ghost is the transformation of bodhisattvas who came to save living beings. He does not poison others. Instead, he sucks out your, wisdom, your, your poisons no matter who you are. This is a good intentioned ghost king. The ghost king Kaitated is compassionate. Although a ghost enters among the ghosts to save them so that ghosts develop the body resolve, the ghost king blessings and benefits is the wealth fortune spirit who bestows and increases blessings. The ghost king great regard and respect and others and all so many ghost kings as described earlier came to the Chi Yashim Shahib and to listen to Shakya Muni Buddha explain, explain the earth star sutra. Sutra, at that time, Shakya Muni Buddha said to the Dharma Prince Manju Sri Bodhisattva Mahasattva, As you regard these Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, gods, dragons, ghosts, and spirits from this land and other lands who are now gathered in the Chayashim heaven, do you know how many of them there are? Commentary, at that time, what time was that? It was when each ghost king went to Chayashim Shahaven to listen to the drama. What are ghost kings? They are leaders among ghosts. Whether these gods are good or bad, they are transforms of bodhisattvas. Do not think ghost kings are just go ghosts. Ghost kings made vows in past lives to teach and transform living beings using various means, some pulled in all being using compassion, some used ferociousness to tame living beings. These are the two ways of disciplining and attracting. Some being developed their resolve for Buddha when they met a compassionate ghost king who used gather, gathering in to teach and transform living beings. Some beings that met ferocious looking ghost kings and developed their resolve for body an example of teaching and transforming living beings with discipline since we understand that all ghosts are transformations of bodhisattvas we know there is really no good or evil ghost king where the good and evil come from from every living beings comic retribution when living beings evil karma matures, they see the ghost king evil eyed. When living beings good karma matured, 
they see the ghost king I hated, regardless of evil karma or good karma. When it repents, it changes. When evil karma repents, it turns into good karma. When good karma repents, it sometimes turns into evil karma. We will not be turned by good or evil karma if we were cultivating the Buddha drama. We will only work toward good karma and not turn to evil karma. We will not enter stray. Why do we study the Buddha drama? We want to flip over the the and earth over, flip heaven and earth over, shatter the universe. Why do we want to shatter heaven and earth? Heaven represents good karma. Why earth represents evil karma? Turn back the good and evil karma of heavenly and earth. Walk down the path of goodness and another path of evil. Do that and the evil ghost kings would be rendered powerless. The good ghost kings would be unemployed or retired because they have no work to do. I am very happy, very unhappy with recorders during my sutra lectures. Why? It makes some of refuge disciples dependent and lazy. No one is personally taking notes. I notice that everyone is to pay attention and write lots of notes and record everything very clearly. But now, no one takes notes anymore. People do not pay attention when they are listening. They forget when they read. Soon enough, they return everything and said to me, forcing me into retirement. Since both good and bad ghost kings are useless, I as Dharma Master am useless too. So, I cannot make good ghosts and bad ghosts retire. If they are out of a job, then I would be unemployed too. I would not have any sutra to lecture on no lecturer, no audience. Without an audience, what is the point of being a Dharma master? At that time, Shakyamuni Buddha said to the Dharma prince, Manju Sri Bodhisattva Mahasattva. Manju Sri Bodhisattva is also called Wonderful Virtual Bodhisattva and Wonderful Auspiciousness Bodhisattva. Why is he called Wonderful Virtual? He was born with Ten auspicious signs. Light lit up the entire room. Sweet dew overfilled the place. Seven gems welled forth from the earth. Hidden treasures magically opened up. Chickens gave birth to four nixes. Pigs gave birth to dragons. Horses gave birth to chimeras. Cows gave birth to mythical beasts, millets in the galaxy turned to gold. Elephants had six tops. He is called Wonderful Virtual because he had his ten inconceivable wonders. He is called Wonderful Auspiciousness because he was born with these kinds of auspicious omens. Actually, this Bodhisattva is no longer a Bodhisattva but a Buddha. He became a Buddha in the past named the Venerated King Buddha of Dragon Seed. He became a Buddha in the past. Is he a Buddha now? He became a Buddha in the present too. What is his name as the Buddha now? He is called the Buddha of Accumulation of Treasures of Happiness filled with many jewels. His land is the world of happiness in the north. Manju Sri Bodhisattva is the Buddha accumulation of many jewels. According to the Lotus Sutra, Manju Sri Bodhisattva is the master of Shakyamuni Buddha's master. What does that mean? The Buddha of light from sun and moon lamps and had eight sons. 
the youngest became a Buddha named Burning Lamp. Buddha Burning Lamp, Buddha's master, is Dharma Master Wonderful Light. Who is Dharma Master Wonderful Light? He is the Manjo Sri Bodhisattva. Shakyamuni Buddha was Burning Lamp Buddha's disciple. He received and the prediction for Buddhahood from Burning Lamp Land and became a Buddha in this life. In terms of generations, Manjo Sri Bodhisattva is much more senior than Shakyamuni Buddha, being the master of Shakyamuni Buddha's master. Now that Shakyamuni Buddha came to be a Buddha, Manjo Sri became Shakyamuni Buddha's disciple. See how Bodhisattvas do not hang on to any outer size at all. For them, there is big or small, high or low, various discriminations. When I lectured on the Vala Sutra, I often told you that the drama is equal and level without high or low. Now that we are in this house lecturing on the sutras and explaining the drama, there may be my masters or disciples from the past now that you are studying the Buddha drama. You will become enlightened and, and realize Buddhahood if you learn to have the way, possess virtue. Perhaps I will request you to my master. The Buddha drama is inconceivable. So the wonderful strengths of wonderful virtue and wonderful auspiciousness are examples. Once you understand, then living all master is all dharma. If you do not understand the text too much, you are wrong in every turn, falling into emptiness based on the unconditioned. I speak extemporaneously when I lecture on the sutras. Sometimes my explanations shatter the heavens and sometimes quake the earth. But I do not care whether the sky collapses or the earth caves in. I do not care at all. There is nothing. All dramas are without a self, without people, without living beings, and without lifespans. So what does it mean by the Buddha drama flourishing? The Buddha drama declining proper drama. Ending drama everything is false. Drama and in Dharma, everything is false. Some say, Dharma Master, your talks confuse me. I meant to confuse you. If you heart, if you understand, you would not listen to my sutra lecture. Okay, let me keep explaining this confusing sutra. Bodhisattva Mahasattva. Mahasattva is a great Bodhisattva. Who is great? Who is this great Bodhisattva? Manjushri Bodhisattva. Shakyamuni Buddha asked Manjushri Bodhisattva, As you regard these Buddhas who have come to the heavenly palace, Bodhisattvas, gods, dragons, gods, and spirits from this land, this world, and other lands who are now gathered in the Chagyashim Shaheven, do you know how many of them there are? Do you know how many Buddhas will come to the palace in the Chajashim Shaheven to listen to me speak the Earth Star Sutra? How many Bodhisattvas? How many Ghosts and Spirits? Are you clear on the exact number? Tell me, please respond. Sutra Manjushri said to the Buddha, World or not one, even if I were to measure and reckon with my spiritual powers for a thousand years, I still would not be able to know how many of them there are. The Buddha told Manjushri, Regarding them with my Buddha eye, their numbers cannot be exhausted. Those beings have been taken across, are being taken across, will be taken across have been brought to accomplishment, are being brought to accomplishment, or will be brought to accomplishment by Earth Star Bodhisattva. 
Siti Gapa throughout many eons. Manju Sri said to the Buddha, Won't honor the one throughout many ends I have cultivated guilt rules, and my wisdom has been certified as unobstructed. When I hear what the Buddha says, I immediately accept it with faith. But heroes of small attainment, gods, dragons, and the rest of the Eightfold Division, and beings in the future who hear the Third Kama's true and sincere words, will certainly harbor doubts. Even if they receive the teaching most respectfully, they will still be unable to avoid slandering it. My only wish is that the world honored one will proclaim for everyone what earth store Bodhisattva Mahasattva practiced and what vows he made while on the level of planting causes that now enable him to succeed in doing such inconceivable deeds. Commentary Manjushri said to the Buddha earlier, Shakyamuni Buddha asked Manjushri Bodhisattva, Do you know how many Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, ghosts, and spirits there are? Manjushri Bodhisattva told the Buddha, World or not one, even if I were to measure and reckon with my spiritual powers for a thousand ends, were I to take one thousand ends to estimate and guess that number using my spiritual powers and wisdom i still would not be able to know how many of them there are i would not know that number the buddha shakyamuni told manjushri bodhisattva regarding them with my buddha eye observing with my buddha eye what is a buddha eye a buddha eye is like a thousand suns that are omniscient see and hear everything the buddha eye has all possibly capabilities and is the manifestation of all wisdom there are four other eyes the flesh eye the heavenly eye the drama eye and the wisdom eye one verse describes them comprehensively the flesh eye penetrates obstructions the heavenly eye penetrates without obstructions the drama eye contemplates the secular. The wisdom eye understands true emptiness. The Buddha eye is like a thousand suns. It is the same a source that shines on different things. The heavenly eye sees everything thoroughly and clearly without any obstructions. The flesh eye penetrates obstructions. What is the flesh eye? It can see everyone and everything. The flesh eye is not the eyes we typically used to see. There is another flesh eye. The heavenly eye and the flesh eye are on opposite sides. Not only can the flesh eye see things in the house and outside the house, regardless of how far, as long as you want to, you will see it. If you do not want to see it, you will not see it, of course. Also, you can see it would be best if you do not. Why? It takes a thought to see one thing. It is better to have fewer thoughts than more thoughts. One less false thought is better than one more false thought. Using this eye to see things and observe requires thoughts. But this kind of thought is somewhat different than most people's thoughts. Although they are different, there is not much advantage to it. Even you can, when you can see, you should not look. This is the flesh eye that penetrates obstructions. This means it can see through every item that blocks. The drama eye contemplates the secular. The drama eye sees the secular truths, which are the typical worldly situations. If you open your drama eye, not only do you not need to read to trust, all you need to do is open your drama eye and all of space and Dharma realm as you trust, limitless and boundless number of Dharma treasures. As long as you have the purity to the Dharma eye, you can universally observe the true marks of all Dharmas. This is the Dharma eye that contemplates the secular. The wisdom eye understands true emptiness. The wisdom eye observes emptiness. Secular truths are false truths because they are not 
substantive real truths are about the understanding of true emptiness. The wisdom I understand is true emptiness because it understands the true marks of all dhammas and true emptiness. The Buddha eyes like a thousand suns. The Buddha's eyes are as bright as a thousand suns. It is the same as the source, but shines on different things. Although it says different things, it is one of the core. Now in this Sutra passage, the Buddha said that he observed with the Buddha eye. He used the Buddha eye and observed that all the Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, South Hearers, those who enlighten to conditions, Rajaka Buddhas and dragons and spirits are in eightfold division. Their numbers cannot be exhausted. I do not know the numbers in detail. Shakyamuni Buddha said, Those beings have been taken across to become Buddhas a long time ago by Earth Star Bodhisattva. All these Bodhisattvas are being taken across in the time when Earth Star Bodhisattva was on the cause ground. We will be taken across um, all the dragons and spirits, gods and all beings of the future. Have been brought to accomplishment, are being brought to accomplishment, and all will be brought to accomplishment by Earth Star Bodhisattva, Siti Gappa, throughout many ends. Accomplishment in Chinese also means lush and lofty. The position achieved will be high, great and lush. It also means filiality. Most people cannot shoulder the word filiality in China. Who can? The emperor. Since ancient times, the emperor governed the world with filiality, achieving the loftiest virtues. In this sutra, Earth Stobody Sattva is already helping all beings realize Buddhahood. Now he is helping living beings be Bodhisattvas and will help all beings realize their highest role, Buddhas, in the future. This idea contains three stages. One, planting as a planting seeds. Two, ripening grains nurtured and irrigated grow from out of the soil. Three, liberated as in liberation after being mature for a while. In other words, being making beings who have not planted any good roots to plant good roots, making beings who have planted good roots grow, making those whose good roots have already grown to ripen. They are liberated when their good roots mature. There are three meanings to accomplishment. Manjul Sri said to the Buddha, World honored one throughout many ends in the past. Since a long, long time ago, I have cultivated gurus and my wisdom has been certified as unobstructed. I have already certified to unobstructed wisdom. Unobstructed wisdom is the four unobstructed eloquences or the four unobstructed wisdom. The four unobstructed eloquences are the obstructed the unobstructed eloquence of Dharma, the dramas spoken are very reasonable. Though it is one principle, it can be broken down into millions and millions of principles. Although there are millions and millions of principles, they can be classified into one principle. The unobstructed eloquence of meaning, the unobstructed eloquence of phrasing, was said really make sense. The unobstructed eloquence of delight in speaking, one enjoys talking. When I hear what the Buddha says, I immediately accept it with faith. Since I, Manjushri, cultivated Mahayana dramas in the past, I believe instantaneously what the Buddha says. But hearers of small attainment, such as South hearers, those who enlighten to conditions and positions in the the, the Ravadan tradition, gods, dragons, and the rest of the Eightfold Division, such as Yashas, Gandavas, Asuras, Garudas, Kinaras, and Maharagas, and all beings in the future who hear the first common true and sincere words, will certainly harbor doubts. Look as truthful as the Buddha's words are, they are still skeptical. 
not to mention my disciples. Someone does not believe in my explanation of the sutras and wants to run away. It is no wonder, considering what Manjushri said about how all of the Eightfold Division does not believe and questions the Buddha's spoken truths. Some people think it is very normal to hear sutra lectures. Actually, it is one of the most difficult and rare things to hear sutra lectures live, especially in the United States. How many spaces offer lecturing follow lines in following lines in the sutra text and explaining the meaning word by word? None, or extremely few, in Western countries. Although. Few Westerners who hear the true Buddha drama do not recognize it either, because they do not understand the Buddha drama. For example, people who have never seen gold will treat gold. You hand him as copper. Another example would be to treat diamond as glass. Similarly, explain the true Buddha drama, and because they. Do not recognize it. They consider it ordinary and external rather than internal. Actually, how can you understand the inner if you do not even understand the outer? You must try to two-prong approach. You cannot cultivate without understanding principles. You cannot understand principles if you do not cultivate either. Understanding and practice must correspond. Corresponding means to understand the um, Buddha drama, and practice means cultivating according to the Buddha drama. When Shakyamuni Buddha explained this Earth Star Sutra, even Manjushri Bodhisattva raised his concern about Satyras of the small attainments, eightfold division of God, dragon, and others, and all beings in the future will not believe it. Since they do not have enough good rules, although they hear these honest words the Buddha articulated, they are skeptical for sure. Even if they receive the teaching most respectfully, suppose they receive the teachings, it is only temporary, because their faith only lasts for a short period of time. For instance, some people take refuge like others, but they have no faith because their heads are full of devin knowledge and devin views. They do not understand the proper dharma when you explain it to them. They do not know what they hear. They will still be unable to avoid slandering it. While Shakyamuni Buddha was in the world, Manjushri Bodhisattva suggested, "My only wish is that the world honor the one who proclaims for everyone." What earth stop would he set by myself? I practiced, and what vows he made while on the level of planting causes. I wish you, world honored one, will say a bit more about earth stop would he set by myself? This great would he set by what practices did he cultivate, and what vows did he make in lives past? We make vows. No matter the vows, we must fulfill our promises. And do what we say we will. We cannot deviate from that, no matter what kind of hardship or difficulty, according to our vows. That now enable him to succeed in doing such inconceivable deeds. This earth star Bodhisattva, however, achieves this type of inconceivable state. Sutra, the Buddha said to Manjushri, by way of analogy, suppose that. Each blade of grass, tree, forest, rice plant, hemp stalk, bamboo, reed, mountain, rock, and the smoke in a three thousand great thousand one system was a Ganges River. Let's suppose that each grain of sand in each of those Ganges rivers was a wound, and that each dust smoke in each of those wounds was an end. Then suppose that each dust smoke. Accumulated in each of those ends was itself an end. The time it lasted since Earth Star Bodhisattva was certified to the position of the Ten Ground is a thousand times longer than that in the above analogy. 
Even longer was the time that he dwelt on the levels of Hira and Pratika Buddha. Commentary. The Buddha said to Manjushri, Shakyamuni Buddha told Manjushri Bodhisattva, "Let me give you an analogy. By way of analogy, suppose that each blade of grass, tree, forest, rice plant, hemp stalk, bamboo, reed, mountain, rock, and thus most in a three thousand great thousand world system was a Ganges river." We are not talking about just one of each of these items, but all the grass, all the trees, eatable rice plants, eatable hemp stalks, etc. How many bamboos and reeds are there in the three thousand great thousand world system? Can you count all of them? You cannot. Lots of dust must become mountains. There are so many things in the three thousand great thousand world system. If each item was one, what would be the total? If every blade of grass counted as one Ganges river, then the number of Ganges rivers that existed would be uncountable. Not only every blade of grass, but every tree, forest, rice plant, hemp stalk, bamboo, and reed too, to count as one Ganges river. One item is one Ganges river. Two items are two Ganges river. Three items are three Ganges rivers. Four items are four Ganges rivers. The number of grass and trees are practically infinite, so there would be infinite Ganges rivers. This means that there are so many that the the figure cannot be calculated. If each item or To turn into a Ganges river, how many sand grains would be in those Ganges rivers? Then suppose that each grain of sand in each of those Ganges rivers was a wound. If every sand grain in all those Ganges rivers were a three thousand great thousand wound, and that each dust mote in each of those three thousand great thousand wounds was an ant. Then suppose that each dust mote accumulated in each of those ants was itself a great ant. The time elapsed since Earth Star Bodhisattva was certified to the position of the the tenth ground is a thousand times or more longer than that in the above analogy. Even longer was the time that he dwelt on the levels of Hira and Pratika Buddha. Not to mention how long a store Bodhisattva was sat here, how long he was a Shravaka, how long he was a Pratika Buddha. A store Bodhisattva's conduct and vows have been in existence for a long time. Sutra Manjushri, the awesome spiritual strength and vows of this Bodhisattva are inconceivable. If good men or good women of the future hear this Bodhisattva's name, praise him, behold, and bow to him, call his name, make offerings to him, or if they draw, carve, cast, sculpture, or make lacquered images of him, such people will be reborn in the heaven of the thirty-three. One hundred times, and will never fall into the evil paths. Manjushri, indescribably many ants ago, during the time of a Buddha named Lion Sprint, complete in the ten thousand practices, thus come one. Earth Star Bodhisattva Mahasattva was the son of a great elder. Commentary. Manjushri Shakyamuni Buddha called out, "The awesome spiritual strength and vows of this Bodhisattva are inconceivable." Which Bodhisattva is the Buddha referring to? Earth Star Bodhisattva. His awesome virtues, spiritual powers, and vows are inconceivable. To save all beings with profoundly heavy offenses. He uses his awesome might to subdue them. He made these vows: "Unless the hells are empty, I will not become a Buddha. Until all beings are saved, 
will identify to Buddha. He wants to save all beings before he becomes a Buddha. If there is one being who has not been saved, he will not become a Buddha. This is why it has been so long and he is still not a Buddha. When this being is saved, another comes, it never ends. Either that being is becoming born, or that being is passing away, or that being is passing away and this being is coming into the world. There are ten times, a hundred times, a thousand times, ten thousand times more living beings become becoming born than passing away. Let us calculate and see if there are more deaths or births in San Francisco right now. Deaths come after aging and sickness, whereas the birth only requires 10 months of pregnancy, a relatively shorter period of time. Since people have to wait a few decades to die, there are millions, many more births than deaths, which makes a stubborn sad fast work so hard that he cannot realize Buddha even now. But does he regret it? He does not regret it. The more living beings there are, the more jobs he has. Without living beings, he is out work, and he goes on to realize Buddhahood. There is not much to do as a Buddha either. So Earth Star King Bodhisattva looks for things to do when there is not much to do. He was very much at leisure, but he would rather be busy all day saving living beings. This is the Earth Star King Bodhisattva's vows. Why did Earth Star King Bodhisattva make this kind of vow? He feels that he is one with living beings. If living beings do not become Buddhas, there is not much significance to his becoming a Buddha either. He is here waiting for living beings because his causes and conditions are about being one with living beings always. Earth stalking Bodhisattva's vows can never be fathomed. If good men or women of the future hear this earth stalking Bodhisattva's name, praise him for his incredible vows, spiritual powers, and compassion. They introduce everyone to earth star Bodhisattva. You have heard this sutra, so you should introduce the compassion and vows of earth star Bodhisattva to every colleague, relative, or friend you see. Reflect to earth star Bodhisattva makes vows like this, so what should I do? Should I make a tiny vow? Perhaps becoming a Buddha after I deliver one living being to Buddhahood. Perhaps becoming a Buddha after I deliver two living beings to Buddhahood. I do not make any great vows, just little vows. Even that would mean that I have not wasted listening to the Earth Star Sutra. If you simply let it go by so that the Bodhisattva is the Bodhisattva and I am me, he and I do not have too many connections, then it is as if you did not hear it. For instance, men should make vows about saving their ex-friends when they have become Buddhas, women should consider this. I had a dearest boyfriend before. Now that I am cultivating, I'm going to make sure he becomes a Buddha first, then I will follow. Make vows like this. Avoid. Amitabha Buddha takes his own. Mahasattva cares about no others. Perhaps you say, I'm really young and have never had a boyfriend or girlfriend. You have a mom and dad, make vows to save them so they become Buddhas. What if your parents have already passed away? You have siblings. No sibling, you can save your friends. Make vows targeting someone or some group. If there is no one else, you can say, I will make a vow to save my drama brother so that he becomes a Buddha for sure. You may laugh at me, but I will tell you. If any disciple who has taken refuge with me does not become a Buddha, I will not become a Buddha either. I may have 
No, I may not have found as huge as earth stalking bodhisattva wanting to save all beings so that they become Buddhas. I qualify it with those who have taken refuge and disciples who truly believe in me. If such people do not become Buddhas, I will wait for them. Even if they fall into their house, I will go down to their house to find them. This is not too bad either. It is quite great. It takes many lives of planting gurus to encounter a teacher like this. Behold and bow to him, call his name. Recite the holy name of great vows of earth stalking bodhisattva. As we explain the earth stalls to try now, my words earth stalking bodhisattva is really amazing at praises. Incantations of homage to the great vows of earth stalking bodhisattva are recitations of his name, make offerings to him. Now that we have invited the elder earth stalking bodhisattva here. We make offerings by lighting incense for him daily, bowing to him and making him offerings of fruits. Or if they draw a colored picture of earth stalking bodhisattva, not even on wood, but just a drawing of this Buddha image, makes your appearance adorned and perfect. There are 32 hallmarks and 80 minor subsidiary characteristics to the Buddha. Draw a Buddha image and you will be better looking. Draw 2, even better. Draw 3, 4, 5, millions and millions. Then you will have the 32 hallmarks and the 80 subsidiary characteristics in general. Drawing Buddha images and making Buddha images will make you very good looking. Carve, cast, sculpt, or make locked images of him. Such people will be reborn in the heaven of the 33, 100 times. One drawing of a Buddha image will lead you to become reborn in the heaven of 33 for 100 rounds. These 100 rounds include not only births in the heaven of 33. Someone who draws a Buddha image will first be reborn 100 times in each level of the 69 heavens and the 18 heavens of the fourth realm, the three heavens of the first dhyana, the three heavens of the second dhyana, the three heavens of the third dhyana, the nine heavens of the fourth dhyana, and even the heaven of the station of neither thought nor non-thought in the formless realm and others. Before he is reborn in the heaven of 33, 100 times, he has been born in each level of the desire realm, form realm, and formless realm 100 times. This is a long time and will never fall into the evil paths. As long as you praise, behold, and bow, recite the name, make offerings, or make different images of earth stalking bodhisattva, then you will never fall into the evil paths. Manjushri Bodhisattva, indescribably many ends ago, there is no way to say how long that is or how many ends that is. This is just as incalculable as the analogy used earlier for a long period of time. If each blade of grass, tree, forest, rice plant, hemp stalk, bamboo, reed, mountain, rock, and dust mold in a 3000 grade thousand world system was the Ganges River, then suppose that each grain of sand in each of those Ganges rivers was the world, and that each dust mold in each of those worlds was an end. Then suppose that each dust mold accumulated in each of those ends was itself an end. This number is bigger than and more difficult to calculate than the number representing the amount of force required to send a rocket to the moon. We are using math to calculate the force needed to shoot a rocket into a certain spot in space to stop it or to orbit it. After the exact figures needed for fuel have been calculated with mathematics, the rocket is shot into the atmosphere.
this is calculable. However, no matter how advanced the mathematics develops or how precise the science gets, there is no way to calculate the number of ants that a stalking bodhisattva has gone through. During the time of a Buddha named Lion Sprint complete in the thousand in the ten thousand practices thus come one. A star Bodhisattva Mahasattva was the son of a great elder. At that time there was a Buddha in the world named Lion Sprint. Lions are the king among beasts. But as long as a lion roars, all the beasts are frightened into paralysis and collapse or become numb. The name of this Buddha is like a lion. Sprint is an indication of the speed at which lions run. The Buddha is named complete in the 10,000 practices because he is replete with the six parameters and the myriad conducts. Sutra, that eldest son. Upon observing the Buddha's hallmarks and fun features and how the thousand blessings adorned him, asked that Buddha what practices and vows made him so magnificent. Land sprint complete in the ten thousand practices thus come one, then said to the eldest son, If you wish to have a body like me, you must first spend a long time liberating beings who are undergoing suffering. Commentary that eldest son Upon observing the Buddha's hallmarks and fine features, he saw the first common lion sprint complete in the 10,000 practices, have 32 hallmarks and 80 subsidiary characteristics and a thousand blessings that adorn. How come he has 32 hallmarks and 80 subsidiary characteristics? It is because of a thousand blessings that adorn him. Cultivating the five precepts and the ten good deeds turns into 100 blessings. Each number turns into ten, making a total of 100, uh, 1,000. Each blessing accumulates so that there are 1,000 blessings. And this is how the thousand blessings adorned him. He asked that Buddha, what practices and vows made him so magnificent, seeing how perfect and wonderful the Buddha's features are. He asked, thus come one lion's print complete in the 10,000 practices. What practices did you cultivate before and what vows did you make before so that you have such features? Lion's print complete in the 10,000 practices, thus come one, then, then said to the elder son, if you wish to have a body like mine, let me tell you, you must first spend a long time liberating beings who are undergoing suffering. When all beings who suffer are saved, leaving behind their suffering, then your appearance will be perfect, meaning that once you save living beings so that they become Buddhas, you become Buddhas. Sutra Manjushri, that comment caused the eldest son to make a vow. From now until the end of future time throughout uncultable ends, I will use expansive expanding means to help beings in the six paths who are suffering for their offenses. Only when they have all been liberated will I myself become a Buddha. From the time he made that great vow in the presence of that Buddha until now, hundreds of thousands of Nayutas of inexpressibly many ends have passed, yet he still is a Bodhisattva. Commentary Manjushri Bodhisattva That comment caused the eldest son to make a vow. When this eldest son heard lion sprint complete in the 10,000 practices, thus come one, say this, that he made a vow. He said, from now until the end of future time. The eldest son refers to himself about how he went through who knows how many infinite ends until the end of future. That is why he says throughout uncountable ends. How can future ends disappear? They will not, which is why this number of ends is incalculable. I will use expansive expanded means to help beings in the six paths 
who are suffering for their offenses. For living beings in the six realms who suffer and create offenses, since every thought and every move of living beings in the Saha world are offenses and karma, they are beings. They are the beings that offend and suffer in the six realms. The six realms are heavenly beings, human re humans, asuras, hell beings, hungry ghosts, and animals. I vastly established various, not just one, expanding practices. Only when they have all been liberated, leaving suffering and acquiring blessings, realizing Buddhahood soon, only when all beings have become Buddhas, will I myself become a Buddha. If there is one being does not become a Buddha, I will not become a Buddha either. If yet a single being is not accomplished Buddhahood, accordingly I also must renounce Nirvana's bliss from the time he made that great vow in the presence of that Buddha, land sprint complete in the 10,000 practices thus come one. Until now, a period of time that lasted hundreds of thousands of Nayutas, a very large number in Sanskrit, of inexpressibly another very large number in Sanskrit, many ends have passed, yet he still is a Bodhisattva who has not realized Buddhahood. Sutra Another time, in considerable Assam year ends ago, there was a Buddha named Enlightenment Flower Samadhi Self Mastery King First Come One. That Buddha's lifespan was 400 billion Assam year ends. Commentary Another time, not just three great Assam year ends, but much longer, inconceivable and unimaginable number of Assam year ends ago. There was a Buddha named Enlightenment, Flower Samadhi Self Mastery King First Come One. Enlightenment Flower is the cause, Self Mastery King is the effect. Enlightenment Flower is the root, Self Mastery King is the branch. This means that he cultivated the flower of enlightenment at the level of causes and certified to the effect of a king at ease. How do we cultivate? The flower of enlightenment with concentration. How do we realize the effect of a self mastery king? It is also through concentration. Where the cause is concentration, the effect is concentration. Enlightenment flower samadhi self mastery king is the Buddha's unique name. Thus, common is a name common to all Buddhas. That Buddha's lifespan, there are three explanations. For the third common's lifespan, according to the Dharma Flower Sutra, there are three others according to the 16 Contemplation Sutra. First, the Buddha's Dharma body is true and thus inseparable from all Dharmas. The true thusness of the Dharma body is not at all different from all Dharmas. Nominant as thus are life. This is difficult to explain because we are caught with the principles as they are. Principles as they are wisdom. Wisdom is states. The Buddha states are wisdom. Wisdom is just states. The Buddha uses wisdom to light up all states. States and wisdom correspond so that states and wisdom are non dual. When states come, illumine it, then let it go. The Buddha recognizes and understands every state. He is not obstructed by states because he does not recognize them. All those states and wisdom are two. They become one when they have one principle as their span. Wisdom are their life. This is an explanation of lifespan according to the Buddha's retribution body. In terms of the response body or transformational body, its span is 100 years in duration. A centurion lives a long, a centurion lives a long span. The transformational body and the response body live out their span of life. This is an explanation of the three bodies according to the Dharma Flower Sutra. According to the sixteen contemplation sutra, it is a different set of explanations. How come? The sutra say that the response body may appear coming into being and ceasing like everyone else. The Buddhas also appear to 
come into being and cease to be. That is the Buddha's come into the world and enter Nirvana. This is coming into being and ceasing, making production and extinction appear as there are beginnings and ends. As long as there is a beginning, there is an end. This explains the lifespan of a Buddha's response body and a retribution body. Once we acquire the Buddha's retribution body, we have it forever. The lifespan of A Buddha's retribution body has a beginning to it, but no end. What about the lifespan of a Dharma body? It is neither a long span nor a short span, since it is impossible to say how long a Buddha's Dharma body will last. It is neither long nor short. It has no beginning or end. This is one explanation of the Buddha's Dharma body. I believe it is very difficult to understand this kind of. Terminology. This particular Buddha's lifespan was the 400 million asampiya ends. This kind of lifespan refers to the lifespans of the Buddha's retribution body and response body. Sutra. During his Dharma image age, there lived a Brahman man, woman endowed with ample blessings, with previous lives, who was respected by everyone. Whether she was walking, standing, sitting, or lying down, God surrounded and protected her. Her mother, however, embraced a devout faith and often slighted the triple jewel. The worthy daughter made use of many expedients in trying to convince her mother to hold right views, but her mother never totally believed. Before long, the mother's life ended, and her consciousness fell into the re- uh, relentless hell. When her mother's life ended, the Brahma woman, knowing that her mother had not believed in cause and effect while alive, feared that her karma would certainly pull her into the evil paths. For that reason, she sold the family house and. Acquired many kinds of incense, flowers, and other gifts. With those, she performed a great offering in the Buddha stupas and monasteries. Commentary: During his Dharma image age, there are three eras to the Buddha Dharma: the age of proper Dharma, the age of image Dharma, the age of decline of Dharma. During the age of proper dharma, most bhikshus, bhikshunis, upasakas, and upasikas all cultivate sincerely and sensitive to the fusion. This is the age of the proper dharma, the image dharma. There are fewer cultivations. The focus is on the superficialities, such as repairing stupas and building temples. They are firm in building temples. People are、uh, enjoy. People all enjoy doing merit by constructing Buddhist temples and Buddhist stupas. They enjoy pursuing blessings and not wisdom. This is the image Dharma age, where people are solid in constructing temples. The proper Dharma age lasts one thousand years. The image Dharma age lasts one thousand years. The decline of Dharma age lasts ten thousand years. We are now in the age of Dharma on the decline. People during the age of Dharma on the decline are firm in fighting. The age of image Dharma begins once enlightenment flower samadhi self mastery king first come on, enters nirvana. There lived a Brahma woman. Brahma is an externalist sect in India who cultivates purity. They are vegetarians, cultivate and are celibate, celibate, so they are pure. Brahmas cultivate this kind of practice of distancing themselves, but they do not have the essence, the ultimate principles. This is an ancient religion in India. And many similar religions of this sort remain in India. Yoga, for example, is a variation of the Brahma Brahman teachings. The Brahman teachings in China is Taoism. 
which, which also practices purity. During the image age of enlightenment flower, somebody's self-mastery can first come one. There was a Brahman woman who was endowed with ample blessings from previous lives. Although he was a Brahman woman, she had done many good deeds and many meritorious deeds in life's past. That is why he, she is endowed with ample blessings from previous lives. Who was respected by everyone? Most people respect her. Why do most people admire her and respect her? It is because she did a lot of merit in past lives and accumulated blessings. Whether someone is good-looking depending on his or her merit in past lives. One is perfect-looking if one created merit in past lives. Without merit, one's features are imperfect or ugly. The Buddha has 32 features and 30 secondary characteristics. He is adorned with a hundred blessings. What makes 100 blessings? 1,000 good deeds makes one blessing. 10,000 good deeds makes 10 blessings. And 100,000 good deeds make 100 blessings. Shakyamuni accumulated 100 blessings, so he enjoys his 32 features and 80 secondary characteristics. Pupils looks develop according to causes and conditions in the past. Whether someone is beautiful or not depends on his or her past lives. This Brahman woman was respected by everyone. Most people like to listen to what she says. And most people agree with the thing. Whether she was walking, standing, sitting, or lying down, God surrounded and protected her. As I said earlier, now that we have tied the boundaries, even if anyone experiences any comic obstructions, such as being possessed, that obstruction will quit and not disturb one, since the boundaries are locked down and you are here listening to the sutra on the accounts temporarily quit no one is allowed to come here to bother anyone or hustle anyone you have to concentrate on listening to the sutra the drama protecting good spirits the eightfold divisions of gods dragons and others all protect her although she is protected her mother, however, embraced a different faith and often slighted the triple jewel. Her mother does not believe in the proper dharma but believes in different dharmas instead. What does it mean by the believing in different dharmas? This is not necessarily about believing in her texts or counts. Actually, she has beliefs and have questions, believing in Buddhism today and questioning it tomorrow. She says she believes in the Triple Jewel, but I have not seen any Buddha of the Triple Jewel or the Dharma. Although there are sutras, it is no big idea. Sangha members, they are people too. Why should I respect some monastic? She is skeptical which is faith in the devant. She does not maintain any proper mindfulness, which is a devant thought. Without a proper faith, your faith is in the devant. For instance, some externalists say, give me one million dollars and I will sell you the role of an emperor in a future life. You think about being an emperor in a future life, so you give them a million dollars. Actually, how can the role of an emperor be sold? You, how can you buy the role of an emperor? Perhaps you can buy the presidency in a modern democracy. You are a woman in this lifetime and not a president, but I can guarantee that you become a president in a future life if you give me one million dollars. Whether you become a president or not in the future, you will not be able to fight him and get your one million dollars back. These externalists did not start an insurance company guaranteeing 
any of this. This is faith in the devil. How can you buy a presidency with one million dollars? That does not make any sense. Buying a presidency with one million dollars may be possible. How? I can lobby people to vote for me with that one million dollars. But you have to be an American citizen, not a foreign citizen, to do that in the United States. Explanations based on different faith do not make sense. Give me one hundred dollars, one thousand dollars, or ten thousand dollars, and I will guarantee that you become a man instead of a woman in your future lives. Do you hear this? And you think this is not bad. One million dollars buys a future life as a man is not too expensive, since this is quite economical. You give some Istanbulist teacher a million dollars. He puts the money in his pocket and goes off to drink, eat meat, and play women. When he has done everything, you cannot get all of your money back. I guarantee that I will be a man in the future. This is no guarantee either. This is David. These are one or two tactics that Suen Twindlers use. She often cited the triple jewel since she believes in Devin Dharma all the time. She did not believe in the proper Dharma. Devin Dharma consists of why believe in the Buddha. You are a Buddha. Just give me sixty-five dollars and it will be fine. Sixty-five dollars buys Buddhahood. That is a different drama, different path. How can Buddha be portrayed with money? You can become a Buddha, but you do not buy Buddhahood with money. You may use money to create merit. When you accumulate enough merit, then you realize Buddhahood. Create merit. Why you cultivate such as meditating? You should not refuse to cultivate. For instance, if Shakyamuni Buddha could have bought Buddhahood, he does not need to sit in the Himalayas for six years, sit underneath the Bodhi tree, see a bright star, and become enlightened. When he was a prince, he had so rich, he could have very well bought Buddhahood. Buddhahood is not purchased with money. Slighting the triple jewel means looking down on the triple jewel, slandering and sabotaging monastics. Some Cantonese people slight the triple jewel because they cannot stand bishops and bishonies. The worthy daughter, the Brahman woman, made use of many expedients. Expedients are for provisional explanations for people who only have a rough understanding of the drama. In trying to convince her mother, encouraging and enticing someone, for instance, children like candy, so you tell them, "I have a piece of candy. Follow me, and I will give you the candy." This is an enticement. This Brahma woman tells her mother something similar. Follow me and study the Buddha Dharma. The Buddha Dharma is the best; it is number one. But her mother does not believe her, encouraging and enticing her mother to hold right views, so that her mother will develop proper knowledge and proper views. But her mother never totally believed the Brahman woman's mother half believe and half doubt the principles she heard. But perhaps. What you say contains some principle, but maybe not completely. Some of my refugee disciples, for example, do not believe certain principles entirely. Before long, the mother's life ended soon. Some think it is best if someone is dead because he does not know anything. He does not want to eat, dress, sleep, or work. He does not need to do anything. Although it is the best. It is also the worst. What is the worst thing? Death. If you do good deeds, you will become born in the three good destinies. Whereas if you do evil deeds, you will become born in the three evil destinies. 
either hell, hungry ghosts, or animals. Yesterday, a few visitors came to the Buddha Hall, and I told them about the responsibilities of soldiers. What responsibilities? I told them that there are bodhisattvas and asuras in the military. Bodhisattvas in the army teach and transform living beings so that living beings do not kill too many people, whereas asuras in the army encourage living beings to kill more and more. They feel that the more they kill, the mightier they appear and the earn the highest achievements. Bodhisattvas, in contrast, tell people not to kill but to help two countries to coexist peacefully by resolving their problems. They tell military men that they earn the highest achievements and highest ranking offices if they do that. I told these visitors that they must emulate bodhisattvas and not asuras. What are asuras? What are bodhisattvas? There were two generals in China. One was Kuan Yu. He killed lots of people, but he became a bodhisattva after death. On the other hand, General Bai Qi of the Qin reign killed lots of people too, but he turned into an ox, a pig, or a horse after death. Why? It is because he buried alive 200,000 soldiers who surrendered. He had the heart of an Asura. Kwan Yu killed bad people and not good people. He eliminated the violence and brought peace to the kite. In the end, one became a Bodhisattva and the other became an ox, a horse, a pig, and a sheep. You have an American friend. We have an American friend who is in the Navi. He asked me, Do you believe people will become animals after death? At the time, I said, It is fun whether you believe people become animals after death or otherwise. Believe and you will become an animal if you deserve it. Doubt it and you will become, you will become an animal if you deserve it. You will become an animal if that is what you should be after death that cannot be changed. Do the deeds of Buddhas, you are a Buddha. Do the deeds of Bodhisattvas, you are a Bodhisattva. Do the deeds of humans, you are a human being. Do the deeds of ghosts, you are a ghost. Do the deeds of animals, you are an animal. You are what you do. This is not about doing what you believe but not doing what you do not believe whether you believe it or not you will do what you must do you will definitely not do what you should not do this is not a matter of faith one Chinese is thinking this idea is very lofty and profound I will be coming to learn the Buddha Dharma speaking of dying soon each of us should think about our own deaths. Before long, the Brahman woman's mother died, and what about me? When will I die? Where will I go after death? Will I end up in the house like the Brahman woman's mother? We listen to the sutras, and for each part we hear, we must reflect instead of letting it go in one ear and out the other. That would be meaningless. Everyone will die. Do not believe what I said earlier about death being the best thing. Do not believe that death is the worst thing either. People will die in the future, whether death is good or bad. Do good and it will be good. Do bad and it will be bad. Earlier I said, plant good causes and reap good fruits. Plant evil causes and reap evil fruits. The ancients had to had this to say. See the death of others, but my heart burns like fire. My heart burns like fire. It burns not for others, but I wonder when it be me. When I see someone pass away, my heart is blazing hot like it is on fire. I am not sad for the death of others, but I wonder how come he died. Soon it will be my turn.
A few days ago, I talked about how there are more births than deaths. But deaths do come to each one of us in turn. Seeing the death of others, my heart burns like fire. It burns not to not for others, but I wonder when it be me. Since you are not afraid of death, you may die soon or now. Why do you not? This has nothing to do with being afraid or not, but whether the death is peaceful or unexpected. Unexpected deaths are accidents such as car crashes or plane problems, boat drownings and train crashes. These are all expected accidental deaths. Die when you would like, would like a peaceful death. What if you do not want to die? You can cultivate it for immortality. Cultivators are liberated from birth and death. They may live forever if they want to. They may sit right down and enter nirvana right now. If they do not want to live with that kind of mastery, life and death is up to me rather than fate. No one is in charge of me. I am in charge of myself. If I want to die, I may die now. If I do not want to die, I may live forever. When we cultivate, we are cultivating this ability. When you have this ability, however, you do not want to remain in this world sometimes because this world is too turbid. This world of five turbidities is unclean. Before long, her life ended and her consciousness fell into the relentless hell. Her consciousness is the eighth consciousness. After the Brahman woman's mother died, her soul and consciousness fell into the relentless hell. What is the relentless hell? There, there time is relentless, life is relentless, and bodies are relentless. This refers to how this world is full when one person is in it or many people are in it. We will explain the relentless hell in more detail later. What does it mean by relentless? Relentless means that it is uninterrupted and continuous. When you are in this hell, you suffer and yet your life continues, dying then becoming soon, becoming born and dying. This is one function of this unchanging consciousness. When her mother's life ended, the Brahma woman, knowing that her mother had not believed in cause and effect while alive, her mother did not believe that good causes will result in good effects and evil causes result in evil results. Her lack of faith is an impure cause that will end impure results. When we cause it is wrong, the effect will be wrong too. Feared that her karma will certainly pull her into the evil paths. She considered the various evil karma her mother created and figured that her mother will definitely become reborn in an evil destiny. For that reason, she sold the family house and acquired many kinds of expensive and famous incense, flowers and other gifts. With those, she performed a great offering to the Buddha with incenses, flowers, lamps, candles, fruits, banners, canopies, and many articles in that thus come one enlightenment flower, samadhi, self-mastery, Buddha stupas, and monasteries. Sutra, she saw an especially Find image of the first common enlightenment flower, Samadhi Self Mastery King, in one of the monasteries. As the Brahma woman beheld the honored countenance, she became doubly respectful while thinking to herself Buddhas are called greatly enlightened ones who have attained all wisdom if this Buddha 
were in the world, I could ask him where my mother went after she died, he would certainly know. Commentary Shri, the Brahma woman, saw an especially fine image of the third Kama Enlightenment flower, Samadhi Self Mastery King, in one of the monasteries. As the Brahma woman beheld the honored countenance, the look of awesome virtue replaced with the 32 hallmarks and the 80 secondary characteristics of this clay stature. She became doubly respectful while thinking to herself, Buddhas are called greatly enlightened ones who cultivate uh, or who have attained all wisdom, which consists of three types, the wisdom of the varieties of ways, the wisdom of all dhammas and the wisdom of all modes. If this Buddha were in the world, I could ask himself, I could ask him where my mother went after she died. He would certainly know where my mother went. I have a question for everyone to ponder. Although we should not think why cultivating, but everybody consider this question. Did people come to this world to eat so that we live or do we live to eat? Sutra, the Brahman woman, then wept for a long time as she gazed longingly upon the third come one. Suddenly a voice in the air said, O oh, weeping worthy woman, do not be so sorrowful. I shall now show you where your mother has gone. The Brahman woman placed her paws together as she addressed space, saying, Which virtuous divinity is comforting me in my grief ever since the day I lost my mother? I have held her in memory day and night, and there is no way I can go to ask about the realm of her rebirth. The voice in the air spoke to the woman again. I am the one whom you behold and worship. The former enlightenment flower, somebody self mastery came first come on, because I have said your regard, I have seen your regard for your mother is double that of ordinary beings. I have come to show you where she is. Commentary The Brahman women, woman thought the Buddha is the wisest enlightened being. Unfortunately, the Buddha has entered Nirvana now. If the Buddha were in the world and my mother passed away, I would ask the Buddha where my mother become reborn. He would definitely know. The Brahma woman then lowered her head and wept for a long time or just a certain period of time that is not necessarily necessarily fixed as she gazed longingly upon the first come one. She could not bear to leave the Buddha, for instance. There is no rope, but now it seems as if there is a rope that tied her to the image which is longing. She didn't want to leave the image of first come one enlightenment flower, somebody self mastery king. Suddenly, a voice in the air said, This is a time when the Brahman woman is concentrated in body and mind without other false thought other than the longing for Buddha and the thought of missing the Buddha nature. Her mind could be said to be sure be pure at this time but this time a voice came out of nowhere what kind of sound was it a weeping worthy woman although your mother committed offenses you have your good rules this is why she was called a worthy woman do not be so sorrowful do not cry so hard do not be too sad I shall now show you whether your mother has gone. Let me tell you where your mother went. Do not cry. 
The Brahma woman placed her palms together, faced the sky as she addressed the space, saying, "Which virtuous divinity is comforting me in my grief? Which bodhisattva is this? Which immortal is this? You are so kind. You relieve me of sadness with such compassion. You comfort me so that I am not sad or worried." Virtue is a kind of compassionate virtue. Ever since the day I lost my mother, when she died, I have held her in memory day and night. I thought about my mother day and night, but there is no way I can go to ask. Why do I miss my mother? My mother gave me this body, so I all should be faithful to her. My mother passed away before I fulfilled my filial obligations. This is why、um, I am especially sad. Actually, the trees wish to be still, but the wind does not stop. The children wish to care for their parents, but they are gone. The trees want to stop swiggling for a while, but wind blows them back and forth. The trees wish to be still, but the wind does not stop. The children wish to care their parents, but they are gone. Just when I want to take care of my mother and be filial, repay the kindness of my parents, they are gone. So it is said, Father, Mother, your kindness is so extremely great; it is higher than the heavens. The grace of our parents is. Higher than the heavens and thicker than earth, I am very ashamed and sad that I was not filial to my mother. Do not have a place to ask about the realm of her pre-birth. I do not know whether my mother went to the heavens or fell into the hells. Strangely enough, when she spoke to space, the voice in the air spoke to the Brahma woman again. I am the one whom you behold and worship, the spiritual being who relieved you of your sadness and worries. The former enlightenment flower, Samadhi Self Mastery King, first come on, because I have seen that your regard for your mother, how much you miss your mother, is double that of ordinary beings. Why is the Brahman woman able to move the former enlightenment flower, somebody self mastery, king thus come on to speak to her from space? This line of text makes it clear that it is because I see that you miss your mother more than ordinary people. For instance, other people miss their father or mother one hundred percent, while you miss your mother two hundred. Percent double the average. You are so sincere that the way you think about your parent is different than most living beings. I have come to show you where she is, even though I. Sutra. The Brahman woman suddenly launched toward the voice she was hearing and then fell, injuring herself severely. Those around her supported and attended to her, and after a long time, she was revived. Then she addressed the ear, saying, "I hope the Buddha will be compassionate and quickly tell me into what realm my mother has been reborn. I am now near death myself." Commentary: When the Brahman woman heard the voice in the air, tell her that he is the. Former Enlightenment Flower Samadhi Self Mastery King First Come One. She suddenly launched toward the voice she was hearing. She was very nervous. She seemed insane as she jumped toward the sky without regard for anything else. She heard the voice in the sky and wanted to get there to see the former Enlightenment Flower Samadhi. Self mastery, King First Come One. She launched into the air and hit herself. This Brahman woman must not know any kung fu or other material arts, and she then fell, injuring herself severely. She broke her arms and legs. 
the four limbs are in segments. The arms are in two or three segments, while the legs are in a few segments. Her limbs were hurt, either broken or paralyzed. Those around her supported and attended to her. Perhaps at that time, she had relatives and friends with her who went with her to make offerings to enlightenment flower samadhi self mastery king first come one. Perhaps these were monastics at the temple, such as Bishonis, who saw this woman fall, those next to her helped her up. And after a long time, she was revived. Since she fell so hard, she lost consciousness. She was revived after a while, waking up as if from a sleep. When her head cleared, she still remembers how she launched into the air. Then she addressed the air, saying, I hope the Buddha will be compassionate. My only wish now is for the enlightenment of flower somebody self mastery king such come on to be compassionate and pity me and quickly tell me into what realm my mother has been reborn. Where did my mother become reborn? Why did she need to be told so quickly? I am now near death myself. Having felt like this, my body and mind are about to die soon. Sutra, Enlightenment, Flower Samadhi, Self Mastery King, First Come One, told the worthy woman, After you make your offerings, return home quickly, sit upright and concentrate on my name. You will soon know where your mother has been reborn. The Brahman woman bowed, bowed to the Buddha and returned home. The memory of her mother sustained her as he, she sat upright Recollecting enlightenment, flower somebody self mastery king first come on. After doing so for a day and a night, she suddenly saw herself beside a sea whose waters seethed and bubbled. Many evil beasts with iron bodies flew swiftly back and forth above this, this sea. She saw billions of men and women bobbing up and down this sea, being fought over and eaten by the evil beasts. She saw yakshas with different shapes. Some had many hands, some many eyes, some many legs, some many heads with their sharp fangs. They drove the offenders on toward the evil beasts. Commentary Enlightenment Flower Samadhi Self Mastery King First Come One told the worthy Brahman woman after you make your offerings, return home quickly, because you have hurt yourself badly due to the fall. What should you do once you get home? Sit upright, even though you broke your arms and legs, and concentrate on my name, enlightenment, flower somebody, self, mastery, king, first come one. You will soon know where your mother has been reborn. The Brahman woman bowed to the Buddha and returned home. The memory of her mother sustained her, since she was so sincere in thinking about her mother as she sat upright, recollecting enlightenment, flower, somebody, self, mastery, king, first come one. She sat up so straight. She forgot her pain and her broken arms and legs. After doing so for a day and night, she was not kneeling. She sat for 24 hours, simply reciting the Buddha's name and nothing else. At that time, she suddenly saw herself beside a sea. This was not a dream. This was a result of her utmost sincerity. Her spiritual nature, her consciousness, or her soul. In general, all these terms are one. The spiritual nature is the eighth consciousness in the individual since the Brahman woman sat for a long time. She forgot her pain and stopped everything except that one thought of the Buddha. Sincere in this thought, the eighth consciousness left her body. She suddenly saw herself by a sea. A meditator may see certain states because 
the eighth consciousness leaves the body. If your five eyes are open, you will see ghosts, spirits, bodhisattvas, and Buddhas you will not otherwise. Cultivator's spiritual nature, eighth, eighth consciousness contains the five eyes within. If the spiritual nature leaves the physical body, the five eyes are open so that they can see different states. This holy Brahman woman must have cultivated for a long time because even though the five eyes on her physical body did not open, her eighth consciousness left the body so that she can all of a sudden see herself by the sea whose waters seethed and bubbled. This sea water is not cold but boiling hot, surging upwards. How many evil beasts are in this ocean? Never mind with that, just know that there are many and not few. With solid iron bodies, these evil beasts flew swiftly back and forth above this sea, chasing one another. She saw billions of men and women bobbing up and down in the sea, being fought over, sensed, and eaten by the evil beasts. What do these evil beasts do? They eat these men and women, such as swallowing one man or one woman in one mouth full. These most ferocious evil beasts have big mouths and big stomachs. She saw young shards or speedy ghosts that fly and run swiftly with different shapes. What do they look like? Some had many hands, some many eyes, some many legs, some many heads. One Yaksha ghost may have several dozen arms, one extremely ugly and precious Yaksha ghost may have two arms but many eyes, one may have relatively few arms and eyes but many legs and feet, one Yaksha ghost may have many heads whose mouths open up like a top that can swallow several people with one gulp. Its teeth are like swords and knives, with their sharp fangs, fangs that slice as quickly as swords. They drove the offenders on toward the evil beasts. What do Yaksha ghosts do? The evil beasts look for things to eat. Since people are smarter, they sometimes run far away from evil beasts. Escaping though, they run straight into a Yaksha ghost who blocks you so that you have nowhere to run and you have you are chased by enemies from behind. You have no route of escape and nowhere to go. You cannot even go and spend the night at a friend's house. Sutra All the Yakshas themselves set the offenders and twisted their heads and feet together into shapes so horrible that no one would dare even look at them for long. During that time, the Brahman woman was naturally without fear due to the power of recollecting the Buddha. A ghost king named Poisonless bowed his head in greeting and said to the worthy woman, Welcome, O Bodhisattva. What conditions bring you here? The Brahman woman asked the ghost king, what is this place? Poison Liz replied, We are on the western side of the great iron ring mountain, and this is the first of the seas that encircle it. The worthy woman said, I have heard that the hells are within the iron ring. Is that actually so? Poison Liz answered, Yes, the hells are here. The worthy woman asked, How have I now come to the house? Boston Liz answered, If it wasn't awesome spiritual strength that brought you here, then it was the power of karma. Those are the only two ways that anyone gets here. The worthy woman asked, Why is this water seething and bubbling? And why are there so many offenders and evil beasts? Boston Liz replied, these are beings of Chambu who did evil deeds. 
they have just died and passed through 49 days without any surviving relatives doing any meritorious deeds on their behalf to rescue them from their distress. Besides that, during their lives they themselves didn't plant any good causes. Now their own karma calls forth this house. Their first task is to cross this sea. Commentary of all the yaksha and evil beasts themselves, said the offenders. They beat and sense as if eagles catching chickens with their claws. These evil beasts and yakshas cooperate and capture the offenders and twist their heads and feet together. Yakshas may do this to evil beasts. Evil beasts may do this to yakshas and evil beasts and yakshas may do this to people. In general, all of them can be twisted. So they look really awful. They are twisted into millions of different kinds of shapes so horrible that typically no one would dare even look at them for long. During that time, the Brahman woman was naturally without fear due to the power of recollecting the Buddha. Enlightenment flower, somebody self-mastery king, first come one. A ghost king, one of the leaders among the ghosts named Poison Lees, bowed his head in greeting to the Brahman woman and said to the worthy woman, Welcome, O cat-hearted Bodhisattva, what conditions bring you here? The Brahman woman asked the ghost king, What is this place? I don't know how I got there here either. Poison Lis replied, We are on the western side of the great iron ring mountain, and this is the first of the seas on the west side that encircle it. The worthy woman said to the ghost king, I have heard that the house are within the iron ring. Is that actually so? Is, the, is there really the house? How come people do not believe there are the house? Personally answered, Yes, the house are here. The house really do exist. It is not imagined. The worthy woman asked, How have I now come to the house? Possibly the ghost king answered, If it was an awesome spiritual strength that brought you here, then it was the power of karma. You can come here due to two factors. One, you have the awesomeness, the spiritual power or the virtue. Two, you fall into the house because of the power of your offense karma. Those are the only two ways that any one gets here if it was not for one of two things one's awesomeness or karma one will not come to the house the worthy brahman woman asked why is this water seething and bubbling and why are there so many offenders cooking in this boiling water and so many evil beasts poison least replied the brahman woman these are beings of Jambu Fripa, which means victorious gold for the reason that lives on the Jambu Nadasuvana trees, fall into the house and turn into gold. This kind of gold is most supreme and special. So it is called victorious gold. Our world is in southern Jambu Fripa. Beings in southern Jambu Fripa who by merely stirring a thought did evil deeds they have just cried and passed through 49 days 7 weeks to have a death a deceased individual we must do some merit for him within 49 days after his death so that he may benefit during that period of time, the offense karma of the deceased has not been confirmed yet, but after 49 days, their karma is determined the way the court decisions have been made. They cannot change anymore. If we were to recite sutras or mantras for the deceased, you can, we can save them so that they reap the benefits. After 49 days, the offense of the deceased is judged 
so there is still merit from recitation of sutras, but they get very little merit, the impact of which is tiny though not completely nil. Without any surviving relatives doing any meritorious deeds on their behalf to rescue them from their distress, to save evil doing living beings from their suffering. Besides that, during their lives, they themselves didn't plant any good causes, didn't do good deeds. Now their old karma calls forth this house. Their first task is to cross this sea. Naturally, they must first go to this great sea of suffering to endure the karmic retribution they deserve. Sutra 10,000 Juryanas east of this sea is another sea in which they will undergo twice as much suffering. East of that sea is yet another sea where the sufferings are double yet again. What the combined evil causes of the three comic vehicles evoke is called the Sea of Karma. This is that place. Commentary 10,000 Juranath East of this sea is another sea in which they will undergo twice as much suffering. The suffering in the other sea is more much severe than this one. See how people are suffering as the evil beasts and yakshas chase them about in this ocean. Were you to see the other sea, you would know that the suffering there is manifold compared to this one. East of that sea is yes, another sea where the sufferings are doubled yet again. The suffering there is much more than the previous sea. What is the reason for the existence of these oceans, what the combined evil causes of the three karmic vehicles evoke. The three karmas are the karma of body, the karma of mouth, and the karma of mind. There are three evils to body, which are killing, stealing, sexual misconduct. There are three evils to the mind, then greed, hatred, and delusion. There are four evils to the mouth. They are frivolous speech, false speech, harsh speech, and the deceive speech. Frivolous speech consists of improper words between men and women. False speech refers to exaggerations and lies. Harsh speech means scolding people. Divisive speech means telling A about B's phones and telling B about A's phones. One says two different things. There are four evils to the mouth, plus three evils of the body and three evils of the mind, making a total of ten evils. These ten evils are also called the evil causes of the three commas, the is to creating evil. How come there is this type of ocean with evil waters, with so many evil beasts and yakshas? They come forth because of people's evil causes, plant good causes and reap good fruits, plant evil causes and reap evil fruits. People deserve that they get since they create their own offense karma. It's called the sea of karma. The three oceans together make up the sea of karma, which are all created by the power of people's karma. This is that place. The Sea of Karma Sutra The worthy woman asked the ghost king Poison Lis, Where are the hells? Poison Lis answered, Within the three seas are hundreds of thousands of hells, each one different. Eighteen of those are known as the Great Hells. Five hundred subsequent ones inflict illimitless cruel sufferings. Following those are hundreds of thousands that inflict limitless further sufferings. The worthy woman again uh, questioned the great ghost king. My mother died recently and I do not know where she has gone. Commentary The worthy Brahman woman asked the ghost king Poisonless, Where are the hells? Ghost king Poisonless answered, the Brahman woman. Within the three seas are hundreds of thousands of hells. What is the sea of suffering? The sea of suffering is a 
conglomeration of living beings, comma, ocean is symbolic of a large number. There is not an ocean necessarily. It represents the accumulation of comma that is as limitless as the great sea. These three seas are created by people's three commas of body, mouth, and mind. So presently told the Brahman woman that within the three seas are the great house. Each one of the house is different, replaced with its unique setup. In other words, each person experiences a unique hell based on his karma. Hells are not existent and prepared before people pass away. The hells manifest based on each individual's karma. Each experiences retribution based on his or her offense karma. For instance, there is a hell of molten copper. Piles of molten copper. A hollow, except for a blazing fire inside. What kind of individual falls into the house? The sentient individuals. The power of karma makes these individuals see molten copper in the shape of people. Lusty men see molten copper and think it is a beautiful woman. As he runs forward to embrace the beautiful woman, he is scorched. Through the skin and flesh, that he is stuck. Lusty women see Martin Copper as an extremely handsome man or an old friend. She wants to get close without regard for anything, but when she does get close, she gets burned to death by the fire of desire. After being burned to death, a clever, a uh, clever wind. In the house that was mysteriously created, revives the being in the house so that he or she experiences the same retribution repeatedly, though he or she has forgotten the results and only remembers the benefits. He or she makes the same mistake and suffers the retribution there. This is how the molten copper hell works. There are many different kinds of hells in each. With each unique features, eighteen of those are known as the Great House. Each hell has eighteen separate spots. Five hundred subsequent ones inflict in limitless cruel suffering. Following those, a hundred of thousands that inflict limitless further sufferings. The worthy woman again questioned the Great Ghost King. Oh, big brother Ghost King. Please instruct me out of compassion. My mother died recently, and I do not know where she has gone. I do not know where my mother's soul went. Big brother, God's king, please be kind and tell me. Sutra. The God's king asked the worthy woman, "When the Bodhisattva's mother was alive, what habits did she have?" The worthy woman replied. My mother held different views and ridiculed and slandered the triple jewel. Even if she occasionally believed, she would soon become disrespectful again. She died recently, and I still do not know where she was reborn. Pozenlis asked, "What was the Bodhisattva's mother's name and clan?" The worthy woman replied. My parents were both Brahmins. My father's name was Shila Sudarshana. My mother's name was Yudhi Li. Pozenli placed his palms together, and implored the worthy woman, "Please, worthy one, quickly return home. There is no need for you to grieve further. The offender Yudhi Li was born in the heavens." Three days ago, it is said that she received the benefit of offerings made and blessings cultivated by her filial tribe, who practiced giving to enlightenment flower samadhi self mastery king thus come one the stupas and monasteries. Not only was the bodhisattva's mother released from the house, but all the other offenders who were destined for the relentless hell. Also received bliss and were reborn with her. Having finished speaking, the ghost king put his palms together and withdrew. 
Commentary Ghost King Poison Lee heard the Brahman woman's question about where her mother has become reborn, which of the six destinies on the wheel of rebirth. The Ghost King asked the worthy woman, When the Bodhisattva's mother was alive, what habits did she have? The Ghost King saw that the Brahma woman must be able to go to the house because of the power of her awesome virtue and vows, so referred to her as a Bodhisattva. What did your mother do when she was alive? What occupation was she in? How did she act? The worthy woman replied, My mother held Devin views. Although she was my mother, I cannot cover her mistakes. She held Devon knowledge and Devon views, which are the five sharp servants in the areas of body, extremes, precepts, views, and deviances. Devon view of the body, she never accepted the short term end of the bargain. She always thought about what was best for her body. For example, she wanted nutritious foods because she was afraid of poor health. She fed herself so well so that she was nice and round. She thought it was healthy to be choppier. She was always planning things for her body, a good place to live, good food and nice clothes. She spent all of her time on doing this type of calculations. How can this be good for the body? This is a view of the body that refuses to let the body get hurt. View of extremes. All of her views were prejudiced. She disagreed with other people's opinions about smoking being unhealthy. She thought smoking was the best and criticized you for not knowing the beauty of it. If you did, you would not quit. Her explanation seemed to make sense. Extreme views may be ingenious explanations with flawless reasoning, but they are actually prejudiced. View of precepts. She held different precepts such as fighting non-vegetarian Buddhists fine. She found people who do not even touch salt as people with real skill. She teased some her members about how if they do not believe her, they should just try these Devon precepts. In general, she always found forms with something fine. There are no problems, but she will look with a mi microscope for some fault. Devon view. For example, everyone says it is right to be filial to our parents, but she would say, why? Parents procreate because they sought momentary pleasures and you think they are good to you. Do not bother with your parents. They deserve to get old and die. The sooner they die, the better. Otherwise, there is just one more consumer alive. She gave these big long explanations arguing with you about fiority. She said it is wrong to be filial. Why be filial to elders? This is, this is really stupid. This is a devil view and ridiculed and slandered the triple jewel. She teased and criticized. When she saw people bowing to the Buddhas, she would say, Ah, is that a Buddhist? Buddhists do everything. They are no better than anybody else. They still eat, drink, gamble, and prostitute like everyone else. What good is it to believe in the Buddhas she, she piles a list of forms on Buddhists so that Buddhists seem like criminals who commit worse things than the ten evils and the five rebellious acts. This is a form of ridicule. She slandered by saying Buddhism cheats people. She said the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha are all fake. The Buddha is made of clay. The Buddha is worse on paper. The drama is worse on paper. The Sangha members are human too. They are how are they different from regular people? Why should you believe them? Why should you bow to them? You are so stupid. She scolded you hard so that Buddhists are embarrassed to the point that some are afraid to let others know that they are Buddhists. 
One elderly man who comes to listen to the sutras on Sundays asked to take refuge with me a few years ago. But I never agreed. Why? It is because he said that he wanted to take refuge secretly so that no one knows. Taking refuge is not stealing. Why should it be secret? I do not have any secret refuges here. So I told him to think things over before taking refuge. It is so strange, but he says that since he is a Catholic with long-time Catholic friends who will call him a rebel if they knew that he believed in Buddhism. If you do not say so, you're deceiving them. That makes you even more of a criminal. He says that he is still getting some charity there. How can someone like this be a Buddhist? How pathetic! Even if she occasionally believed, perhaps and supposedly she believed, it was temporary and not forever. We must make vows to believe in Buddhism forever and not just temporarily like the Brahman woman's mother. Temporary, temporary faith may last one hour and then vanish. Some people's faith does not last for more than two hours, at the most an hour or five minutes. They cool off after five minutes of faith. We must make vows to have faith forever. She would soon become disrespectful again. Perhaps for five minutes time, she will go along and bow to the Buddhas, take refuge with the Triple Jewel and find a teacher. But as soon as she turns around, for no particular reason at all, she no longer wishes to pay respects to the Buddhas and believe in the Buddhas. She died recently and I still do not know where she was reborn. Personalist asked the Brahman woman for more detail because she did not say her mother's name. What was the Bodhisattva's mother's name and clan? What was your mother's surname, first name, address? Say all this clearly. The worthy Brahman woman replied, My parents were both Brahmans. There are four castes in India. The Brahmans are the clan of purity. The Kshyas are royalty. The Vaisyas are the merchants. The Kalas are the lowest caste, including butchers, slaughterers, etc. In India, butchers could not walk alongside other people, but have to walk on the roadside alone. If they met members of the royalty, they cannot even walk on the same road. They are marked so that everyone can tell at a glance that they are Kalas, the lowliest of castes. The Brahman woman is a member of the Brahman clan, a member of the elite. Both the Indian and Great Britain were hierarchical and that continues today. United States is democratic. People do not think hierarchically but equally. India was different. High class individuals could not converse with low class individuals. If you spoke with members of the lower class, nobilities looked down on you, treating you as if you were worthless. Hierarchical thought harshly divides up people. My father's name was Srila Sudarshana. Srila usually refers to the Vinaya, but here it just means cool and refreshing. My mother's name was Yue Li, a Sanskrit word that is not formally explained in the Buddhist sutras, but let me add some commentaries now. Yue means favor and Di means emperor, someone that emperors favor. In other words, this person was so pretty that even the emperor liked her. You may say that there's nothing fixed about a person's name. Since people's names are not fixed, you may explain it however you want, as long as it is reasonable, and especially if it is Sanskrit. Do not simply claim ignorance when you see things in the sutras you do not understand. Research it with your wisdom. 
Once you uncover your wisdom, you will know. You may explain it in whatever way is reasonable, as long as you do not yell at people or say the negatives. Do not be so rigid. Poison Lace placed his palms together out of respect and implored the worthy Brahman woman, Please, worthy one, quickly return home. There is no need for you to grieve further. Worry no more. Do not think about your mother with such sadness and or miss her so that you cannot let her go. The offender Yue Di Li, a woman who committed offenses, was born in the heavens three days ago. How? It is said that she received the benefit of offerings made and blessings cultivated by her filial tribe, a daughter specif specifically who practiced giving to enlightenment flowers, samadhi, self-mastery, king, first common, astropas, and monasteries. The giving includes offering alms to the Sangha and the assembly. Not only was the Bodhisattva's mother released from the suffering of the house, but all the other offenders like your mother, who were destined for the relentless hell, also received bliss and were reborn with her. Having finished speaking, the ghost king put his palms together respectfully and withdrew. Sutra, the Brahman woman returned swiftly as if from a dream, understood what had happened, and then made a profound and far-reaching vow before the stupas and images of enlightenment flower samadhi self mastery king first come on, saying, I vow that until the end of future ends, I will respond to being suffering for their offenses by using many expedient devices to bring about their liberation. The Buddha told Manjushri, the ghost king possibly is the present Bodhisattva for most wealth. The Brahman woman is now earth star Bodhisattva. Commentary Brahman woman returned swiftly as if from a dream understood that had happened. She went back and forth to herself. Oh, I was by an ocean where I saw poison leaves, the great ghost king, the evil beasts and offenders in their house. I asked him where my mother was reborn, and the ghost king says she became reborn in their heavens. She knew that none of this was illusory, but occurred because enlightenment flowers, somebody self-mastery king, first comers, or some might help to, to make it happen. And then she made a profound and far-reaching vow before the stupas and images of enlightenment flower, somebody self-mastery king, first come one, saying, I vow that until the end of future ends, when will the end of future ends occur? There will never be an end. Hence, the vows of earth-stalking Bodhisattva will never end, end either. I will respond to being suffering for their offenses throughout all six desti destinies by using many expedient devices to bring about their liberation, allowing them to leave suffering and attain bliss. The Buddha told Manjushri, the ghost king poison Lis, who conversed with the Brahman woman, is the present Bodhisattva for most wealth. The Bodhisattva for most wealth cultivated the seven sacred gems. One, faith, a gem in cultivation. Two, precepts, the transmission and receiving the precepts are rare in the age of the decline of Dharma. But monastics must receive the precepts to be actual monastics. Two, erudition. Four, renunciation. Giving is also a gem in cultivation. 5. Wisdom, a gem in cultivation. 6. A sense of shame. 7. Remorse. Usually, remorse and a sense of shame go together. Although they are separate here, they are necessary gems in cultivation. He is called the Bodhisattva for most wealth because he has these 7 gems of faith, precepts, erudition, renunciation, wisdom, a sense of shame, and remorse. The Brahman woman is now Earth Star Bodhisattva. This is why we must emulate the former Earth Star Bodhisattva 
and practice filial respect on a wide scale, including the virtue of being filial to our parents and saving our parents. Verse of Transference May the merit and virtue accrued from this work put on the Buddha's pure lands, repaying for kinds of kindness above, and aiding those suffering in the paths below. May those who see and hear of this all bring forth the resolve for body, and when this retribution body is over, be born together in ultimate bliss. <laughs>